Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to New York City Jewelry Week 2021, day three. We've already had a very exciting lineup on day one and two, which I hope you joined us for, or if you didn't join us, that you've caught up by now. Uh, my name is Alex Darby, and I am once again your host for this virtual adventure. We've got an action-packed lineup for you today. But remember, if you can't stay for it all, you can still catch the live stream available on our YouTube channel for 24 hours after the fact. Um, and there's still time to RSVP for our events for the rest of the week. Um, the link is in the description for you. So if you haven't uh, got onto that for Thursday through Sunday yet, you still have time. Um, today, many of our programs will have Q&A and you can post your questions in the chat. We'll let you know when to do that. Um, and in the meantime, you can post speaker love. We love that. You can let us know where you're coming from, say hi to your friends and generally have a fun time. Um, just a reminder that this is, of course, an anti-racist, inclusive and safe space and harassment of any kind in the comments or at our events will not be tolerated. You can view New York City Jewelry Week's code of conduct uh, at our website. The link again is in the description for you. Um, and just I'm going to run you through a couple of things because our schedule has changed slightly for today. So I just want to refresh everyone. So let's get things kicked off. Uh, OK. So welcome to Jewelry Week 2021. Uh, I'd like to first thank our sponsors who help make Jewelry Week possible every year. Uh, it's very exciting to have such a wonderful list of supporters this year, so we're very grateful. I'd also like to thank our partners, both our official museum partner, the Museum of Arts and Design, and our official education partner, Commence Jewelry, along with all of our fantastic partners for this year. Thank you for your support and collaboration. Okay, so today, first up, we have Andrew Grima at 10.30. We then are going to follow that with a great conversation, Fabio Cellini at 11.30. Uh, at 1 p.m., we have the Brazilian modernism of Roberto Balmarx. And then at 2 p.m., so this is the change, is times are changing. And you can bet this was a challenging one to message. Messaging the time is changing for the program times are changing is obviously a tongue twister. So this is why I'm reminding everybody this program was originally scheduled for 4 p.m. and it's now taking place at 2. Once again, don't worry if the schedule no longer meets your needs, you'll be able to watch this for 24 hours on our YouTube channel. Uh, then in the afternoon, we will follow that with In Their Element with Melanie Grant and Sada Maturi. And our final program on the virtual schedule for today at 5 p.m. is Celestial Bodies. Um, so that is our schedule and program for today, uh, which is very exciting. And I am going to kick things off for us with our first, very first program of the day, which is Andrew Grima, the man behind the jewels. I'm about to invite our first two presenters up to the stage, uh, Andrew Grima's daughter, Francesca Grima, and collector Kimberly Klosterman, who are going to take a personal perspective on 60s and 70s, the father of modern jewelry, Andrew Grima. I know you're all very excited to kick off today with this program. We're going to take a closer look about how he began his career, won numerous awards, and scored tons of jet-setting amazing clients. Uh, it is my great pleasure to bring to the stage today, uh, Kimberly and Francesca. Welcome. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so fantastic to have you both here. Thank you both for being here. I am going to hand things off to you and I'm just going to queue up your presentation and we're going to get going. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's lovely chatting to Kim today. Um, my my name is Francesca Grima and I'm Andrew Grima's daughter and I continue the business in London with my mother Jojo. And I am Kimberly Klosterman, and I'm a collector and a lover of 1960s and 70s jewelry and have been for a really long time. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how that all started and why Andrew Grima played into it. So in 1996, I was going to school at Sotheby's in London, taking the Understanding Jewelry course with Amanda Triassi. And she, by the way, is also a great lover of 1960s and 70s jewelry. And for an extracurricular assignment, gave us the choice to go see 
Andrew Grima, who was having an exhibition at Hancock's. And I went and I was completely bowled over. I walked into this shop and I had seen jewels like I had never seen in my life. They were absolutely amazing. These big, gold, bold, brilliant, amazing jewels that were nothing like what I knew of from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I was almost shaking. And so I'm looking around and obviously this tall man with wearing a cravat, elegant man behind the counter noticed that I liked the jewelry. And he said, do you like the jewels? And I said, oh, I, I love them. I love them. And he said, would you like to meet the artist? And I said, absolutely. And he extended his hand, Andrew Grima. So that was my, my first um, introduction to Mr. Grima and his jewelry. And uh, it's all been uphill ever since. So now, however many years later, a lot of years later, 25 plus, um, there's a show of my personal jewelry collection at the Cincinnati Art Museum that recently came, uh, it opened in Europe at Diva in um, Antwerp and then went on to the Schmuck Museum in Forsheim. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't see that exhibition then. It's now here in Cincinnati where it originated it's called Simply Brilliant, and I have, uh, I believe, 14 uh, jewels by Andrew Grima in the exhibition, as well as a host of other artist jewelers from the same time period. So that's why I am here today with Francesca. Very exciting. Um, shall we go on to the next slide? Yes. So I think I can I can give a bit of a backstory on on these uh, drawings. So my father was born in Rome in 1921, and moved to London when he was five um, because my grandfather John had a lace business and wanted to be more at the center of his business. And um, the lace was designed in Italy and hand embroidered. And at the height of his success, he had actually 5,000 female outworkers, and it was distributed across department stores in the US, Canada, and the UK. But in 1935, Mussolini invaded Abyssinia, which resulted in trade sanctions against Italy. So uh, my grandfather's lace business collapsed. <clears throat> and um, so my, my grandfather had a nervous breakdown and ended up in hospital. And my father, Andrew, became the breadwinner of, um, of the household with uh, eight siblings to feed. And so he, he got a job as a draftsman in an engineering company and spent his evenings at art school. But um, during the weekend, he, he would go and visit my, my grandfather in hospital and he would always take his uh, sketching pad and, and pen with him and he would stop on the way and and sketch cottages, farm equipment that he found along the way. And I think that was this sort of form of escapism uh, from the sad reality that his life was at the time. Um, he then spent six years in Burma fighting against the Japanese and uh, became a proficient engineer and sort of put truck army trucks together. Uh, but all the money that he, he earned, he actually had to send back home because he had to feed his family. So it was quite a, a tough, tough first 19 years of his life, I think. I think it's interesting, too, when you look at these drawings, especially the two on the left, how modernist they are. And, you know, it really kind of foreshadows what's to come. And I, I think, you know, we'll see that shortly in the slides, in the next slides. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like in this one. Like this one. <laughs> is um, wonderful. I mean, these are pieces from the 1950s, right? Yes. So. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so in, um, so he returned to the war, uh, he, after the war, he returned to England and actually married Helene who he'd met at secretarial school, uh, secretarial course before going to war. Um, and he got an engineering uh, job, which would have meant that um, he, he would have had to leave London. And Helene wasn't keen on leaving the city. So she suggested 
that he start working in the accountancy department of her father's jewelry business, H.J. and Company. And so that's that's where it all started when he joined as a in in the accountancy department. Yeah, and so he had never really had any training in jewelry at all, um, as as I know. And um, but as we've discovered, really liked to draw and was a good engineer. And um, but almost immediately took to it. And if you look at these jewels that were being produced in the fifties, they really are kind of becoming organic asymmetrical. Um, they're leaning towards what's really going to come. And then with the slide on the right, I think that is really amazing that he was starting to work with lost wax and casting these natural materials that up until now no one had done. Um, really a very experimental in his production as well. And I think too, I remember that the book that you've produced is fantastic. And I've done a lot of research on your father, but then reading the book was, even took it to oh, just such a step further. And um, I think what I found interesting is, I, in the book, your father says, it was difficult to sell the jewels in Britain at the time, so he did a lot of traveling and selling to other jewelry stores that would market his jewels, um, mostly in Europe at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And what's wonderful about my father's designs is because he he's trained as an engineer, he didn't have um, sort of, he, he didn't study as a jeweler, so he didn't have his sort of imagination um, limited by what a, a jewelry design um, teacher would, would teach him. So I think that's what's wonderful is that he managed to sort of break the boundaries of that, especially with the, the casting of the leaves, as you can see. Um, yeah, I think that's amazing. So we can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. So what happens in 1961 is kind of amazing. And I, I just like every, if you don't mind, I'll read this quote because it's so great. Abstract jewelry is becoming a convention in itself. And this is an astonishing development. There are three causes, the art world atmosphere, the international exhibition, and a determined British jeweler. The causes overlapped in 1961 when abstract art seemed unassailable and Goldsmiths Hall showed splendid jewels, abstract art and miniature, and Andrew Grima started selling modern jewelry hard. Andrew Grima's company, HJ, developed the market with spectacular speed and other British jewelers, once the way was made, rushed in. And I think that's such a great quote because it really does put everything into perspective as far as how important your dad was during this time period. And um, going back to the uh, slide that we have on the left, this is a slide of the Goldsmiths Hall exhibition that was put on um, with the Victorian Albert Museum, Graham Hughes of Goldsmiths Hall and De Beers. And the idea of the show originally was to um, show Britain that there were some fantastic jewels out there. They, this group felt that jewels were really boring and they wanted to kind of bring everything up to speed up into the 1960s. And so at first they were going to have artists make jewelry, but then Graham Hughes decided well, we will invite some artists to make jewelry, but we already have some jewelers making some fantastic jewelry here. And if we have only artists making jewelry, it might not be so comfortable. It might not sit well. It might not you know, be understood the same way an artist jeweler would maybe understand the body. And um, so it became a combination of a lot of things. And the show started in 1890 and went all the way up to 1961, um, showing jewels of Rene Lalique, an artist jeweler, um, and then the big houses. And then finally, you have a wonderful group of contemporary jewelers from 80 different countries, more or less, showing uh, more or less a thousand pieces of wonderful contemporary jewelry. And then the slides on the right, uh, you can talk, your father made those in the workshop, correct? 
Yes, absolutely. So the the top uh, the top slide is a citrine ring that my father actually designed and uh, HJ made. And then the second um, brooch is by Robert Adams, which was cast in silver gilt. And he was regarded as one of the foremost sculptors of his generation. And then the bottom brooch was by Bernard Meadows, um, who I actually found out recently was um, Henry Moore's first assistant. So that's quite interesting as well. And those all, all three were made by HJ Company. Yeah. And, and it was interesting because most of the pieces in the exhibition were in gold. Um, however, these pieces that were made at HJ were in uh, silver gilt. And I, we can only imagine that it was a cost factor mm -hmm. in order to, you know, keep the cost down to produce these pieces. Yeah. But, uh, it, it also, I think a lot of people, if, if you're watching and you're in the trade, you may see jewelry marked by H.J. and company. And um, a lot of times those jewels are designed by Andrew Grima, but they did produce jewels for other jewelers as well, especially early on. So that's just something to be aware of. Yeah. Next. And so here's. Uh, <laughs> Graham Hughes. Graham. <laughs> Graham Hughes to the right, Andrew Grima to the left, and a model in between. And um, and Graham Hughes was not only instrumental in putting this exhibition together, but was really exciting is he took the show on the road. And um, he wanted to really spread the word about British jewelers and kind of almost the British jewelry invasion. And they went all over Europe uh, and to uh, Australia, also all over the States. And here you can see is an exhibition at George Jensen. Um, in the beginning, there were about five jewelers that Hughes took with him. But uh, really, it was Grima that continued those relationships with the different department stores that uh, Hughes had kind of made inroads with. And they didn't just show at department stores. They, they showed at embassies and museums and also department stores all over the country. Yeah. And it's quite funny because um, when they traveled all the uh, all the other jewelers were sort of scrimping and saving on their traveling costs and and my father always traveled first class and when when asked why he did this he said well i'm never going to meet any potential clients in economy so and it actually paid off numerous times i mean there was uh, one time when he was sitting next to a gentleman in first class and uh, it was on a on a plane going from uh, new york back to london and the gentleman said to him Oh, you know, I'm 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 thinking of proposing to my to my girlfriend. Do you by any chance know of any jewelers who might make a ring for me? And uh, my father said, Well, you know, you've met the right guy, so uh, come and see me in my office tomorrow. And he met so many people through just you know traveling first class. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's such a great story, and I I love too that. Um, well, I, I was going to go back to Hughes for one, one second. I just did want to point out, too, that up until this point, Goldsmiths Hall had not collected jewelry at all. And so after 1961, they start developing this whole passion for jewelry. And also kind of the, the whole idea was to tell the world that um, these were artist jewelers. These were people that were kind of artists working in gold, artists making jewelry, um, not cookie cutter jewelry that was mass produced and um, it really did have a place in a museum. Yeah, and now they have a huge collection of, of Grima, so it's lovely. Next. And so here are some of the places that um, ended up that Graham Hughes took these jewelers to, but then also, as I said, that that Grima continued relationships with. Um, Prouds in Australia was one. He had a long-standing relationship with them, as well as uh, George Jensen. And then you can see Shreve Crump and Lowe and Trayburn Hafer in Chicago. And, and 
you know, a host of other places in, in around the, the country here. So there's lots of Grima jewelry here. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I mean, I think my father found it quite difficult to be, um, you know, everyone always wanted to meet him. So it was quite, he really spent most of the uh, traveling. And I think he found that quite difficult in the end, actually, um, because everyone wanted to meet him. So, yeah. And then there's the De Beers Diamonds International Awards, which are such important awards to win. And you can talk a little bit more about how many your father has won. Yes, and sorry. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, the De Beers Diamonds International Awards are like the Oscars of jewellery. And um, my father won 11, which is more than anyone ever did. And, yeah, ever did. And, um, and then in 1969, he was invited to become a panel member, um, which meant that he could no longer submit designs, which, which was unfortunate. Otherwise, he would have just kept winning them. <laughs> and I think what's really fascinating, too, about... Um, Grima and his relationship with De Beers and why De Beers was so important is it was a wonderful uh, opportunity for public relations. And I think throughout his career, you'll see that he really identifies opportunities and moves forward with them in that realm, um, unlike doing paid advertising, which wasn't really his thing at all. And with the De Beers Awards, you had um, the AP picking up the wire picking up on these awards. So you can look at any newspaper article from say 1965 and see that Grima won, you know, X amount of awards then from the Dayton Daily News, the Cincinnati Enquirer, to the New York Times, you know, to LA papers. So it was really all over the country here in America. So it he became a known entity rather quickly. Next. So um, the Duke of Edinburgh's Prize for Elegant Design um, was an award that was usually given for uh, a, a product and industrial designer um, such as Dyson. And uh, my father was the only jeweler ever to win the Duke of Edinburgh's Prize for Elegant Design. And it was for a collection of jewelry um, yeah. Which is, and then. Yes. So um, the collection of jewelry comprised that ruby um, scarab or Venus brooch, as we call it. And um, Prince Philip actually bought the brooch from the collection to give to the queen. And uh, she, she still wears it. And I think it's, it's such a, a precious thing for her because it's such a personal gift from Prince Philip, and um, yeah, she loves wearing it. And then that uh, brought on other royal customers, such as Princess Margaret, who who sent my father a letter one day, and with this, uh, with a piece of lichen in it. And she said, "I just came across this piece of lichen while wa whilst walking the dogs, <clears throat> the dogs in Balmoral, and um, I've seen your cast leaves, and was wondering if you might um, consider casting this lichen for me." Uh, please let me know the price, as uh, if it if it's too dear, I might have to, you know, just appreciate nature's nature's beauty. And so my father was thrilled, and he responded and said, uh, "Would a token one pound be okay, just so I can record it as a sale?" And um, and yeah, and there she is um, in this uh, wonderful photograph with of by uh, Norman Parkinson wearing the brooch. And I think too these. These pieces are so wonderful because they're highly unusual, but very wearable. And for the queen to wear that and become one of her favorite jewels uh, means a lot. And, and you know, as a woman, you know that it's not just because it was a special gift. Your husband can give you a special gift and you may never wear it. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be something you absolutely like and works with so many things. Absolutely. And I think this piece really does. And I love that it's kind of this explosion of gold with these uh, carved rubies that are not that important. You know, no. they're, they're beautiful, but they weren't expensive. And I think 
what we'll see are a lot of stones that aren't highly valued, but um, are used for color, are used as part of the palette of the jewel. And it, I think this really represents all of that very well. Absolutely. And what's wonderful, I think, about Grima jewelry is that you either love it or you hate it, but you're never really indifferent about it. And so when the queen wears it, um, I, I look at these sort of royal blogs and uh, I read the comments and you have people who love it and people who are just <laughs> trashing it. But, you know, it's nice. It's nice to have an opinion, I guess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Better for me when they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And here is this marvelous store in German Street that I just think is fantastic. And unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to experience it. But um, this was designed by uh, your father's two brothers that were architects. And do you want to tell us a little more yeah. about Absolutely. Um, so my, my father's two brothers, Godfrey and George, were both architects and they commissioned um, Brian Neal, uh, who was a, a Royal Academician sculptor, to design the facade, which was a sort of mixture of slate and steel, which is fantastic. And then um, Jeffrey Clark, um, also a Royal Academy sculptor, designed the 10-foot aluminium door, which you can't actually see in the photograph, but it was amazing because you stood on the doormat in front of it and it would automatically open and close. And so I remember as a child, I used to enjoy jumping up and down on it, which eventually broke the mechanism. Um, my father got a bit annoyed about that. <laughs> and, um, and then the interior was a sort of mixture of um, bare brick and plush leather and there were these wonderful uh, coffee table height vitrines that were framed in leather and you could sit on the side and peer in to the vitrines at the, jewel at the jewelry. And it was like peering into a sort of a pond of sort of twinkling, yeah, twinkling gems. It was lovely. And um, then from the, the ground floor into the basement, there was this amazing spiral staircase, which was the first ever perspex spiral staircase. And uh, it was really an engineering feat, and they had to employ Ove Arup to, to make sure that the mechanism worked because it had this steel, um, steel cord wire um, under such tension through the middle that should it break, it would have shot up through the hotel um, two floors above. And uh, Ove Arup also engineered the Sydney Opera House roof, so yeah, they, they managed, they did a good job. <laughs> And then the slide on the far right is uh, Peter Sellers and who Miranda Quarry. And so it just points up again the kind of clients that Grima attracted, and you know not just the Queen, but all kinds of celebrities and jet setters. And uh, these were the people that were buying jewelry from this time period. They were the young, affluent, kind of hip people. And if you're looking at what's going on with some of the major houses at the time, they aren't really producing anything that, that is, um, that's that unusual. So you do have some of the houses working with the likes of Andrew Grima to purchase jewelry for their, their own, uh, their own venue. So they're able to sort of, you know, cash in on what's starting to happen. And this is this is just a great I, I love these that I was reading that there were 50 of these that were produced for the Queen they were commissioned by the Queen for state visits and um, you know a little bit more about them than I do so I'll leave it to you. <laughs> thank you Kim. Um, so on state visits the Queen usually presented gifts such as um, dinner services by Wedgwood and that was fine as she was traveling by ship but when she started traveling more by air, that wasn't really practical. So, so she asked my father um, if he would design some jewelry for her to present to heads of state as she, when she traveled. And um, so she, she called my father to Buckingham Palace and he showed up in his Aston Martin. And she explained that she wanted um, to give uh, the first lady, Madame Pompidou, a brooch. And so he designed it in front of her. And then she said, Yes, and I, I'd like the insignia, but it needs to be 
um, it needs to to be discreet and and subtle because you know it's the first lady of France. I don't think she's going to want to walk around with this huge um, British royal insignia. <laughs> and so my father suggested placing it behind the citrine, the center stone, and she was very happy with it. And when when she presented it to Madame Pompidou in 1972, um, she instantly put it on her pinned it on her on her jacket and um, and then he went on and made some made other brooches for state visits such as um, for Margaret Trudeau the first lady of Canada and then for Bessie Ford as well and um, that's now in the the Gerald Ford Presidential Library and Museum in Michigan so if you're in Michigan you can go and see it <laughs> And not to uh, miss a good marketing opportunity, here is that brooch again in this uh, the center ad for Canada Dry. And um, I'm just going to read this because this this whole group of Canada Dry ads were kind of interesting. They chose uh, kind of unusual, like uh, famous people at the time. And I know that Andrew Grima was one and Santa Claus was another one, but. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. It's amazing. So here's, here's what the ad says, because it's fabulous. Andrew Grima's career has glittered, every, oh, has glittered every bit as brilliantly as the jewelry he creates. Few would dispute that this designer has made more impact in Britain and probably the world than any other jeweler in the last 10 years. This ad was in 1973, by the way. His rise to fame has been studded with gems of success. 11 International Diamonds Awards, the Duke of Edinburgh Prize for Elegant Design, and the openings of luxurious shops in London, New York, Zurich, and Sydney. Any other man might be content to rest on such laurels, but Andrew Grima keeps coming up with new inspiration to stay ahead of the inevitable copiers. His search for unusual stones takes him all over the world, most recently to South Africa. Um, but at any rate, uh, then it just goes on to how he likes his scotch with Canada Dry. <laughs> but he didn't drink. He didn't drink scotch. By the way. <laughs> Nobody needs to know that. <laughs> He's more of a Campari guy. So. <laughs> Great. Me too. Yeah. Uh, and um, and the slide on the left is is Sharon Tate and um, Roman Polanski decided he wanted a photographic portrait of her to celebrate her 25th birthday. So he got celebrity photographer Sharak Hatami to photograph her and she's just covered in Grima jewels. And the brooch on her head, in her hair, which has sort of, I think you can see lapis with surrounded by turquoise, that's actually in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London in their permanent collection. So yeah. Beautiful. I think it's such a beautiful photograph as well. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And here he, you were telling me that he has, um, he, he was always friends with artists. And absolutely. So uh, on the left is Elizabeth Frink, sculptress. And um, I actually, when she, she was a great friend and she actually gave him um, one of her prints as a present when I was born, and it's it's actually ha hanging in my living room. Um, and then there's um, on the right is Barbara Hepworth, sculptress. Unfortunately, she didn't give me any sculptures, but uh, <laughs> and um, and then there's this wonderful. She's actually in uh, the photograph. She's wearing one of my father's pieces. And uh, there's also this wonderful green tourmaline ring, which my father designed for her and which is now in the uh, collection of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire, Chatsworth. Oh. And, and Elizabeth Frank actually was uh, also in the 1961 exhibition with a piece of jewelry that your father created uh, or actually manufactured mm, for, for that mm -hmm. exhibition. Mm -hmm. Next. And here are some different jewels from the 1960s, and three of these are in uh, my collection, and two of them are in the exhibition, Simply Brilliant. And the one in the top left with the uh, cabochon sapphires and diamonds is 
to me, very much like the Queen's brooch. It was done two years after that brooch. So this was, hers was 1966, this is 1968. And you can see that big explosive expanse of gold. And um, again, a very wearable and beautiful piece. Uh, and then the ring in the far right is uh, a piece that is uncut crystal or natural tourmaline crystal and um, not tourmaline, um, citrine. citrine crystal. And um, then uh, the wire work, and I think this is something that you'll see time and time again with both of these pieces is a Rima signature. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about how that's done? Absolutely. So it, it's called, we call it textured wire. And I think it really is one of my father's signature techniques. He invented it and it looks quite simple, but it's actually incredibly difficult to make. And we only have one goldsmith who can, well, two goldsmiths now who can, who can do this. And it means setting up each individual gold wire and then cast, um, sorry, not casting, soldering them together individually, um, which is, which is a, yeah, it's a great feat of engineering, to be honest. And, um, but what's wonderful about all these pieces is that they all have different styles, but they're also recognizable as Grima. Mm -hmm. um, and back to the, the, the wire, the textured wire, I think also these, there are these little squares that let light come through. You know, it could be like really heavy, and but it's not. It, yeah. it has this really an elegant effect. And I Absolutely. think it really underlies what your dad's work is. It's a very elegant, even though it's big and bold, there's a certain elegance to your father's work. And so with the, all the rings, you have crystals in their natural form, which he loved. And then up in the right-hand corner, uh, you also have some carved emeralds and carved sapphires. And um, that's again, like the queen's brooch that we saw before uh, from these pieces would have yeah, And also if the, I mean, if you would never be able to achieve the effect of the textured wire if it was cast, it would never be as light and you would never have that, you know, that lightness to it. And it would never be as beautiful um, from the back as it is from the front. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. another thing to, Next. So the Omega collection. Um, shall I go go ahead? <laughs> so, so this was um, a collection of 85 pieces that were commissioned by Omega um, from my father. And it was a mix of 55 um, watches and the rest were pieces of jewelry. My, my maths is not very good, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and um, the idea behind it was really to see time through a stone. And so all the glasses of the watches were, were semi-precious stones and a few precious stones as well. They, um, for example, there was one called Esmeralda that was a 48 carat emerald, which they actually sliced the back off, um, quite risky business. And and the, the stone cutters just they weren't allowed to know what my father was doing because obviously there's a top secret commission. And so they just thought that there was this really eccentric Englishman asking for, you know, very strange, you know, cuts of stones. And um, it was a huge success, traveled the world. And, um, and I think, yeah, it was, I, he said it was the most rewarding, but also the most challenging, um, challenging time in his career. And there also, I think it's interesting to note just from a point of view, if you're purchasing this, these watches or you're seeing things in the marketplace that this particular about time collection was really special. And as you said, there, there was no Grima name on the front, just a simple, uh, the, the hands for the watch. And um, of course it would be fully marked inside the watch, but after that, Omega did another line of uh, jewels that were inspired by this collection that were less expensive and um, would have the same look, but 
they wouldn't have been a part of this one. And so that's just something to note. And you will see on those pieces, the watches do have uh, Omega on the front or even Grima on the front, I think. In I think it's Omega, actually. Okay. Yeah. And then, it, and, then it's, and then it's my father's sort of um, signature on the back of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was quite funny is that, um, so my father was paid a million, uh, I think it was a million francs for this collection by Omega. And um, when uh, sort of by the end, you know, by the end of the tour, etc., cetera, um, they, they summoned him to their offices in Switzerland and he anticipated that they were gonna question the cost of, um, and whether it was worth it. And so he was left alone in the ante room and had brought all the, the uh, newspaper press with him and he covered the floor with it. And as they walked in, he said, well, you would have had to probably pay four times as much to get this press coverage. So I, you know, <laughs> don't complain. <laughs> No, it's 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 really one of the most amazing things from this period in history that I can think of. This collection, yeah, yeah absolutely, and very collectible. And only sorry, uh, just to go back a second. Um, so there was also the rule that only one model per continent could be sold. So you know there are only two or three of each watch ever made. No. Which I think is interesting that you say that one per continent, because as a rule, your father made uh, one of a kind pieces. Mm -hmm. Very rarely was there more than one, unless, of course, somebody wanted a piece in another place, because he didn't want to see his customers coming and going. You know, I mean, the last thing in the world is you don't want to be seen at the same cocktail party in the same dress, and it was the same thing with yeah. Charlie. And, um, so this piece on the left, uh, which was originally designed in 1970, it, this particular group is owned by, no, I think these might, I, I can't remember if this is hers or mine, but there are two of them in the world that we know about. And my good friend has one and I have the other one. <laughs> it was funny because when I bought it, I bought it in Hong Kong and my friend said, oh, did you see that fake Andrew Grima that went for sale? And I said, what? And I said, um, yeah, I bought it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just panicked. <laughs> so she said, well, I have the original one. <laughs> and I said, okay. So then that led me to talk to Francesca and her mother, Jojo, and also uh, talk to um, Tom Scott, who produced a number of these jewels for Andrew Grima, and they, 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 they're like, no, no, it's absolutely, it's absolutely right. No fear. The one I have is dated 1975, and this one's dated 1970. So, And also, they are different, because Baroque pearls, you can never have, you know, the same pearls. So, so to me, they're different anyway. <laughs> Even the construction is, mm -hmm. you know, it's all, each piece is hand cut and chased. And so it is completely different. Yeah. yeah. But then you've got these other wonderful pieces from the seventies. And we were talking the other day about um, how you felt that your father had started to be really comfortable with himself and his own design and be more playful as time went on. Absolutely, and show, and there's so much movement in them. So this Opal and Pearl collection um, was uh, was designed at the same time as he had to design all those watches for Omega, but it was launched seven months later. Um, opals and pearls were, have always were always his favorite stones, and um, as you can see, the top two on the the right hand side of these pearls, and they dangled so there'd be this movement while you were wearing the ring or the earrings and I, I think yeah they're so playful and um, my father had a great sense of humor and I think it really shows in some of his pieces and then the bottom two are very unusual opals which are also part of the collection. And then there's this rock revival which is that's Tell you were telling me about the invitation, which I think is a great place to start. Absolutely. So the invitation was in the form of a vinyl, and um, so you can see the center piece, which says "Rock Revival." That was sort of like the album cover. So 
the vinyl came in the album cover and then it also came with um, some candy with rock revival written on it so it was all very playful and um, and you know fantastic and I think you know people other jewelers and my father included had been using unusual uncut stones but they were kind of easy to come by stones whereas these had been sourced from around the world and were really incredibly unusual never nobody had ever seen anything quite like them before um so it was a, sort of a big eye opener and i'm sure as an eye opener just for those younger designers out there might be looking at this going what you mean that's from 1971, uh, with no clue that you know this this material actually existed. So I think if you look at jewelry today, it very much looks like what was happening then. Um, I, I know even I, I, I say if you go to TJ Maxx, for example, <laughs> you can you can see jewelry that's inspired by this time period, whether people know it or not. Absolutely. And it's it's really sad because nowadays it's very difficult. I mean, for example, that um, long citrine crystal on the on the necklace, it would be impossible to find that sort of specimen nowadays, um, which is very sad. So. Let me just tell you that citrine crystal, because I've seen it, it later went into a torque, I believe. It, it's, wait, where's that go? It's, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. It's like, what four inches or something i mean you know this is not a dinky little piece of jewelry around your neck and by the way this <laughs> rima and this wait how do we do it there and <laughs> both from the 70s yeah. <laughs> so, i mean that's, that's the problem with with the youtube presentation is that nobody has you know nobody can really see how big these pieces are but we can assure you they're huge <laughs> yes absolutely Next. And the Super Shells collection, again, taking things that aren't important, but beautiful, jewels in their own rights, yeah. and then turning them into something that is even more fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I think my father, this is a great example of my father, you know, looking at uh, materials that are aesthetically pleasing and intrinsically complete, you know, no value whatsoever. Um, and um, and it's quite funny because the um, the press release said that the collection um, had been sourced by divers in the Philippines, Taiwan, and the Great Barrier Reef, which is true. But my my father actually bought them in a small shop under Sydney Harbour Bridge. So, you know, um, but yeah, I mean that was also a fantastic collection, um, really stunning pieces. sticks and stones collection um the piece in the center is in my collection and that's on view at the museum as well and um it's a tourmaline the the pink tourmaline stick and then it has this wonderful crystallized agate that's mounted to it and it's in white gold and you'll notice the other piece on the right is also uh tourmaline uh tourmaline i believe right Yes, uh, right. in white gold. And uh, you may have already seen that there wasn't a lot of white gold that uh, Grima used in his designs. But for these two pieces, they almost are like stalactites. And I think it really plays to the iciness, the quality that he was looking for with these particular jewels. Um, yeah, I mean... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, no. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> uh, no, Kim and I were saying actually while we were rehearsing the other day, how these two pieces would actually not work in white gold and would look very strange. And um, so the piece on the right is actually in our collection. It's about uh, this long. So yeah, it's quite amazing. And I think, it, I think this collection is actually quite simple, but probably because my father had sort of, you know, he'd reached the height of his fame and he didn't really feel he had anything more to prove. So, um, so, so it's a much more simple collection, just holding the stones and, and showing off their natural beauty. Yeah, I really love those. Mm -hmm. I really love those. And then the tales of Tahiti. Again, this um, 
when he was traveling as he did so often. I mean, he really did travel all over constantly, like you said, having trunk shows and everybody wanted to meet him and everybody wanted a piece of him. And um, I have to say, I love the quote of when you moved to Switzerland, how um, you, they, your mom and um, father joined the local tennis club immediately because they, he said, well, we have to make friends because if we make friends, you make clients. And, and the thing is, he was doing it as a service to those new friends selling jewelry because he said, I'm saving them from buying really awful jewelry. <laughs> So he, he, he really believed in himself and, um, and, and actually so did his new friends that turned into clients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was quite funny when people asked him, so Mr. Grimmer, which other jewelers do you like? And he said, jewelers, there aren't any other jewelers. <laughs> I was be so embarrassed. I said, daddy, you can't say that. <laughs> But here in his travels too, not only did he uh, reach out to clients, but he was sourcing material as well. So, you know, he's buying pearls on his trips or shells or agate or yeah. carved emeralds. Yeah. And I think with the a tale of Tahiti, he sort of wants to challenge the, you know, the, the twin set pearls, row of pearls that everyone was wearing. And, um, and uh and yeah and he was the first one to actually make a multicolored string of pearls so he went to his pearl dealer friend and picked out a few pearls and um said i'd like to make a necklace of these and his his friend said to him oh, okay yes i'll get you i'll you know i'll pick out the the same colors and my father said no no, no i want them all different colors and that's that's how it started and now you see them everywhere but uh, yeah he was the pioneer of the multicolored pearl necklace. I'm moving. I'm running out of power. <laughs> Where are we going here? <laughs> but, um, oh, this, oh good, this slide. This is, my, this is my slide. I have to talk about this crazy slide. So I was doing some research and I came across this article on Grima that said, oh, and, um, Andrew Grima designed a package for Colotax pantyhose. And um, I thought, what? And so apparently Colotex had come up with a couple of designs. Their ad department came up with a couple of designs. And one was a, a naked lady wearing pantyhose, which didn't really fly. And, the, and then the other idea was uh, Andrew Grima and um, I guess, somehow saying that you know this this our pantyhose are like jewelry or something <laughs> I, I never really can figure it out although i just think it's funny that he said sure why not you know and so the necklace on the right the actual necklace um is such an important piece when it was on the Colotex package, it was valued at 7,000 pounds. And in 2015, it sold for $96,000. So um, there's a big jump. Yeah. Uh, I guess this points out that those of you out there that think you like Andrew Grima, you should collect it. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful. And, um, but anyway, I'm just getting ahead of myself. <laughs> And so by, so my father, well, my parents sold, sold the business in 1986, uh, the business in London and the business around the world to someone who unfortunately was unable to pay. I mean, my father had planned on retiring and moving to the south of France. Um, but unfortunately, because of this sort of financial debacle, um, we had to start all start over again. So my father speaking Italian said, well, let's, I want to move, I want to leave London. Let's, let's move to Switzerland. Let's move to the Italian part of Switzerland. So uh, in 1986, we moved to Lugano and had a really small shop and a workshop with one goldsmith, uh, which was a big difference from the 65 goldsmiths that he had in London. And uh, my mother did the bookkeeping and my father did the designing. And as you were saying, Kim, you know, he, he joined the tent, they joined the tennis club. My father used to 
you know, go, go to the baker every Sunday and got him as a client. And so slowly, slowly things started looking up. Um, but it was all a very different lifestyle uh, for us. And these are some of the pieces that, uh, that he designed between 1980 and 2006, which um, perhaps, yeah, I think, I think you can see a difference in the style. Uh, maybe, yeah. It's to me they're they're they are 80s and 90s and they're very you know they're they're bolder and they're reflecting the shoulder pads that we were wearing at the time and you know I mean they're it he just is always contemporary you know the work continues to change slightly you can still identify it as Andrew Grima of course but you know he's he's changing with the times and I think that's really admirable. And so and these, it, sorry. <laughs> so these are by your mom. These are by my mother. Yes. Uh, so my mother joined the company. Um, well, she started in the workshop when she was 24 years old. Um, so there was a, a 30 year age gap between my parents, and um, and she she, I love her pieces. Uh, they they have the Grima ethos, but at the same time, they're perhaps slightly more colourful. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, maybe, maybe slightly more feminine even. And she uses more faceted stones than, than rough stones, uh, which is what my, you know, my father used to love, so yeah. And, and then he's like my design. <laughs> <laughs> so I joined the company when I was 18. And um, I, I, as, as, my mother, the Grima ethos is always in the back of my head. Um, you know, everything needs to be handmade from start to finish, and it needs to look as beautiful from the back as it does from the front. Um, but uh, perhaps I'm not so much into texture as my father was. I like a sort of a, a more, a more, um, a smoother finish. And um, as him, I use I use rough rough stones, and uh, I think. I'm very inspired by um, product designers such as Dieter Hams and Joni Ives. So for me, simple is better. And I think if you have a beautiful stone, don't make it into a complicated design just just to make it a design. You know, keep it simple and beautiful. And that, that's pretty much my, my ethos. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Oh yeah, so this is Grima today. <laughs> mm -hmm. The queen is still wearing the brooch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're very lucky because we we work with a lot of stylists. We don't pay for we still don't pay for advertising, and um, stylists just love using our, our jewelry because it's different, it's unique, and it's you know we're a small company. So you know, I if, if a stylist emails me, I'll be their contact from start to finish. You know, I'll be emailing them back and also delivering delivering the jewelry to them, uh, which is the same in social media. You know, I'm always the one answering messages on Instagram, et cetera. So sorry if it takes me a while <laughs> to respond to messages. Um, anyway, so on the on the left, there's um, beautiful Hayley Bieber on the cover of Love magazine wearing our earrings. And then below the queen, you'll see Mark Jacobs wearing his Grima pendant and Milcha Prada wearing her watch. And um, and yeah, and so, and then there's uh, uh, Gigi Hadid wearing our earrings. And um, yeah, I mean, we're a very small company. It's just my mother and I, but uh, we love it that way. And uh, long may it continue. <laughs> Absolutely. And the next slide shows this wonderful book that's recently been released on Andrew Grima um, by uh, uh, Tell Me Your Your um, Tell Me the Writer's Name Again. William Brott. William, William Brott. Yes, it, William Brott. It's great, 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 great stories. A fun read. Pictures after pictures after pictures of Grima jewelry. You won't be disappointed. Put it in, definitely, you know, it's a great Christmas gift. And you may as well buy two books because <laughs> <laughs> there's the one that accompanies the Simply Brilliant exhibition in Cincinnati that Cynthia Amneus put together. 
by, uh, from the Cincinnati Art Museum. And it is my personal collection, but it features um, uh, a number of different artist jewelers from the 60s and 70s. And uh, what's so interesting about it is we have bios on each of the makers, as well as maker's marks in the back of the book. So it, it gives you a, a, a real glimpse into uh, Andrew Grima and his compatriots. And um, I'm just so thrilled to be able to have really gotten to know Francesca a little better. And uh, it's been wonderful talking with her about her dad and getting more insight to things. It's been, it's been great. lovely talking to you, Kim. Really great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think, I think that's it. Yeah. Right? Do are we do we have time for questions or? Uh, we're actually pretty tight on time. Um, we haven't had too many questions in the chat or most of which you actually already answered in your fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to have to actually wrap it up there. Okay. But I want to say thank you to you both for such a fantastic overview uh, of this amazing artist's work. And thank you both for being here to kick off day three already so many fantastic themes that are also kind of like coming up through the week. You know, this idea of like cross-disciplinary practice, you know, like that he was an engineer, became a jeweler. My great grandfather was actually an engineer that became a jeweler also. Wow. So it's like, I feel like there's a lot of this kind of intersection between, you know, certain practices of technology and design that we tend to think of as siloed or separate mm -hmm. that are actually very, you know, interconnected with one another. Um, and the queen brooch, I just, you know, I love that story. It's like the queen has no shortage of jewels to <laughs> choose from. And the fact that she constantly chooses this brooch and just has loved it for such a long time is such a fantastic story. Um, you're getting a lot of love in the comments, both of you, for such a great presentation. And yeah, thank you so much thank for being you. here. Thank you. And if I just may say one thing, if you have any questions, you can always uh, send me a message on Instagram. Um, and I'll I'll respond yeah. obviously. Same, <laughs> here. Same here. Well, actually, the person that does my Instagram will respond. <laughs> uh, folks, I will dig up those Instagram handles in just a moment, and I'll post them in the chat for you. Wonderful. So thank you so easy. much. Okay. Thank you both so much for being thank here. You. Okay, folks, we are going to move on to our next program. What an exciting, just action-packed morning that we have for you. I hope you're all uh hyped and ready for our next program which i am going to introduce to you now um so next up we have fabio salini the new master of modernism and fabio is going to be in conversation with jewelry historian and author vivian becker um the fabio is going to explain to us his new visual language for jewels and we're going to explore themes and inspirations materials and techniques it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Vivian and Fabio. And that's just, hi, good morning. <laughs> or particularly good afternoon. You're actually uh, joining us from across the pond. So <laughs> welcome. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I am gonna get your presentation queued up and I'll hand it over to you, Vivian. Well, thank you, thank you, yeah. So welcome to everyone and um, Thank you for this opportunity. It's my first event uh, in um, New York Jewelry Week and congratulations to you all on a wonderful initiative. So I'm delighted to be here um, and delighted to be with my friend, uh, Fabio Cellini, um, who's born and bred in Rome and is one of the most innovative and individualistic um, designer jewelers, independent designer jewelers in in the world today. Um, and most of all, he's the leader of the new modernist movement um, that I've seen, I hope you all have seen emerging in the last few years. Um, and it's interesting that it's happening sort of a hundred years um, after the original modernism swept through the jewelry world. Uh, and as we settle into the new millennium and into the, into the 2020s, um, I've been very lucky to spend time with with Fabio, um, to see him in his natural habitat, in his uh, his wonderful boutique and atelier in the historic centre of Rome, and also in his um, Victorian artist studio in London, um, and we worked together closely on a 
on a major retrospective exhibition that was due to happen in New York at Phillips um, in 2020, and that unfortunately had to be postponed at the very last minute um, due to, to COVID. But um, working with him really did give me the opportunity to delve into Fabio's uh, creative process, his, his themes um, and, and inspirations, um, and um, to, to see his exploration of materials. But also, as a historian, I was particularly intrigued to, to understand the depth of Fabio's knowledge and understanding of jewellery history, um, something we're going to discuss because I believe that this knowledge has really helped him to, um, to find the way forward into uh, a completely new and relevant expression of modernism for the 21st century jewel. Um, I think this has also allowed him to really dare to innovate, to, to challenge the, the status quo, um, to push the boundaries, um, and that's what we're going to talk about um, uh, this afternoon. So uh, let's begin, Fabio, I think for people who don't know you, with just um, a little bit of, of background, um, how you've been immersed in every aspect of the jewellery industry for the past um, 20 years, um, and how you've got to this point in your career. Yeah, this is... Um... One of the very first, I, I understand that we, we will look at my career through the materials that I have, have um, uh, experimented. And, uh, yes, yeah, this through is, the, your mastery, your exploration of materials, which goes hand in hand with your expo exploration of, of technique and craftsmanship. And, and of course, that's all totally integrated into your design language. So I think, yeah, we're going to chart the course of your of your career through these slides and through through the materials. So, yeah, but maybe just yeah. explain about your background in, in the industry a little bit. Yeah, my background was, I mean, I, I did, I, I'm a, a geologist and, and a gemologist. So um, I have a, a degree in geology. So uh, I studied uh, the world of the of, of stones in general and, and gems, uh, and then I had the chance to start as a designer at Cartier and then moved to Bulgari. And of course, I've been strongly influenced by these two big, uh, you know, two big brands, and I fell in love, of course, with uh, their, uh, their their work and their uh, their their design and. Um, uh, so I, 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 I think that as a very young designer, I was, uh, my design was uh, in a way, uh, it, you, can, you can understand, you can see that it was strongly influenced in a way by that school, but with uh, something that uh, since the very beginning wanted to be, uh, wanted to be different. Wanted, I mean, uh, being original was what, uh, what drove me since the very, the very beginning of my career. So for example, and, and this is why I started to experiment uh, different materials, because I thought that every single material could bring into the jewellery something new. Uh, of course, rock crystal wasn't that new because it was used in the 30s, but um, at those time, um, um, like 90s and 2000, at the beginning of, of the 21st century, uh, it was very, uh, jewellery was very, um, based on the use of big volumes and pavé. The Bulgari revolutions, uh, uh, Bulgari, uh, uh, to me, operated the, the, the last, the big, uh, I mean, uh, uh, not the last, the very last was, um, is more recent, but um, at the time, uh, uh, Bulgari um, uh, uh, made a big revolution and imposed these big volumes with pavé. Uh, I mean, to, uh, not to be like the others, I thought that these big volumes should be replaced with some, something more uh, light and, and feminine and uh, uh, young and fresh. And so I used the rock crystal um, was what original for the time uh, where the, the gems inlaid into the rock crystal, so, so set into rock crystal, a technique that now is, um, uh, is quite on vogue uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and uh, rock crystal has been my first love, so mm -hmm. I never abandoned it, and, and still I use rock crystal sometimes in, in uh, uh, and also the evolution of my design used rock crystal, make me, made me use the rock crystal in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like to, to say that uh, when I fell in love with, with a material, 
uh, which makes me experiment new shapes, new um, uh, volumes, new uh, styles also. Uh, I never abandon it. Sometimes I, I, I take it back and I combine it with, uh, with a more recent uh, uh, style and, and, uh, and material that I'm using at the moment. So it, it, it is quite uh, interesting how the past always, it, yeah. sometimes it's always combined with the present. Yeah, we can see that. Let's have a look at the next, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, coral, which of course is so, so Italian. Um, yeah. And uh, you, know, you have this great affinity with, with color too, with material. So, um, yeah, as a yeah. as a Mediterranean, <laughs> as an Italian, of course, I like coral. Uh, I have to say that I still prefer to use coral in its or, um, original shape, like in branches, because I think that Branch they really express. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they re really uh, that way. It really expresses uh, the strength and the uh, and its life, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is something. Uh, very attractive in in those in those uh, forms and the, in those shapes, uh, but for these um, particular uh, pair of, of cuffs, uh, it was interesting to to use the different shades of color and uh, like to demonstrate that uh, um, the stones uh, or gems or in this case coral. Mm -hmm. Uh, can be used like uh, like a painter, like a palette of colors. So yeah. uh, and maybe maybe give um, an idea of what the nature can can offer, mm -hmm. what the sea yeah. can offer. It's so a, this is a, organic, this is a, yeah. It's yeah. an organic, yeah. This is absolutely yeah. is a is a unique mm -hmm. pair of cufflinks, of course, mm -hmm. that couldn't be done again <laughs> because. <laughs> no. uh, because of the of the price, because of of the diff, uh, uh, because it's difficult to source coral, and mm -hmm. um, and also because my pieces are, uh, I mean, are, are, are usually it's one of a kind. One of a kind, yeah. One of a kind, and and there's another. I think there's another organic material coming up next, please. I think, yeah, this yeah. is yeah. Chagrin. Oh, there was maybe one of your early, again, one of your earlier experiments with the, with the new material and new texture. Yeah, yeah. A chagrin as a as a as a skin, as a fish skin. Mm -hmm. uh, again, wanted to. I um, I mean, the very first uh, uh, feeling I had with chagrin is that that this kind of texture could uh, remind a pavé of stones, uh, but in a very fresh, uh, in a very contemporary way. And so more uh, uh, cool, if you want, more um, uh, modern, uh, definitely. And uh, the fact that we could paint it in, in, in many different color uh, could, be, could, be, um, could be used for, for hosting uh, uh, many different kind of, of, of gems, many, col many different colors, and uh, could be the perfect uh, you know, uh, place where to play with gems. And uh, and also, of course, uh, it allows to you know to 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 create every kind of of, of shape like this intricate you know mm -hmm. uh, snake. Um, uh, so uh, so I could express uh, um, the strength and the aggressivity of this of this animal uh, uh, around the neck. Um, uh, possibly, I couldn't have done it with other other materials so i thought it was the perfect material to use for uh, uh for making this kind of designs and it replicates the the scales of the of the snake with the with the with the texture and once again there's the um the organic as association and i guess each each material had its own History and associations, um, which again you've you've really delved into and, and interpreted. Yeah, yeah I think that's one of your great skills. Have you? <laughs> but what what they what the different materials I think they have in common is that is mm -hmm. that they evoke something. Mm -hmm. I mean, by themselves. I mean, uh, yeah. Other, I mean, uh, immediately I think that I mean to me and I hope to the to uh, to the clients to my. To my clients, um, for, for example, stingray evokes something uh, 
the animal kingdom, like coral in a way. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. there is the, the, the strength of nature which, come, uh, which comes yeah. to in, mm -hmm. in the world of jewelry. So uh, the, yeah, sorry. Can we look at the next? Can we just have the next slide? You can carry on. Yeah, do carry on talking. It's just this is this is really. Um, this, the relevant same with, to. the same with bamboo so it's uh, mm -hmm. it's it comes from from nature so it brings uh, an idea of of, uh, of something which is alive uh, so it, it um, in my opinion also is a way to um, uh, to to show that uh, jewelry is not is something alive belongs mm -hmm. to really belongs to to us uh, yeah. This is an experiment with, uh, I mean, a very likely experiment with the, the Campana brothers, the famous mm -hmm. contemporary artists and, and designers uh, from Brazil. Uh, Brazil. It's, a, it's a collaboration Brazil. and uh, mm -hmm. they wanted to point out the attention on, on uh, material, uh, materials which are under, um, under protection because they, mm -hmm. uh, they, go to, uh, they, they are going to be um, uh, endangered, yeah, uh, endangered, so, endangered materials. So we yeah. worked, we worked mm -hmm. on bamboo and uh, capim dourado, which is a, was a, a kind of straw uh, that you can only find in Brazil. Which, so it's, it's which is in the next, the next slide, please. Yeah. I think, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So this particular uh, and the the concept, uh, the very first time I did a collaboration with contemporary uh, artists, uh, and the very first time I brought the concept into the jewelry. So this, uh, to me, this collaboration is a, a moment which uh, is a turning point of my career because it's, it's the very first moment uh, I started to uh, bring something else in jewelry which was not only aesthetic but also mm -hmm. uh, a concept. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of this work was to was to put in uh, to compare humble materials with uh, the world of jewelry to uh, like um, in order to ask the observer so what is more what is more uh, um, uh, rich what precious. is more precious, precious. Yeah, what's pre um, what meaning, is more yeah. precious yeah, so yeah. the world of jewelry uh, wants to mm -hmm. of course represent the luxury world and mm -hmm. the capin dorado so the organic material the, the very humble ones uh, want to represent, of course, the, the nature and the endangered nature. Uh, this yeah. is uh, this wants to 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 ask uh, if we could, uh, if we should, you know, preserve more what is what is rich or what is humble, and mm -hmm. nature versus diamonds. Yes, yeah. this I mean the I mean traditionally, so much of the the value of a jewel has been in, in its materials, and as you told me before, I think this was one of your foremost challenges Fabio wasn't it to to yeah, to challenge I mean to question that preconception to to question what is most precious today um, and also to to move the jewel away from the connotations of being a showy status symbol or a, or a sign of a sign of wealth was this yeah, really important to you because if you look at jewelry I mean jewelry at the very beginning was born as as an amulet so an amulet. So it it was an, um, uh, a symbol of of strength of a of an elite of you know like uh, uh, um, uh, the the boss of a tribe. Protection. Yeah, of protection. I mean, expressing uh, magical uh, something magical. So yeah. it was. So the power was was not was a magical mm -hmm. power was a. Uh, uh, an elevate power was not the power of the money, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a little by little it turned into something, and maybe 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 uh, the humans, you know, brought this value yeah. into jewelry. Well, so it's always a yeah, symbol of symbol of power, but I guess originally it was a, a connection to the divine. You know, it had to be a, a way of understanding the world as well. And, and this this is important to you. This you know to to challenge people's perceptions of the, the monetary value as opposed to the emotional or artistic value of a jewel. Yeah, so my, now my goal is not to, 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 to bring back jewelry to, 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 to the amulet, but to the, the symbol, I mean, to the amulet, but uh, maybe um, using jewelry to, to show that uh, or to be recognized as a, as, a, as a form of art and not necessarily as an, uh, as a, as values, as gems assembled together, 
as a status symbol. And uh, we have the next slide, please. Well, well, Fabio is uh, is talking. So, um, yeah, in in terms of of art and in terms of your ex your continual exploration of materials and how they how that has informed uh, technique and design. Um, let's talk a bit about carbon fiber, which is one of the defining features of your work. Um, um, Tell us a little bit about how you first came across carbon fiber and um, uh, it's, how you it's, worked it. It's a long story, a long love, which started uh, many years ago. Because I, I used to, I used to, I like the, I like black. Mm, I think it's very dramatic, and uh, mm -hmm. and the the gems and the, the the diamonds mostly, but also the color gem, they stand up, they stand out on black. So I thought it was. Um, on, on, in, in my in my uh, in, in my way, not, you know, to become uh, uh, each time more original and and also dramatic. It was the perfect, uh, you know, ebony was the perfect uh, material to host uh, host gems and create something uh, something different. But um, uh, working on, on ebony uh, presents a lot of limits. And uh, so once I, I discovered carb carbon fiber, and uh, I immediately understood that there was, first of all, um, a lot of advantages in using it, and and then that it, it had uh, it had a, a, a different, a very strong personality. I, it could bring an entire world in the in the in the jewelry. And first, a, a word of technology, of modernity, and of masculinity. Mm -hmm. So why why this? Because I recently I understood that I abandoned, you know, the idea of the of the very delicate fem, um, woman I was used to design for, and uh, so my 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 muse, my ideal muse, was a strong woman. Was a very powerful yeah. woman. Was is is the is the woman of today, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the use of carbon fiber conceptually is a, a, a real, really a way to uh, accept, you know, the 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 role that we, women have now in, in in our society, in our culture, and um, so masculine. Uh, uh, being masculine uh, means being strong and. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. so it, this is a, a tribute to the strength of women. <laughs> and also it's beautiful because, I mean, it's, it's very light, it's contemporary, it's, uh, it's technological, it's it, it yeah. attracts men who usually yeah. have to buy yeah. jewelry yeah. <laughs> because women wear jewelry, but men buy jewelry. So yeah. um, it was, uh, I, I, little by little, I, I, I could understand and I could, uh, uh, see the reaction also of women and men both uh, mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 they were also intrigued and I was so technically of course intrigued mm -hmm. by this material that I decide to work a few years on, a, in, on an entire collection that I kept a secret for a long time until I didn't come to London and I didn't you know uh, sh um, uh, uh, exhibit it uh, in during the shows uh, masterpiece and part uh, so my, was my uh, my my business card I mean when I when I approached London and it has been extremely extremely successful and it's, it's very velvety and as you can see here there's, there's that wonderful contrast between the the velvety opaque depth of the carbon fiber and then the translucence in and and life of, of the stones. Maybe we can look at the next at uh, the next slide. As I well. also have um, some yeah. samples. So you can mm. see, for example, you can see the texture, and it's not mm. a, a flat texture because the fibers give mm. this tiny uh, and also uh, translucent um, sheen. It's got a sheen, so it's yeah, yeah. it's um, yeah, so it's very these, very seductive. Yeah material no, but also can i ask you is it is it your italian side as well that loves the the machines the technology like italians love cars and yeah uh, of course I've been, I, I, I i i was born in, in in the in the country of ferrari and uh, yeah, and, and exactly. fashion so <laughs> there is something there is something silky which reminds me satin 
And there is something uh, really strong, which re reminds me that, you know, the, the masculine world of, 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 mm -hmm. of cars, of, of boats, of planes. And, uh, uh, and I think that this is also uh, the secret of this material. Mm -hmm. These earrings that you see in the picture are the very, one of the very first pieces I, I, I did in carbon fiber. And yeah, as you can see, the carbon fiber is like an element, uh, a part of the design, but mm -hmm. Um, little by little, what I want to, to say is that we moved from a more uh, intense use of carbon fiber up to mm -hmm. uh, objects like this, where mm -hmm. the carbon fiber is not only you know, the main uh, protagonist of, of, of the piece, but also uh, it is the structure of the piece. So the hinges are in the carbon fiber, which is, this is the very con uh, revolutionary concept that the hinges are in the carbon in carbon yeah. fiber. Gold yeah. is only decorative. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. It only wants to underline the mm -hmm. curves of, of the piece. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so uh, I took away from gold his yeah. uh, dominant role in jewelry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is the, the, big, the big revolution. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, un uh, until I could, and, and then I improved my use of, of, uh, of my, my, my know-how, of course, and my, my, um, I could master carbon fiber up to um, elements like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, very thin, very, very, very light, but yes. also very oh, strong. Yeah. So the wonderful, idea, wonderful the, earrings. The idea, the idea in this earring was is it, this is the synthesis, this pair of earrings. That's why I want to show it to you because they are exactly what I wanted to um, to prove that you can you have to combine to, um, in order to be a contemporary jeweler. You have to combine tradition, the world of jewelry, to innovation. So this is the tradition, a very mm -hmm simple uh, mm -hmm. earrings in just made with with gems in this case with the emeralds and then i mean this volume which totally changes uh, when you when you turn the piece it totally changes the design uh, mm -hmm. of this piece it's it's, a, it's simply a volume which remind me, uh, reminds me the the, the 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 big african circle so african it's a, yeah it's really it's yeah really tribal. yeah it's tribal a, the tribal, tribal yeah. strength mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. made this piece absolutely mm -hmm. Uh, original, but also look at the technique. In order to preserve this this design, so the curve of these uh, of this element, I I did I had to study a way to open them. Mm -hmm. And oh uh, uh, yeah, it's look. fantastic! It's really yeah, it's sensational. Every mm -hmm. single piece mm -hmm. is made with a different mm -hmm. technique. So the 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 um, the secret is, I mean, to work this material, you have to engineer every single design in order to have the result that you that you uh, and that you Fabio, can i um can i bring something else in here i mean you told me also that carbon fiber reminded you of victorian jet victorian yeah. morning jewelry and then i think you know this could be a good point to ask about how you how you fuse tradition and, and modernity and and uh, and also to move on to all the the underlying themes uh, and and the narrative that's behind you and i think it's surprising for a modernist i want to say that you know modernism is not purely about about design about uh graphism no, I, um I, there is the the meaning uh, yeah, behind it to use a, we have to put this concept in 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 uh, you know in the time i started to use carbon, carbon fiber yeah. and uh, can we look at uh, the next slide as well well um Fabio uh, it was it was okay. 2010 more or less when i started to use mm -hmm. it, and it was after the big crisis financial crisis so, so mm -hmm. the, the 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 world of lux luxury was quite you know uh, also mm, touched by this big uh, world uh, crisis and uh, um and uh, uh i think that also wars and also uh bad uh, events are uh, every day you know um around us so i think that there is there must must be a new way to uh to conceive the uh, to conceive luxury luxury must be in my opinion uh and mostly today must be uh, discreet uh, must yeah. be more uh, less, uh, uh, you know, showing uh, show, uh, less show off, and um, uh, that's why I thought that also black 
could be uh, could could be a way you know to uh, 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 to create a softer you know language of luxury and uh, I think that this ring I don't know if you if you can mm -hmm. see it uh, okay. no like this yes. uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this is an example because it's very discreet, it's set on, on, on black carbon fiber, but when, so the richness of this oh, ring yes. yeah. is hidden mm -hmm. within a black, uh, a, a black jacket. Yeah. And um, it's like to say, I keep the preciousness uh, 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 for myself and I don't show it off mm -hmm. and uh, I don't offer it to everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's 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 a more a delicate and this and, and discreet way to be uh, mm -hmm. not to wear wellness mm -hmm. uh, wellness mm -hmm. and and uh, and richness also mm -hmm. and the personal so it's really got a personal meaning it's for your personal pleasure and if we can just look at look at the slide because this is um I think the perfect point to move on to some of your your themes and motifs and the, and the meanings behind them so this is the knot one of the earliest of, of motifs. Um, symbol of strength, the un, undying, everlasting love, the undying, the un, yeah, <laughs> undoable yeah. ties of love. Um, yes, but it, um, about the knot. it is important for me to say that uh, whatever we are analyzing at the moment, uh, it's uh, is not exactly the 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 uh, what was not the purpose I used. I started use these symbols or these materials. This is what we can now, after twenty more than twenty years, we can we can observe. You know, putting all the pieces together, all the all the materials together, all the symbols together, and uh, uh, I have to say that uh, that I I, I can. Um, I can say that I use symbols of possession because, of possession. because yeah. Probably, yeah, yeah. probably love is mm -hmm. possession and uh, and uh, and jewelry is a is a is a symbol of love because usually it is it is uh, offered for uh, anniversary or to as a promise of love and uh, mm -hmm. so I wanted to emphasize this message through the symbols and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so the knot, uh, uh, the chain, uh, the noose. We have, um, can we look at the next, the next slide please, which should be, yeah, the, the net, I love, I love these, the cage or the net, again, it's holding, holding yeah. memories, you know, because exactly. jewels create memories that then you, you know, are possessed by a jewel. Is, is it a way, in a jewel. is a delicate way to create a, prison for for your beloved <laughs> one but, but also this is an exercise i i learned from the contemporary world so mm -hmm. to turn to turn the meaning of what it is uh, of something which is um, commonly un understood and perceived in a way to turn it in in something which is has an opposite way so usually the net and this kind of net this is a poor net uh, reminds reminds us prison reminds a uh, cage uh, mm -hmm. so uh, as not a, as a, as not a, a let's say a beautiful or a, a positive meaning but using it uh, in gold and on the wrist of uh, you know of a lady and in this delicate way but still you know uh, showing uh, uh, the way of um, it is it, uh, the way it is made so this mm -hmm. for example in these earrings you can see that it's mm -hmm. one uh, um uh gold uh, uh thread uh, really thread yeah exactly thread like a like a net yeah yeah which makes yeah. the construction of this piece mm -hmm. which is mm. very it, it looks like very simple but uh, the construction mm. of this piece is quite complicated yeah. because it, 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 it's a it's a math uh formula mm -hmm. mathematical formula because i mean every single element must be a, a, slightly bigger uh, because the uh -huh. you know the shape of the, of the of the cuff is not is not straight but is uh, like this but anyhow um so uh using the net in this uh in this way in a noble material like gold mm -hmm. and in a delicate uh uh shape like this mm -hmm. uh makes the net so what is commonly under um, perceived like something you know offensive 
uh, makes it uh, feminine, delicate, beautiful, uh, rich, and uh, and strong and strong at the and same time. Strong. And yeah, because yeah. the net itself yeah. uh, mm -hmm. evokes mm -hmm. strength. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So and and around the neck is a way to, you know, to catch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, around yeah. the wrist uh, is ca around the wrist. Yeah, the wrist. Mm -hmm. And we can have a look at the next slide. But Please, but um, there's the chain, but also Fabio, I know you've also said to me that you think it's these underlying, this underlying meaning that transforms a jewel in, into a work of art. Is that? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. The your idea? Yeah. The, the, concept it, the concept itself is the principle mm -hmm. of contemporary art. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as I always say, um, if we want to lift uh, jewelry as a form, as an expression of art, of major art, of fine art, so it has to be uh, contemporary mm -hmm. because uh, today art is contemporary and the principle of contemporary art is the concept. So you can, if you are only figurative, uh, so mm -hmm. that is not an, an expression of it's art today. No. It yeah. wasn't passed between mm -hmm. the art and contemporary art is mm -hmm. uh, is uh, that is the introduction of the concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. when you introduce a, a, a concept uh, through a material, through a shape, through a symbol, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is a way to um, to, to to lift up uh, jewelry mm -hmm. into into an expression of of, of major art. And, this and is, it also it, has to it has well, to reflect. It has to be it has to be relevant. I think it has to reflect its moment in time. I mean, for me, I think that's what that's what also elevates a jewel to a work of art. In the, and we can judge that from the great uh, jewels of of history. Those are the jewels that really capture and reflect their moment in time, which is exactly what what you're doing. I think, and uh, yeah. Anyway, here's the chain. Yeah, do you want to talk about the? The chain, which is also an important symbol is, for you, yeah. The chain. I mean, uh, what else you can use for, you know, keeping someone uh, or uh, tying someone to you? Chain. So the chain is. Um, I don't know, but I, I, uh, I really, I don't use it. I don't uh, use this symbol because of this. It's something which is which, which come. Uh, um, which comes instinctively, not not is not is not uh, is no. not a purpose. It's an, it's an instinct. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. mm. But you know, create creativity is an emotional process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's, sometimes it's, it's you, do, definitely you, you, instinctive. you do, you do, yeah, and uh, uh, you you make a hundred of sketches, and then you say, "This is the right one," mm -hmm. and you don't know why. Uh, mm -hmm. This is this. It, it's a feeling. Yeah. And then yeah, you yeah. work on the proportions, and you work on mm -hmm. the colors. Mm -hmm. You work. You work on many other mm -hmm. you know details, which which mm -hmm. makes you know that idea more uh, more successful. Or yeah. Uh, but uh, but I, I, in order, I understand when the the piece is uh, you know the right piece. Or, or the shape is the right shape, or the volume is the right volume, or the material is the right material, when I feel something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this happens to me yeah. with the symbols. Uh, but when I look at the symbols I have used, like the buckle, like the net, like the cage. The buckle, yeah. Can you see cage, the next slide, please? The next slide. Yeah, they're they're all uh, yeah. symbols of, you know, of even the nail. I mean... The nail. This is the... And you were explaining this is the... The horseshoe nail, not uh, yeah. not horseshoe, an industrial nail. Yeah, because we have to remember that my second passion are horses, yeah. and uh, my my yeah. my my second love are ho horses. So, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't want uh, to use. Uh, but I have to say that the inspiration of uh, of these is um, when I when I thought about the nail, I immediately thought that it had to be the shape of a horse um, horse nail, horseshoe nail. I mean, couldn't a be yes. you know, a carpenter nail, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, and and uh, again, the carbon fiber emphasize you know this strength. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and also this reminds a little bit the piercing. So uh, again. Uh, um, in order to uh, reflect and uh, uh, the, the the time where, uh, where we are living, you no, know, the piercing is a common no, yeah. is a common mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
is a common way. It's not. It's not revolutionary anymore because it's so common. Mm -hmm. But it's young. You know, it's young, it's young. fresh, it's contemporary. Yeah. So uh, Again, it's... I thought that it was time to to mm -hmm. uh, you know to innovate jewelry with uh, young mm -hmm. a young language. You know, mm -hmm. jewelry yeah. to me to me sometimes it, it's too much traditional. You know, it's yeah. like it's, it's the, uh, today I was I was talking to an editor and uh, and uh, we were analyzing how jewelry is the 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 more traditional and the more you know um, uh, uh, the less uh, uh, dynamic you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, system. Uh, if you look at fashion, mm -hmm. if you look at technology, yeah. if you look at even services, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can create yeah. whatever. Uh, and uh, you can, it can become successful in a moment. And for a jeweler today, mm -hmm. uh, it's not it, it, it's not like this. I mean, you have to first of all, you have to pass through the tradition, and mm -hmm. yeah. come out from the tradition is very mm -hmm. difficult. To to make mm -hmm. uh, something new being accepted in mm -hmm. jewelry is is quite complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but because yeah, of, yeah the wrong. materials, the technique, and also jewelry is made to last. It's got this, as you say, it's got the tradition of longevity, which people tend to think means yeah, keeping, but, keeping the same, not imagine, innovating. Imagine if Fontana didn't cut the canvas, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't explore the third dimension yeah. or what is behind. No, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, yeah. uh, all uh, you have to break the rules sometimes. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. to, to you, make you have to understand them first, as you, as you do. Can we have the the next slide, please? I want to get through them all. Yeah, and so another another symbol uh, interpreted um, through carbon fiber and that what the wonderful use of peridots, that real pop of pop of color. Oh. So it's the buckle again, a very Victorian. Victorian yeah. uh, symbol and motif of yeah, possession. But, yeah, yeah, but also in a in a more contemporary way. But it comes it, it comes straight from a belt I have. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> but but uh -huh. it, it, it is important how how things of common use, you know, can become, you know, a, a, a symbol of beauty and of mm -hmm. of of, uh, of yeah. uh, preciousness of power. Mm -hmm. you no, know? and uh, but also the strength of this piece is possibly that. Mm -hmm. That reminds yeah. something of a mm -hmm. that uh, because makes the observer in a in in a, in a comfort zone, you know. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that, that chime that of yeah familiarity. I guess yeah, yeah. it's that it's whatever, that whatever, blend, whatever, that absolute balance of old and new. This this is another concept I learned from contemporary art. When you when you touch, you know, mm -hmm. your memories. Mm. Now, immediately, mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 observer is uh, is in a comfort zone. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a nice feeling because it's warming, you know, it's mm -hmm. like a coat, yeah. it's like a, yeah. a grandma, uh, you know, uh, it's a connection, an emotional connection. It's an Can we have the next slide, please? I'm conscious of we've got a few to get now. Pearls. Again, I want to, to ask you about pearls, which is the ultimate uh jewelry tradition, um, unchanging tradition. Uh, and of course so there's the the perfect opportunity for you to to challenge that tradition, to take yeah. it, to revere it, but then contemporize it, which you, you've done here. So the use of the 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 the, the, the connection of pearls and carbon, carbon fiber uh, is uh, is absolutely is absolutely this. Uh, it was a challenge for uh, giving a new life to pearls, which is. Mm -hmm. I mean, post the strand of pearl is absolutely is the image of our mothers or grandmothers. Yeah. <laughs> so I I wanted to 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 break this image, no, and and said, I mean, how can we make uh, pearls contemporary? And uh, I have to say that uh, this uh, uh, this challenge is and this uh, this this uh, feeling I had that. That I really wanted to create something uh, modern with a, a, a more than traditional, you know, piece of jewelry, which is a strand of pearl, is is something which uh, brought me to create one of the first pieces of carbon fiber and the most successful, which is the carbon fiber uh, necklace with a double strand of pearls on on, on the front, and uh, with a very simple exercise. So instead of having the strand of pearl around the neck. It is uh, it, it is in a double row in front of the like like the necklace we saw before with the yes. color stones, yes. 
And yeah. uh, it, it, but it suddenly I saw many elements in that, in that, uh, in that piece because I saw the black and the white, the, 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 the rigid and the soft, uh, mm -hmm. the unexpensive and the expensive, the old of the, uh, of the pearls and the, and the, and, and the uh, uh, modernity of, of carbon fiber. So I said, listen, this is two world, many contrasts uh, in, at the same time, and an harmony, the harmony of the circle, which is the, the, the most sophisticated yeah. and perfect of shapes. And I said, I mean, what a harmony and uh, with uh, so many contrasts in it. And mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, these create, uh, I mean, uh, creates a, a, an effect of strength. Uh, mm -hmm. intriguing and everybody can read it. Yeah. This is why this this is why uh, that piece was was so successful because everyone is like in contemporary art, for example. Contemporary art sometimes it's very hard to understand the concept of the artist, and everyone can see something different in that piece. But when you when you when you immediately understand the meaning of that piece, uh, that is that mm -hmm. work of art is successful, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, I, just, I, I saw that the wedding between between furs and carbon yeah. fiber was was immediately, you know, arriving mm -hmm. to, to the others, mm -hmm. and uh, still in these earrings you can see, you know, the the, the perfection and the tradition in the front view, and mm -hmm. then the innovation in the side view. Mm -hmm. Also, so those, clever. Yeah. those cuffs, which is which is, I think every woman can see, you know, a cuff of a of a uh, um, of a of a blouse. Sure. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. with with the cufflings, mm -hmm. with the precious cufflings, this makes these humble materials very mm -hmm. masculine and very very mm -hmm. dark and also very hard. Uh, makes it absolutely you know feminine. And also yeah. again, I did work on 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 this concept of the double cuff because it's a symbol. You know, in in, in the um, language of the body, the, the the wrist is a part of of strength. Because you, and, fr because and fragility, it's both. I think it's that. Uh, yeah, but it's less like contrast than you know? the neck. I mean, the neck is yeah. really the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. You know? so, so. Yeah. Uh, so working on on, on, mm -hmm. on the wrist, mm -hmm. on the two wrists, uh, mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Uh, um, Can we have the next slide as well? I don't want to miss. I don't want to. I want to save. Sorry, uh, Fabio. I just want to save enough time for your titanium. Um, ah, creations, okay. the masterpieces, because also I love the idea of this, the mirrored effect and the reflections, and I, I love, I love the concept behind them as, as well. Yeah. Um, the concept, I mean, I've been, I've been using titanium for the last, I think, now 15 mm -hmm. years, and the very mm -hmm. beginning, titanium was used because of the of the colors and because of the mm -hmm. uh, of the lightness, and uh, of course, uh, the last re revolution made by by, by Jar. Uh, influenced uh, all the contemporary jewelers. So we, we uh, but suddenly I wasn't intrigued by the big volumes and the big colors. I mean, I let other people using uh, titanium. Maybe I did, I did that uh, um, uh, that same, let's say, mistake at the very beginning. But uh, suddenly I moved out from, and uh, you can see, uh, for example, here I use titanium as a flat surface. And uh, uh, mm. not uh, so um, uh, not as a flower, not, uh, mm. not as an intricate uh, design. And uh, mm. I added the 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 the, um, the mirror uh, polished uh, gold surface uh, in order to give uh, uh, mm, to, to to introduce the concept of reflection. The concept reflection. of reflection mm. is not only a multiplication of images and something the mirror also in art is a, is an element which takes the observer into an a, a, the world of imagination so it's like the door to another world not the world also, yeah. also mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. this is this is common this is already already used this is already mm -hmm. understood so but the yeah. concept I wanted to bring in jewelry was reflection as an activity of thinking. So please look at jewelry yeah. thinking about how how it it, it, mm -hmm. it is done, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how it wants to uh, represent and we, not... we look at the next the next slides. We've got a few, yeah, just some more. Yeah, these 
these so, mirrored things yeah the mirror mm -hmm. so in this mm -hmm. case the mirror is a is a is, a, is the nest of, of of this very expensive stone which is a paraiba tourmaline you know that the paraiba is one of the most expensive stone actually and um, uh, so it it multiplies and uh, it creates a, a sort of kaleidoscopic you know uh, image and uh, but so whoever in uh, in his childhood has been fascinated by the kaleidoscope so uh, this is another way to uh, bring back you know the observer to uh, his childhood so so again uh, playing with the memory and uh, uh, bringing you know uh, making the observer accepting the piece as mm -hmm. uh, something comfortable so yeah. uh, in a few words, I like it because it makes yeah. me remind something familiar. And, and the next, the next slide, please. Sorry, I just want to get through these. It's wonderful. But also, I love the idea with the mirrored surfaces that um, that it's a bit almost uh, confusing, intriguing. You know, you, the, the reflection as well makes people think: What am I really looking at? Is it the reflection of the stone? Is yeah. it another stone? Yeah. You know, I, I love that. I it love that. When the, uh, when the image is when the image is not kept by the brain immediately, mm -hmm. so and the brain has to work, uh, you know, to understand better yeah. what it, mm -hmm. so it, it, mm -hmm. it there is more attention, mm -hmm. and also this yeah. is a this is a way to create more attention on the piece. Yeah, yeah, and draw the, to the draw in draw the view in. Yeah, and this um, and here in this, I just yeah, magnificent this is bracelet. A very simple, yeah. a very simple bracelet uh, where still again I see the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, a chain. So mm -hmm. uh, in a very in a very simple you know uh, mm -hmm. version, but mm -hmm. uh, there is the strength of a chain, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a very successful piece. I have to mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's wonderful, well, wonderful. Yeah, tourmalines. And and the next slide, please, because I think now we're gonna we're gonna move on to some of your latest uh, creations because we've we've talked through. Um, charting the exploration of materials and techniques and symbols. So maybe you can talk us through some of your your latest creations. Now, 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 now I'm working on 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 uh, on a different use of of the, of, the, of the metals. I'm mm -hmm. trying to uh, master metals in a different way. So I'm working on 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 twisting the titanium, which is very hard. So I mean, twisting titanium is a way to 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 show how we can well, master, think, you know, I the think we have um, the next slide. I think it should be if we mm -hmm. got a note. It's and an, also this, in this, in this there is area, the twisting comes next. Yeah, uh, which are here. Yeah, there. Thank you, thank you. Here's the here's the twist off. Oh. And, uh, and I love here. these diamond the diamond Loud, earrings. Yeah. Sensational. Oh, there's the there's the wonderful twist, the spiral. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, there's something organic about it. Yeah, that striking a chord of familiarity. There is Beautiful. something mechanical. And the dynamism, the dynamism, the movement. Yeah, there is something mechanical, which, mm -hmm. which to me also is, uh, uh, can uh, can we say a drill? How to? No. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. It is. Yeah. Yeah, this is so, the, yeah, the head of a drill. Yeah, the head exactly. of a drill. So, uh, yes. I mean, anything. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing is more, mm -hmm. let's say, mechanical and masculine, mm -hmm. and evokes mm -hmm. strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, this drill goes to the heart of the of, mm -hmm. of our planet, and where you extract mm -hmm. water yeah. and uh, and gems. So mm -hmm. those drops are a symbol. That's wonderful. Symbol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, mm -hmm. But in order, in order to make precious, also this, this, this very, let's say, mechanical shape, which has been a nightmare to to construct. So let me tell you. <laughs> I'm sure. Also, the, all the edges are, are are enriched and set with uh, with diamonds in uh, navet mm -hmm. diamonds in order to create a movement and uh, yes. round diamonds. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, very, very, uh, very simple, but also very complicated. And mm -hmm. and I think uh, that I've I've been able to create something very feminine, uh, still mm -hmm. evoking something very hard, because mm -hmm. I mean uh, I imagine that the drills are made of the head of the drills are made of uh, the hardest metal ever, still, and uh, yeah. and uh, and these are something and also the the the, the um, this shape the spiral is another shape which connects earth to. Uh, to have yeah. yeah, 
No? So it's another yeah, yeah. symbol, it's another so way to, to say mm -hmm. please, mm -hmm. elevate, mm -hmm. jewelry mm -hmm. from something mm -hmm. on the earth to something much yeah. more, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. conceptual and sacred mm -hmm. also. I think are these is this the last the last slide, I think. Uh, no, we have more, yeah, more spirals, more spiral. Yeah. And uh, and still uh, we have mm -hmm. we have the, the we have this torsion of metal because torsion is also an element which uh, makes the pieces alive. So when you mm -hmm. see when you see a sculpture uh, and and the torsion of the body makes the, that material the marble alive. Now you see that the yeah. tension, the torsion, the tension is what mm -hmm. makes a painting, what makes a sculpture alive. So uh, uh, applying the torsion to the to the most, uh, to the hardest material we use in jewelry, and uh, which yeah. is now, which is now accepted. Titanium is, is now accepted, but you can see how I, I'm not coloring it. So I'm not using titanium mm -hmm. the same way, mm -hmm. everyone. So it's a new way. Yeah. It's another challenge. So polished yeah. or brushed, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, um, so the to mm -hmm. the torsion is the very newest concept I'm I'm, yeah. I'm exploring at the moment. Yeah, so it's wonderful. And um, just just to close, um, I want to ask you: so, what's next, Fabio? What's a, what's your ultimate aim or ambition? I, Before we take some questions, uh, I'm, I'm 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 observing. I'm I'm still in uh, observing. I took this uh, pandemic uh, 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 like a moment to observe myself because I mean, recently in the last few years, the expansion of my of my business. Uh, let's say um, took me away from creativity a little bit because of course you have to I, I was really uh, dedicated to uh, you know explore uh, explore London and uh, opening a studio uh, participating to shows and now I want to, I want to find back in myself like a vein of creativity and I'm mm -hmm. sure I also leaving my emotions I've been like everybody. I've been, you know, of course, uh, shocked by, by by this last year. So I'm I'm mm, I'm leaving this emotion, and I I'm sure that from whatever I'm, I'm observing and living at the moment, there is something very strong which is coming out. Good. Oh, we we can't wait. <laughs> can't wait to see. And I think we've just left a few minutes, haven't we, Alex? If if there are any any questions. Um, yeah, we have a couple yeah. of questions. Let me just pull okay. some up here for you. So I'm very okay. conscious of your strict, your timetable. <laughs> um, <laughs> superb efficiency of New York Jewelry Week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so an action-packed schedule as always. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Lindy. I'm going to pop it up on the screen here, uh, asking about the fabrication of the carbon fiber. I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a broad question about that process, perhaps, yeah. for everyone listening. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite complicated because we start from fibers, real fibers, which are like hair. So we uh, have to create a mold and roll the fibers in example for a piece like this we roll the fiber around around the mold and then we we make them uh, um, solid through um, the addition of uh, uh, of resins and then we we try not to sculpt it too much because it's so hard it becomes so hard and so resistant that it's very hard to to work and so there are different uh, ways to um, to construct the pieces, but everything is handmade, and it's also also um, uh, uh, respectful for environment because it comes from uh, graphite. So carbon fiber is a natural element, uh, and there is no waste. Uh, there is no uh, you don't use acid. You don't use uh, so there is no um, uh, let's say no pollution in a way. Uh, in this, but anyhow, it's not a big industry. It's just a, a, a little production, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's sustainable, and uh, which is very important at the moment. No, no one. Yeah. The impact you have you have on the on the environment is very important. Yeah, fast. It's such a fascinating material. It's so playing mm -hmm. with your perception of you know what you yeah. 
understand when you see something like that and just it's so um such an amazing technique i love the mm -hmm. kind of technology component mm -hmm. of your work yeah um, we have another question for you and i'm going to broaden this a little bit too uh from ama do you <laughs> like boccioni and futurism and maybe this is a border question about your influences <laughs> overall well, you know futurism is a source of inspiration a great source of, of inspiration and uh uh, but you know, I've been I've been so lucky because I I mean I was born in in, in a country where art uh, is uh, is predominant wherever you look at. Sometimes I remember, for example, the very beginning of my career, I watched as uh, at the uh, details of the um, uh, station in Milan, and I was mm -hmm. and I I found an, an element that that uh, was. Um, I think that was was the feature of my very first uh, uh, production. So you see, you you can get inspiration from everything you is mm -hmm. around you, and Italy is a source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Even the colors, even a sunset on the on the yeah. domes uh, yeah. uh, of Rome, or mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. make you make you something that you can translate into 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 colors into shapes into into happiness into uh, many different things and in in, in, uh, in jewelry mm -hmm. yeah I love that. Um, so we're gonna have to wrap things up. I just wanna say thank you, Vivian, and thank you, Fabio, thank for you. sharing this amazing presentation uh, on day three of Jewelry Week. I just wanna highlight something that you said also, Fabio, which was, I keep the preciousness for myself. I think that's like the quote of Jewelry Week so far. I just think it's such an amazing way to kind of, to think about not just your work, but more broadly, mm -hmm you know, the way that we can kind of interpret jewelry and its preciousness, not just through mm -hmm. materiality or through form or through value, but through mm -hmm. like what it brings to us, which really is very like in sync with our theme this year of the power of jewelry. So I'm really yeah. excited by that. Um, thank you yeah, both. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, folks, we thank are you. about to head thank into you. a break. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye, bye, bye everyone. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Fabio. <laughs> Bye. Okay, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that fantastic presentation uh, from these two wonderful presenters. I really love this sort of playing with perception of material and even color through the use of uh, these really unique uh, kind of applications of color and titanium as well as these uh, material plays. So I hope that's got your uh, wheels turning. We're about to head into a break. So we'll be back here in 30 minutes at one o'clock uh, for the Brazilian modernism of Roberto Belmox. So stay tuned, stretch your legs, and we'll see you back here real soon.
Okay, folks, we are back here again for our third program of the day today. Uh, I'm very excited to cue this next one up. Just a little bit of housekeeping for those folks who might be joining us uh, on demand. So if you're watching the live stream, um, but you're not watching it live, you're kind of joining us a little bit later, just to note that uh, the Q&A is only happening during the live scheduled portion. I noticed a couple of you had some questions a little bit after we ended the last program, so apologies that we didn't get to those, um, but just keep in mind the scheduled times if you want to join in on the Q&A. Um, so I am going to announce our next program uh, coming up. Uh, so the next program is the Brazilian Modernism of Roberto Bell Marx, and this is going to be a pre-recorded conversation between Manaz Ispelani Batos, who is the founder and CEO of Manaz Collection, and a big thank you to Manaz Collection, who is one of our many fabulous sponsors this year and has been a supporter of New York City Jewelry Week for a number of years, so thank you to Manaz Collection. Uh, and Manaz is going to be in dialogue with Isabella de Cavallo Ono, who is the executive Executive Director of the Belmarx Institute in Rio, Brazil. And they're going to be discussing post-World War II Brazilian jeweler Roberto Belmarx, his landscapes, and his jewelry. Um, so as it's a pre-recorded conversation, there will not be a Q&A. However, it will be available on our YouTube channel throughout Jewelry Week in addition to this live screening. So I'm going to play this for you now. Please enjoy, and we will see you back here very soon. Welcome uh, to this um, Zoom session on the Brazilian modernism of Roberto Berlimarx. This is a session about a work in progress, a catalog that has been uh, about six years uh, in the works and an exhibition on the jewelry of the Burley Marx brothers from Brazil, Roberto Burley Marx and Harold Burley Marx. Um, I am Manaz uh, Ispahani Bartos from Manaz Collection in New York. And my colleague Isabella Ono is the executive director of the Burley Marx Institute in Rio, and she's also the executive director of the Burley Marx Landscape Design in Studio. So she brings an enormous amount of expertise uh, to this panel as well. Um, both Isabella and I are, con are contributors to the catalog, along with several others. Today, however, we are going to concentrate on only one Burley Marx brother. Um, many people who know a little bit about this family may remember the Time magazine quote in 1965, where um, they were called the most amazing and talented brother act in Brazil. Um, perhaps the most talented in fact, certainly the most gifted of all the brothers was the person we're going to talk about today, uh, Roberto Berlin Marx. And we'd like to try to give you a sense of who he was, what his place is in the global lexicon of landscape architecture, and importantly for us, in relation to the design of jewelry. Um, he was many other things, and Isabella will uh, refer to them, but in the short time we have allotted to us, uh, these are the two areas that I think we will cover, and um, you'll see why as the uh, PowerPoint presentation unfolds. I'll start off by saying that, please change the... I'll start off by saying that ever since I bought, here's a, a, a wonderful image of, of Roberto, one of my favorites um, with these folk figures that he collected. Um, you can change the image. And Isabella put together this wonderful collage of all the different metiers in which he was involved. Um, and you get a sense of them here. 
But if you go to the next slide, you'll see a ring very much uh, like my first ring that I purchased um, about 10 years ago, a Berlin Marx ring. And it made me um, an absolute devotee of this, this work. I found it um, an astonishing mix of um, some sort of ancient, some reference to an ancient time with um, a very modern moment. It had, uh, it was completely original given that it was made 70 years ago uh, at a time when people were wearing delicate diamonds uh, placed in platinum or white gold um, embraces. And, and I looked at this ring and I thought, you know, and there was this astonishing uh, Brazilian aquamarine that was cut in, in a way I had not then seen a stone cut. So it led me, this ring, down what you might almost call a rabbit hole, but it led me to really on a quest um, to search out all the best uh, Berlin Marx jewelry that I could uh, literally lay my hands on, handle, uh, wear, feel on the collarbone, get a sense of how it gripped the wrist, um, recognize that each piece was handmade, um, each piece was unique, um, that the design uh, of these pieces was something that I had not seen anywhere else, and I had not seen imitated. Um, these were very unique and special pieces. Um, I tried, I started to read, reach out to the families. Um, basically, uh, Manas collection became sort of um, the, the central place where we handled, I think, more Burley Marx jewelry than almost anyone. I can think of, um, certainly in the United States. Um, Roberto's work in jewelry was very much tied to his work in other fields. And as I started to study these other areas and get to know people like Isabella, who really knows this material and others, I really saw the connections in the design world between his work in various genres. Um, there was such a clear um, symbiosis, such a clear relationship between uh, his drawings uh, in textiles, his drawings of jewelry, his the way he designed. He was an artist who made jewelry. And that's something I hope you will really take away from this uh, session uh, because it's a very important point. We speak about all these great artists who made jewelry, people's names who are most commonly mentioned, the French, uh, Picasso and Brock and Max Ernst, et cetera. And, the Italian jewelers, Afro and Canela and others. But Burley Marx was um, a genius unto himself. He was an artist who made jewelry of the most extraordinary kind. And it completely related to his overall body of work. This jewelry was manufactured in the workshop of his brother, younger brother, Haroldo Berlin Marx, who also retailed the jewelry. Um, so I would say that, you know, this image is something I, I hope you will keep in mind because even though the collaboration between the brothers and the fact that Roberto was a very prolific person in many fields for many years. 
He only spent maybe 10 years designing jewelry. He had a profound impact on this brand called Burley Marx Jewelry, which continued uh, far uh, longer than his involvement with it. Um, so at Manas Collection, you know, we pride ourselves not only being a, a selling gallery, but on building knowledge about important makers who may not have been given necessarily their uh the time and the sun that they deserve and we have felt that Berlin Marx Roberto we call him Berlin Marx but Roberto Berlin Marx certainly deserves uh uh his time in the sun as a jewelry artist an artist who made jewelry this is a a piece of his that's in the art institute of Chicago which I particularly love and brings to mind so many pieces of jewelry in our collection. Um, did we change it? Um, there's one, one sort of last thing that I want to say about the jewelry. Um, and then I would like to hand it over to Isabella, which is, you're probably wondering who are these guys? And what do they have to do with the jewelry? Um, so on your left, I think, is Hans Stern. And on your right is Alexander, um, Alexander's? Amsterdam Sauer, I'm sorry. Um, and, and this, they were part of a group that came to Brazil early, um, and became involved in the discovery of uh, Brazil's gemstones, um, started getting involved with mining and looking for uh, quality gems in Brazil itself, and a mine for aquamarines and many other stones. Amsterdam Sao claims to have uh, discovered the first emerald, and I believe the GIA accepts that um, that corroboration because before that they did not accept that these were emeralds from Brazil. Um, but Brazil has an enormous bounty of gemstones, and if you just go over the list, I started to put them down: uh, aquamarines, emeralds. Imperial topaz, uh, paraiba tourmaline, tourmalines, amethysts, aventurine, beryl of all kinds, carnelian, chalcedony, citrine, the list goes on. Why is this important? Um, it's important in the context of what we're speaking of today because just as uh, Berlin, Roberto Berlin Marx tried to banish roses and begonias and all these sort of European flowers from the flower beds of the Brazilian elite and replace them with native plants and flora. So he went to natural stones from Brazil and used those they decided to use those stones in their jewelry. You don't see diamonds until very late work by Haroldo Berlin Marx, but you never see diamonds in their work. Perhaps it was, you know, a, a client might have commissioned a piece by them, which they might have grudgingly made. But really what they wanted to show was the beauty of Brazil's own natural materials. So I'm going to stop there and say, you know, recently in, in this uh, climate, which has been very difficult in Brazil, um, like here and elsewhere in the world, um, there was a wonderful moment, which I know um, you celebrated, Isabella, um, the city of Berlin Marx, which was his home for a, a long time, Roberto's home, was made a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. 
And that is a very rare honor, especially for a personal, uh, personal sort of home based site. Um, and I'm sure Isabella can tell us a lot more about it, but it gives you a sense of Roberto's place in Brazil. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and take us into his work as a landscape architect, as an extraordinary contributor to public life in Brazil? Yes, we can, we can talk a little. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Isabella Ono. I'm a landscape architect from Brazil. So sorry for my English if it's not too OK, but let's continue. Burle Marx was a, an amazing person, a very like a true visionary person. He was, as Mahana said, a multidisciplinary, a multiple artist. So he do uh, jewelry design. He did a, a he was a painter. He was a bot botanist, and he was very well known for as a landscape designer. He works uh, as a landscape as a form of art. So here is a drawing, a sketch for Flamengo's Park. And in the right uh, is the Copacabana Avenue that I will talk later. So we can do, we can go in for the other slide. So just to talk a little, he started uh, to design gardens in the 30s, uh, third in 1930. And one of the first projects was in Recife in the Northeast of Brazil, where he started to use native plants. So he was like a environmentalist. So he started to study native plants and bring it to the, uh, for the urban area. Uh, this is the first drawings for this garden and then how it is today. So he, he see as Mahanas uh, was talking a little that he loves to use the, the Brazilian stones he, I think he was a really a Brazilian person because he loves to use it. He, he was very proud of all the, the flora of Brazil. And for that, he was like a precursor of the teams of preservation and sustainability in Brazil. He, start, he started to talk about this in the 50s and in, in talking the newspaper and to, to value all the, the native plants that we have in Brazil. And he was very proud of it. So he did a lot of excursions uh, in all, all around Brazil. Here are some pictures. And he went to do a lot of lectures to talk about uh, how, how to preserve the, our, our native plants and to criticize the devastation of, of all the, the, the biomas especially in Brazil. So since in the 60s, 70s, he's, he already talked about that. So uh, this is very impressive to hear this. And uh, that we have still have the same problems of uh, take care of our biomas. So we can uh, go to another slide. And Haruyoshi was my father. He was uh, his creative partner for 30 years. So one, uh, one thing that is very important, Burle Max always worked with a group of persons, botanists, gardeners, partners, like a landscape architect. So he do like a, a collective of working together with a lot of collaborators. So it's very important to say that all the productions of the, his gardens, his landscape uh, design was made for a group, for a team. And Haruyosh was the longer uh, partner that stay with with him working with he, him as his uh, right hand I, I think we can say that and uh, he was he used to say Burle Marx used to say that he was uh, a son that he never had so uh, and it's funny because Burle Marx I, I knew him when I was born my father was already his partner and it was very funny because Burle Marx is very uh, in, intense person, very strong, very, it's a, his, he was a really an artist. And Haruyoshi is a Japanese, very controlled, very, but very focused in what he did. So they respect, it, uh, respect each other. And it was a beautiful length, uh, partnership when they worked together. And Burle Max left the, the, his studio, studio for Haruyoshi continue to, to, de to develop new gardens. 
and to take care of all his archives. So it's very nice, very beautiful, the, the story. And so I, I can say that he was a uh, uh, central person in the preservation of all this legacy, because when Burle Marx pass, passed away, he continued to promote the name of Burle Marx. He opened the studio for, for publications, for researchers, for exhibitions. So he helped in almost all, all actions to promote the, the, the Roberto's legacy. So he was involved in the exhibition of a Jewish museum in the MoMA. And so and he continues until 2017 when Haruyoshi passed away. So. And in, when he passed away, we, started, we already started to talk with Haru about uh, what we're going to do uh, to preserve all the archives, because we have almost 120 thousands of items in the in the archive and it's a private archive because it's the the studio uh, is still open still doing a landscape project me and my partner uh, and uh, we just we we are just wondering what we're gonna do there's a lot of researchers there is a lot of things to do with all this historical material and we have to preserve but we don't know how to do that so uh, we can say that the the we, we started to think about the institute and to to it's a, a non-profit organization in brazil so we opened it in 2019 uh, and then it's the the purpose of the institute is first to preserve all this material we have like a rich collections uh, not only the landscape project that is 2000 projects landscape project and that have more or less 20,000 uh, 20, items, drawings, sketches. And of course, there is the documents, the photos, and all this historical material, the clip, clippings of news, historical newspaper. So we decided to create the Institute to perpetuate all this living art of Burle Marx. Here we can see just to, to approach from the, the jewelry uh, team. Uh, this is a drawing from 1940s, more or less, the Ministry of Education and Health. It's a garden drawing, but it's almost like an art drawing. It's very beautiful. It belongs to our collection. And it's, we can see all these uh, shapes, the organic forms that we will see in, in others. Uh, or other places that he, he planted. So this is the garden as it is. Mahnaz, if you want to talk a little about B. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the Ministry of Education and Health. And the other slide. So you can say a little about the Julie. <laughs> Well, this is a very early, these are very early pieces. Um, I think this is 1956. Um, and he's ex still exploring these amoeba like shapes and forms. Um, they disappear later on <clears throat> in his work. But this is here with these cabochons. This is very early work and also re reflects, I think, the more organic phase in his landscape work, which was, I think, an early phase, the early phase of his work. Um, so this is all the garden that, uh, would you like to talk a little about this garden, Nahanas? No, oh, you can, talk about it. Okay, it's so okay. beautiful. It's yes, so beautiful, it's, I'm just looking at it. So it's nice to see this is a garden in Rio. It's in Petropolis, in Rio, in Rio de Janeiro. And it's one of the first challenge of Burle Marx because he designed for a friend, uh, Odette Monteiro is the name of uh, the lady. And it was in a valley. And it's all surrounded by the, the native uh, uh, forest of Atlantic forest, uh, Mata Atlantica. And so he decided to create like a big lake in the middle to reflect the, the, the landscape. 
and then he did a lot of organic shapes with color, texture, and volumes. So it's nice to see and to compare with other kind of arts that Burle Marx and his partner developed uh, in these years, because you can see the shape that he can not, re but he can reflect in the jewelry. You can see the geometric that you can see in the more mural. So it's nice to 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 do like a parallel. It's the same person that was thinking in uh, in how to. to how to design? He, he, he's an, he was an artist. So, and this is the drawing of this garden. So it's very clear the shapes and the organics, uh, and the color. He's and of still course, doing these amoeba shapes. Uh, and of course, there is in two dimension when he when we draw like a landscape, we draw a, a garden. It's a, only in one. Uh, two dimension, but of course we are thinking in three, three, three dimensions. So we have the volume, we have the shadow, we have the light, we have the wind. So it's nice to understand. And when you have a, a, a piece uh, like a, a jewelry, you can also see the volume, the shade, the light. So it's nice to compare these. This is another garden from Cavanelles, the architecture was designed by Oscar Niemeyer. Uh, they have the same uh, challenge. It's in the valley also, and the architecture was perfect because only like, uh, uh, I think like that, it's beautiful. And in this garden, Burle Marx decided to do like organic uh, shape in front of the garden, very free form. And in the back, he decided to do like a very geometric a garden in like a chess using two colors of grass so it's nice to see how the artists provoke the the sensation in the garden in two different ways so in a, a in a other time so they use the color the volume the the shadow the light to do that it's an amazing project are we missing a piece here We might be missing a second piece here, but this this uh, we have two pieces in this set with these very enormous watermelon tourmalines, and um, they very much give you a feeling of the the gardens we just saw. You know, in fact, they almost the cut of this stone almost mimics that last garden that we just saw. Um, but we seem to have lost yeah. one of the images. No, it's, it's interesting to see how they cut the, the stone and to do like a like, all, like a, a sculpture in the stone. It's more or less the same that what Burle Marx uh, intention when he did a, a garden with the shapes of the topography. So it's very nice in the jewelry, this volume in the stone. And I think it's not usual. So it's very unusual. Yeah. So Situ, as you told, we are very proud of uh, the title that Situ received because Burle Marx, when he was alive, he donated the Situ, the place where he used to live, the place where he had uh, all the plants collection. So the, like his his jewelry is the oh, in in Situ. So he was very generous to donate this for for the others because he became. Pub, a public space when he donated the place and to receive the title it's very important for to, to be recognized not in brazil but around the world it's a, a, a unesco title so it, we are very proud and city was the place where he he, he continued to have all this plant uh, collections and he's like today it's like a museum that you can visit it's more or less as he left the, the his house his nurse nurseries and everything was there so it's a very interesting place to visit is he buried there also no no he was buried close to there in a cemetery okay. and the and Sitchu was the place where Bole Marx used to take all these plants to, to, where he took the plants from the native uh, biomas 
and try to experiment there in situ to observe to see how they they grow uh, it's more or less like his laboratory so it's a very interesting where he did all the experience to put in the garden so And we can see this mural here in, in granite, in stones. Uh, he used the facade of an old building in Rio that was uh, des destroyed and put this like an artwork. So all the time we can see the volume, we can see the geometry, we can see the, the empty and closed places with volumes, and we can see the, the, the sh shadow, the light. So everything we can see in the, in the jewelry, his jewelry work too, like a bracelet. Yes, that's it. <laughs> so it's the same. So the, the bracelet. Yep. No, you can say you, it's, you're better. This, this bracelet is very much reflective of several of his murals. I think this one, and then we'll see some coming up where you see the bracelets. Um, this is uh, UNESCO. Yes, this project was uh, the, the patio, patios uh, in UNESCO in Paris. So uh, the, he used this geometry to construct the place where the plant's going to stay. And there is this color, each color in the left side. Uh, it's one kind of plant, one kind of volume. In the blue part is uh, water. So he combines plants with co different colors, textures from the stone, from the, the pavement, in the water. So, and, and again, the geometry, very uh, or orthogonal geometry. Mm -hmm. And then look at that. So it's almost as if you can pluck that out of that. Can you go back one just to just show it together? You know, you just see the the shapes. And in this, uh, Julie, you can see also the texture in the gold because it's not flat. There is a texture. It's the same that he used to do in the gardens with the pavement, with a grass. Or so. It's nice to see it's the same art, artist so <laughs> and this is a garden for a farm so you like this guy this drawing <laughs> i love this drawing i asked especially for it to be put in here and today yeah. i was working in the archive and i found a, a picture an image of this garden and it was very nice because it's Roberto and his friend, that is uh, Clemente Gomes, like this together and only <laughs> like a very close friend. And in this garden, that when they are building this, because this farm we used to be a coffee farm. It's an old, an ancient uh, farm, and there is like a patterns where he put the, the coffee to dry. And there is a lot of water to clean the, the coffee. It's a coffee farm. So uh, they preserve this, this, these stairs and then use the water that is already there in the place and design all the geometric garden using plants and using uh, water again. So it's a very beautiful garden. I know this is a topic for another conversation, but I am very interested to learn more about how involved he was with water because there's always some work with water in all many of his gardens where he really uses water as an integral part of his design yes he normally because it's not the landscape for us that learn with him was not only plants so it's uh we combine plants with water with air yeah. with the space with stones but uh, everything that is on in the site so it's interesting because since the beginning he, he was already thinking in sustainability so we use all the things that is already have in the site so it's very sustainable very, uh, 
very intelligent to use that. So yeah. it's the reason that we use water, that is wonderful to use water in the garden to reflect the landscape, to the, the space was very more comfortable because the water, the sound is nice. Uh, but the, the really important thing that it's already have water in the place. It's not artificial. So. Right, right. Mm -hmm. This is a panel in Sao Paulo. So having seen the previous images, I think there's not too much to say except just to pause for a moment and reflect on um, the way in which these pieces um, just seem pulled out of those landscapes and vice versa. The brooch is, is particularly, uh, to me, resonant of the landscapes. Um, so it's nice and, to compare. And of, the, and of the UNESCO project. It's, it's nice to call, it's, Mahanaz, it's nice to compare that he can do like a mural that you you we saw in the last slide and he can do a small uh, object very delicate but using the same principles so it's nice to see it it's not the same thing when you you design a a, a mural it's one thing have another uh, scale have another purpose but it's nice to see that it's the same person that was thinking in how how creative he can do doing different things so you're right, and working at a small scale and a large scale are very different talents and very mm -hmm. diff different skills are involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you corrected me when I said this was a kind of landscape, but this is a hardscape. This is one of his most beautiful, magical spaces. Can you say, tell us a little about Yes, Copacabana. this is the, the the most important avenue in Copacabana Beach. It's called Avenida Atlântica, and it was designed in 90, 1970. And it was an amazing project because it takes uh, five kilometers of drawing, a pavement drawing. There is no, uh, it's everything was a unique a unique drawing so it's like a, an no artistic repeat. no repeat it's an artistic panel for five kilometers and it's the place where people can walk people can rest because there is there is places to see it there is of course uh, there is of course trees and shadow so it's a very amazing and it's very beautiful to see from the top so I remember when I when I was a, a little kid, we we used to walk only in the stones, in white stones, and then we jump for the black stones, and then we jump for the red stones. So it's a, like a playground for us too. <laughs> That's an early bracelet. Again, um, it reminded us of. Could you go back one slide? Just reminded us again of some of the drawing um, on uh, the Copacabana. Another great early necklace, again, giving us a feel for, for that place. So here we have um, three of the four brothers, Berlin Ox, um, and um, you have Haroldo looking at a piece of jewelry on uh, my right. And uh, you have Roberto on my left with um, his brother Walter, his older brother. And um, I just put these photographs up because 
Um, there's a brother missing here, but I put these photographs up because um, all three of these brothers had an American, um, had an involvement with, with the United States. <clears throat> Haroldo's was much later in life and on his own, in his 80s actually. Um, and, and this relationship was a very loving relationship, uh, which actually between uh, Roberto and Walter, and it brought Roberto to the States quite a lot um, on personal visits, sometimes to see an eye doctor um, for all sorts of different reasons. But uh, these two brothers really uh, cared for each other. And um, Walter was a great musician and chose to live his entire life actually in the US. So Roberto had a lot of reason to go there, but he never had any interest in living there. Um, it's odd, though, that given how often he was there and that he lectured at universities and received major awards, including uh, from the American Institute of Architects in 1965, others um, that he wasn't uh, better known in the states um, and we really hope that all the work we do um, really brings to the fore the reputation of this man who who was truly a great contributor not only to the arts but also the sciences and in this very perilous time of um, in, you know, environmental degradation and need for sustainable practices. Um, um, we, need, we need our heroes uh, from the past and heroines. Um, so I wanted, um, with Isabella's permission, to say just a few words about um, actually what's optimistic and exciting about what's happening in the US um, around Roberto. Um, he, this, um, for all my dealer friends out there, my colleagues in Miami, who are there a lot, and all my Miami friends, this is in your city. Uh, this is Biscayne Boulevard. It was started in 1988. And for many reasons, and many fits and starts, there was some sort of conclusion in 2020. It is easier to see the whole of it from the air. But this piece of work uh, by Berlin Marx is right there in your city. So please, if you have a chance, um, go take a look at it and take a look at the drawings and think about the, the Berlin Marx jewelry that you've handled um, and uh, the cabochons that sit atop some of the jewels. Um, it's a very, very beautiful moment in, in um, in Miami. Um, this is um, uh, an image from uh, a very important exhibition that was done at MoMA in 1991. Um, and it was important for several reasons. It's very hard to do an exhibition of landscape architecture because by its nature, um, you can only show images rather than the real thing. But uh, MoMA did do a single person show of Berlin Marx's work in 1991, way too late from my perspective, but there was a major show uh, with an important catalog. Um, after this show, there was sort of a silence for quite some years till this major show at the Jewish Museum in 2016, which really showed 
uh, the real range of Berlin Marx's work and where I had the privilege of shaking hands with uh, Isabella's father, um, which was really a moment. Uh, and this, this is a necklace uh, from my personal collection that the uh, museum borrowed um, to show Roberto's jewelry designs in that um, museum show. And that show had a very important impact. Uh, this this uh, textile I find quite overwhelming in its it's absolutely stunning. Do you want to say something about it, Isabella? I remember that I visit the this tapestry in the place where it is now uh, in Santa Andre, and they, they decided to restore the, this tapestry. So my father worked in this restoration. So it was very, uh, he was very proud to, to see this tapestry in New York. So because it was like a, a, a huge mo mo movement to bring this artwork for New York. So it's Second. amazing. And we, we have in our archive the five uh, studies of this, this tapestry, because it's, uh, it was decided to do, Bohle Max tried to do other, uh, other uh, colors. So he was just in process thinking what he, he will do. And we have these five studies. So it's, it's very beautiful oh, it's, piece. It's, yeah. it's a magnificent piece. Um, and if you don't haven't had the chance to see it, um, the catalog is probably still available. It's worth buying just to have a chance to look at all the beautiful work uh, that was shown at this collection. And many of these pieces uh, are in the collection of the Institute of Berlin Marx. Um, but this show um, was paralleled in a very small way, but by a show we did at roughly the same time on the jewelry, uh, just the jewelry of uh, the Berlin Marx brothers. And we, uh, you know, we felt that we had, didn't have a catalog. We normally always do a show with the catalog, but we were so excited. Uh, we had already collected quite a significant amount of jewelry. Um, we were able to acquire jewelry drawings. Uh, we were lucky to have Wright uh, and Richard Wright as a partner. Uh, he's in, they're an extraordinary uh, auction house out of Chicago and they had a beautiful space in the Gagosian building on Madison Avenue and they, gave us this space and our uh, 20th century uh, brought in this astonishing Brazilian furniture and wood sculptures. And it was really a very, very um, exciting and enthusiastically received uh, uh, ex exhibit. You know, we, we didn't know how it would be received, but it um, it was very well received, and um, that photograph is of uh, Haroldo's daughter Sonia Burley Marx, and she is wearing a pin made by her uncle uh, Roberto. Um, I think we have one or two more images from this. Um, this is just a, one of the jewelry drawings that we own, I believe. Yeah, this is one of ours. Look, I mean, the, the quality of, of Roberto's drawings is, is um, it's, they're almost as exquisite as the necklaces, although you'd rather have the necklace. And here are a few examples. Uh, I'm wearing these earrings, which of course, also reflect that wall at the sitio. Um, and um, you see some of the pieces that were in the show. 
Um, you can go on. The Jewish Museum show, I think, had such an impact that then the New York Botanical Gardens decided to do this astonishing show with uh, another protege of or um, follower of Roberto's um, a landscape architect in Miami called Raymond Jungles, who helped design this. And again, Isabella was involved in this project. And it was held in 2019, where the entire the, the New York Botanical Gardens was transformed this part of it into sort of a living tribute to Roberto Burley Marx. Is there something you might add to that, Isabella? Yes, the exhibition was very great. And Raymond used to be a very clo close friend of Burle Marx, uh, as a disciple of Burle Marx in, in in US. So he he did a tribute to Burle Marx in this this uh, square that he designed, uh, and very beautiful because he he used he brought some plants from Miami, and there is some plants that have the name of. Burle Marx. So uh, it's funny to see tropical plants in New York and to see some plants with the name of Burle Marx. And all the exhibition was very uh, well received. Very people loved the the, the, the exhibition, and uh, we participated in the first symposium in the beginning. And in the end, I was invited to do the uh, uh, symposium in NYU. So it's we are very proud of all the the all the action and this growing significance of Berlin Marx's work in the states the growing importance there was a plethora of articles and essays and uh, books are now coming out on his work um, but the last um, little gem of news was that um, the Longwood Gardens in uh, Pennsylvania, one of the most important uh, gardens, uh, you know, as a whole that we have on the East Coast is undergoing a major res renovation. And within that garden is a an exquisite um, a gem of a, a, a repository of about 200 native Brazilian plants that uh, Burle Marx had, had uh, brought there and created uh, a small uh, protected site for, and it had been quite neglected. But I think after the Botanical Gardens did their show, uh, the Longwood Gardens decided that they were going to spend six or seven million dollars to now completely renovate and um, uh, show that work. So our, our catalog is nearing completion. I hope it'll be ready in the beginning of next year, along with an exhibition of um, the jewelry we have, because we never stop collecting it. We cannot resist it. And um, we also, cannot stop writing this catalog because we meet one more interesting person after another uh, with more news and information um, and stories to tell that we feel should be included. But I think uh, one day we are going to stop and the catalog will come out. But it is a work of, of passion and commitment and I hope it will, it will also make a small contribution to the overall story of of Burle Marx, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Isabella to have the last word. Thank you. So, uh, as we are talking in the beginning, the Institute collection have a lot of uh, objects. So, the drawing, the original drawings, the sketches, the photographs, uh, the painting plans, documents, letter, and historical uh, material. And in October 30, we are open our first exhibition. That's gonna be can the next slide, please. The first exhibition 
of the the unpublished uh, material drawings and in the classic projects the of our collection and it will be at uh, Roberto Marinho's house and the garden was also made by Burle Marx in the 50s so it's nice to have a beautiful private house that now it became an institute and then we have all this uh, unpublished material so it's going to be uh, a challenge because it will be the first public action of the institute and a great opportunity to enlarge the knowledge of Burle Marx and his partner history so we have an enormous legacy as you can see a lot of work to do we have just set up out our institute so we are joining uh, efforts to preserve all these unique collections and to develop future uh, cultural and educational actions that can celebrate all these contributions. So if you want to know more about our institute, you can visit or to participate, you can visit our website and the website of Brazil Foundation. That is a we have a partnership with them. Thank you. And we there is a beautiful um there is a beautiful yeah. phrase of uh, speech of Burle Marx that I want to leave for us. Can you read that? Yes, it's a true that art of gardening did not begin with me, nor will end with me. But I believe that my experience can be useful to those who will come after me. It's like a generosity that he left for us when he donated the seed to, when he preserved uh, all the, the material in his archive when others, uh, partners, and worked together to preserve all this material and to put it together. And now we are doing the same in this, the Institute. So we have all this generosity that he thought he, he, he teach for us, he taught for us. Thank you. Thank you too for in the invitation. There is our website here so and please be in touch with isabella with any questions you have about the instituto or about the discussion we just had um or us about the jewelry thank you very much thank you bye-bye okay what a fantastic overview of such an amazing and diverse uh, legacy of Roberto Bole Marx. Um, thank you to Manaz and also thank you to Isabella for that amazing presentation. Um, as I have told you many times already today, we have an action packed day for you. So I am going to actually bring some pre special guests up before I announce our next program. I'm going to welcome to the stage Jewelry Week co founders, JB and Bella. Hi, you're on mute, guys. <laughs> All right. <Hey. laughs> we figured it out. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how's it going, Alex? Oh, it's going great. Uh, welcome to uh, the live stream. This is your first appearance on the live stream on day three, but certainly not your first appearance at Jewelry Week day three. Because I know yeah. you've been running around everywhere doing fabulous things. How's it been out there in the wild? <laughs> it's been pretty incredible. Um, it feels really great. The energy is really wonderful. It's great to see people, you know, friends, new and old, who we haven't seen in almost like two years, I guess, yeah. in person, right? Like not behind the screen. The exhibitions are incredible. Um, we're actually at the Jewelry Library right now, um, and there are two fabulous exhibitions here that we hope everybody will come and see. Yeah. Amazing. Um, do you guys have anything you want to add for our upcoming program? I know that you spent a lot of time putting this together, so if you want to kick it off before I formally introduce things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're just so thrilled to be entering the watch arena with a partner like eBay. Um, it's really been a dream come true. Um, we've been wanting to do this for a couple of years, but we only wanted to do it the New York City jewelry way. And I feel, and JB and I have sort of talked about this so much, um, we feel that this conversation that's about to take place um, between Victoria Gamelski, Bryn Walner, and Cherith Kamdar is really uh, it's so wonderful and interesting and exciting. 
Um, so we are just thrilled to partner with this uh, uh, conversation with eBay. And yeah. we hope it's a great one. It will be. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, you're both looking fabulous and decked out. Uh, we hope to see you on the live stream more the rest of the week. Um, and I'm going to kick things off now. So say bye to JB and Bella, everyone. You'll see them around the place. Uh, if you're at the jewelry library right now, you can catch them. Um, OK, <laughs> it is very exciting. I'm going to kick off our next program now, which is Times Are Changing. Luxury Trends, Consumer Shifts, and the Power of Watches. eBay bringing watches to New York City Jewelry Week for the first time. Uh, this program and New York City Jewelry Week are also sponsored by eBay. So thank you so much for your continued support. Uh, so to kick this off, what is a luxury watch but functional jewelry? If you've ever been curious about adding a luxury timepiece to your collection, this is the conversation for you. You're, we are joined today by Victoria Gomelski, who is the editor-in-chief of JCK Magazine and the only journalist to ever have a watch named after her. Uh, Dimepiece.co founder and the watch world's newest tastemaker, Bryn Walner, and watch aficionado Tirath Gamda, who is the GM of luxury at eBay. Uh, we're super excited for this conversation. I'm going to welcome our panelists to the stage. Welcome, everyone. Hey, everyone. Hey. Oh, I'm missing one. Sorry, I added JB and Bella again. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to you, Victoria. Um, take it away. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much, and thanks to Bella and JB for for having us. It's really nice to finally be. I guess a part of Jewelry Week. I know you haven't had watches for well for all these years, so I think this is a great way to kick off uh, Jewelry Week's involvement with the industry. And hi, Bryn. Hi, Tara. Hey, how are you, Victoria? Hey, good, Bryn. good. Good to see you both. Um, we're here, of course, talking about luxury trends, consumer shifts, the power of watches. I can't think of two better people to address these issues with. Bryn, of course, uh, Alex mentioned the the watch world's newest taste tastemaker. Dimepiece.co focuses on the intersection of women, watches, pop culture. Got a lot of attention just in the, a short time that you've been up and, and writing about this. And of course, Tarath, you're a longtime industry veteran, watch aficionado, now GM of luxury at eBay. So lots of great insights and data I'm sure you have just at the top of your head. So let's kick off. Um, this has been, I mean, I think since the pandemic started, what we feared at the very beginning of you know, March 2020 was that nobody would care about watches. Who's going to buy a watch? The whole business is just, you know, the last thing anybody's going to be thinking about. And what we saw was, in fact, the very opposite, that watches just took on uh, the entire market from new watches to pre-owned, just sort of went on, you know, sort of burst into flames practically. So and that seems to have continued. Um, I think the, the conversation around pre-owned has especially taken off. And Tarath, because obviously you're at eBay and you're a specialist, I'd love you for you to talk a little bit about the cultural shift around pre-owned. It wasn't a, a thing we discussed 10, even five years ago. It was a, a, an afterthought, if anything. So what's happened in the last few years to, to make the pre-owned category so interesting, such a booming category? Yeah, no, that's it's it has been a fun category to watch, right? And especially pre-owned. Uh, I mean, everyone knows like, buying a brand new Rolex watch from a Rolex boutique is like driving a brand new BMW off the lot, right? The value will either increase or decrease. In the last couple of years, it's actually gone the increase um, uh, wave, especially if you, can you really even find anything at retail anymore when it comes to Rolex steel sports models, as an example. I think the big shift here has been one driven by scarcity, right? There has been scarcity. I think demand is starting to go. Uh, supply, again, has stayed similar from how many brand new watches could be produced. Of course, during the COVID time, certain manufacturers pulled back and certain ones are now pushing back forward. But also at the same time, we're, if you want to go get that amazing Rolex or AP or Patek, where, if you can't find it brand new at retail, you're going to find it at pre-owned, right? And you're going to get go to sites like eBay where the inventory is extremely vast. Next is a generational shift, right? You look at the Gen Zs and the millennials, right? We looked at some data, 23% of folks under the age of 25 are buying pre-owned. And at eBay, we see 75% of our inventory pre-owned and they want pre-owned. Why? 
it's more sustainable, it's eco-friendly, it stays recycling in the market, and you're able to kind of probably uphold its value, trade in, trade up, and keep refreshing your 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 collection. So there is a generational shift. I look at my father, right? He will he will always buy new cars, but I look at myself and my hopefully my child and younger generation, they're going to be okay with pre-owned. And lastly is a story. People want to buy into stories, and we're seeing the pre-owned has a lot of great stories from whether it's a vintage watch or a new timepiece. And we're finding that shift at, at eBay, right? I mean, we, 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 we've seen the major shift. We've seen double digit year on year growth in our luxury watch category. And, and that's a testament to hey, what's eBay doing that's different, but also the pre-owned market trend that exists out there. Absolutely. You had some great points. Thank you, Tarath. And Bryn, of course, you came from the auction world. That was your entree to watches. So I guess pre-owned or, or secondhand was something you were familiar with. But tell us about your take on this market. Is this how you've gotten mostly interested in the category is through pre-owned? Yeah, definitely. Because I came into this market as such a newbie and kind of an amateur. And like you said, um, my time at the auction house was my first foray into it. So pre-owned was really the only kind of segment that I considered personally. And to buy the thought of buying a new Rolex or whatever brand was completely out of the question for me just as a consumer. Um, and if I were to buy a luxury watch, I kind of knew it was always going to pre-owned. But as Tarath kind of identified, the younger generations like I mean, I'm not that young, <laughs> but um, I'm young. a millennial. <laughs> I think there's just so much kind of cachet um, in, like Tirath said, like the storytelling and pre-owned. It just feels kind of more special. And, you know, I really don't need something kind of shiny and out of the box. And I think I'm speaking kind of universally for, you know, my generation and especially younger. I have a I have a 21 year old cousin. She's a senior in college right now, and she refuses to buy anything new um, because I think that also what comes into play is sustainability and kind of looking out for the environment. Um, and yeah, I, th I think pre-owned has a lot of value for a lot of different reasons to a lot of people. Yeah, that circular economy conversation, which is just getting more and more prominent, of course, everybody mentions pre-owned as the most sustainable way to, to, to keep your interest in watches going. Um, other than that, any specific trends, and Bren, we'll stick to you for, for a minute here, any specific style design trends that you feel that have resonated with you this year or that you think that, you know, your followers are into anything specific? I mean, it's always fun to hear about what's trending. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I came at this with a really fresh eye. Which I think at first I was like, am I a poser? Am I, you know, do I have to, what do I have to read to kind of catch up? But I really listened to my intuition and what I was really drawn to. My first watch, I'm wearing it right now, is a Cartier Tank Francaise, mm -hmm. um, which I did buy new because I really wanted the red box in the bag. Um, the whole but <laughs> I, I've been noticing a lot of, um, like I'm not alone there and be being drawn to Cartier. And if you look specifically at the um, Geneva auctions that just went down, Cartier seems to be really kind of going through the roof in terms of demand. And more specifically, the Cartier crash is something that has seen mm -hmm. a major, major moment this past year. Um, and it's not just because it's an interesting piece, which of course it is, and it has an amazing story or legend or can anybody confirm what what really happened with the crash? Right. Um, Some London, I think, right? Wasn't it? And yeah. it's got that crazy shape. Uh -huh. I, I feel like yeah. I need to put it up. But yes, it's, it's very cool and very distinctive. And also, you look at who wears it. The first time I saw it was Kanye West was wearing one. And not only Kanye, but Kim. And they were both, I, I'm thinking of a picture, they're overlooking a Miami balcony. They're both wearing this insane watch. And then Tyler, the creator is wearing it. And all these people who are so revered in culture and they're really moving the needle. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see how culture plays into the demand of a watch as well. Oh, yeah. And we'll get to that unisex conversation a little bit later. So kind of hold that thought. Um, Tarath, what about you? You've got a lot more data to back up what you're seeing. Any specific trends? I mean, we know steel sport watches are 
you know, the get in this world. Um, but anything else you can tell us about styles, designs that are resonating with eBay's, eBay's many, many buyers? <laughs> No, I mean, I think a couple of the trends is, yes, yeah, steel sports watches are hot right now, right, across all the brands. Um, they're just hard to find, especially if you if you look into the core brand families the, and the key models, that's really hard to find. But what we're also finding as a trend out there is this next generation, the consumer really, really cares about transparency and authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. That is really important to them. Uh, it's more important than money, right? You're willing to pay $100, $200 more for a watch if you believe you're going to get taken care of. You believe you're buying something that's sustainable, that is transparent, that, hey, it's going to be the real deal. When Bryn wanted her Cartier, she, you know, if you, let's say you went on eBay, like, yes, could you find somebody with that has the original box and, mm -hmm. and as well as the bag? Yeah, potentially. But then you still want to ensure you're going to get that real thing. And, and that allowed us at eBay primarily to launch what we launched a year and a half ago, a program called Authenticity Guarantee, where every single watch is now physically inspected by our third party partner, Stolen Company, who is an expert watchmaker out there, a watch expert um, out there. And every watch is checked not only for if it's real, but also like, is it coming with the materials and the condition that it was described? And that is really important in this next generation, especially a generation that's actually flocking digital first as their first storefront before they ever go offline. And when you look at the pre-owned markets, how many stores do you have to go until you even find a submariner you like? Digital's wow. the first store you're going to go to, but then it's like, who do you trust? Who's the education? And I think the programs we've been able to launch at eBay are now delivering on that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, authenticity. And there's obviously so many more tools today to allow for people to to know what they're buying is is the the real deal. Um, I'm just curious if either of you, we, we talk so much about the steel sport watch trend. Do you think there's the pendulum is going to swing towards the dress watch arena anytime? I mean, or, or is it there and we're just sort of not talking about it because the prices on the secondary market for steel pieces are so crazy. I always wonder that if, if dress watches are ever going to make a big comeback. Good. Bryn, you want to take that one? I have some thoughts, but go for it. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say it really depends on who you ask, because if you ask the hardcore watch guys, you know, the collectors, the Hodinkee people, I think they are going to stay, you know, the steel sports watch is never going to lose that value. And they're always going to want one. And like the biggest aspiration is, wow, wouldn't it be great to own a Rolex Daytona? Um, but if you're also asking people who are coming in new, who, you know, people like me who you know, pop culture is kind of the first reference. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, you know, the red carpet at the Met Gala and Kaya Gerber was wearing a vintage Omega dress watch um, with her ball gown. And that in itself was a little polarizing because some people were like, you can't wear a watch with a ball gown. You can't ask what time it is. But besides <laughs> that, I think that, you know, the smaller vintage kind of more special pre-owned pieces, you know, it doesn't have to be a steel sports watch. It can be something really special and one of a kind that maybe inspired you because you saw, you know, Jackie O wearing it back in the day. And now it's kind of reliving a new life because, you know, you have like Kaya Gerber or Bella Hadid or whoever these people are to kind of look, allow you to look at things in a new light. Um, so I think it really just depends on who you're asking. Yeah, and I guess who your idols are. Exactly. Um, I mean, also, like, if you look at when we know we've been speaking about the new generation, right? Like, what are they starting to wear? Like, in eBay, one of the things we want, like, streetwear sneakers is hot right now. It is becoming connected to the new culture of what luxury could be. Mm -hmm. Who is that watch owner going to be five to ten years from now, right? And then you look at, all right, what are they going to wear? Are they going to wear a dress watch with, like, streetwear and sneakers? Or are they going to wear an awesome sports model with, awesome colors that actually connect the dots there that you can also wear if you put on a suit that you can wear with any occasion. I think, yeah. and so I think a lot of those trends are actually starting to shape and you're, you're seeing a new culture form out there, right? A culture of like when I was growing up decades ago was not the case. It's a new culture and the organizations that respond to, to that culture are, are the ones that are going to be able to tell the right stories. You know, the, I guess in terms of like, pop culture or the culture and the watches that are hot, you know, there are, we've kind of danced around a few of them. Obviously, Rolex has come up, Cartier, 
Patek Philippe, Richard Mill, Audemars Piguet. We all know the watch brands that dominate this space, that right. dominate the secondary market that everybody wants and covets and can't get. Are there sleeper brands out there that you think are poised to, you know, gain some more attention that people are overlooking that they shouldn't? Um, I, I'd love to hear from both of you. I don't know if one of you wants to jump off, but any brands that you think are a little under the radar and um, are poised for some success? Good, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, go. yeah, I can go. I mean, uh, we have a lot of data anyway, but outside of the data, right? I think Alang and Sons is 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 one of them. Yeah, I think we have some really cool, unique models. Uh, I mean, what, what happened over the last five years? Audemars Piguet, out of nowhere, like went from their Royal Oak Blue Dials were in the 1780s to now you, it's hard to even find them in the 20s or 30,000s, right? Uh, certain Patek models, they use certain Rolex models. And you start thinking about what might be next, right? Uh, and I think a brand like Alang could be that one. Um, and, and we're also seeing like a lot of people are now not only looking into watches as a passion, a passion just to wear, but they're looking at it as an alternative investment class. You have all these businesses taking off or you're in the crypto markets, people having cash on the sidelines. And then if you want to go invest in things, why not? If you're already a passionate watch collector and watch lover, you're going to probably invest in watches, right? As a, and even if you want to wear it for a while, flip it, there's a chance that it might go up if you, if you pick the right watch and it's becoming an alternative investment class. And I, uh, I think there are some great sleeper brands out there. I think A-Line could be one of them. Any brands on your radar, Bryn? Yeah. Well, I mean, if we're talking pre-owned and vintage, I mean, I've gone to some jewelry trade shows and watch trade shows um, in the past year. And what has really stood out to me are um, vintage Piaget watches. Um, I think the, kind of, the 70s is very in. Um, and I was first introduced to the Piaget Polo, the, the vintage one because I saw Michael B. Jordan wearing it on a yacht on Instagram. <laughs> and I mean, you look at somebody like him and he's, you know, in this photo, he was out in the middle of the Caribbean. You wouldn't necessarily expect for him to be wearing a vintage dress watch because I mean, as we all know, it's a no, no to go swimming in a vintage watch. Um, but just to see that in that context, um, it really did something for me um, in my imagination. And I started thinking about, you know, what would this look like kind of in a daily life? And even Sarath, you talked mm -hmm. about, you know, the streetwear crowd, which absolutely I could see them in a steel sports watch, but I could also see them getting really creative and kind of like just being really imaginative what, with what it would look like to see a vintage Piaget right. piece, for example, with, you know, a fully decked out streetwear look. Um, oh, and also I just did an Instagram live with, eBay and um, celebrity jeweler Greg Yuna and Greg kept talking about the Omega Speedmaster which um, mm. that was the watch that he picked for a giveaway and I know within the watch world you know everybody knows Omega everybody knows why Omega Speedmaster is special you know the first watch on the moon but I think if you're looking at a demographic that doesn't know anything about watches they will go to Patek, Rolex, even AP at this point like Taras mm. said but um I think, you know, the Omega pieces, there are lots of special pieces there that kind of get overlooked. Mm -hmm. I especially love the vintage Constellation. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting what you said, Bryn, right? Like similar to the jewelry, you know, the jewelry industry is very customizable, right? Like uh -huh. you customize pieces you make uh, with 3D printing, you can make anything. And streetwear and sneakers and to certain example, like handbags even, like they're starting to get into customization and watches is as well. Mm -hmm. So I could always also see a world like how do you start taking those some of those old pieces and customize the strap, customize some of the uh, 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 the face and, and and the bezel. And I think that's where you can actually start building, creating watches that actually suits your personality. And I think there's a future there as well. Totally. Mm. Well, kind of on that end, um, like Chrome Hearts has been seeing a huge revival. I don't know yep. if you guys are familiar, you're not as jewelry oriented, but um like yeah. it's kind of crazy to see, you know, that was such a trend in the 2000s and the Y2K trend is so big with Gen Z right now. And, you know, every cool streetwear guy is wearing a Chrome Hearts hoodie and these big rings. And I actually saw um, a Chrome Hearts customized watch. Uh, like Tarath, what you're That's saying, cool. you know, it's a, it's a vintage Rolex dial with mm -hmm. a customized Chrome Hearts bracelet. And that really, to me, kind of is very, and you know, indicative of like this is kind of 
this is what it could be. Like you could really mix and match and the pre-owned market invites that. Yeah, there's so many cool. You, when you mentioned the Piaget, I kept thinking about those great hardstone dials, you know, mm -hmm. the mountain, the lapis and those colors. I mean, you don't even need to custom. Those are out there somewhere in the world and mm -hmm. they look great with cool colored sneakers too. So <laughs> yeah. I see your point about sort of not, you don't have to stick to that obvious sport watch trend. You can do something a little funkier that has a lot of personality to it. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I, and I hadn't put this on the, our list of questions that we prepared, but it, it occurs to me because two nights ago, I, I happened to be invited to a party at the FP Journe boutique here in LA. And the man himself was there. Right. I'd met him before a few years ago and he, he speaks French, not very great English. And I certainly don't speak French at all. So after I, a lot of wine, he does speak good English. I'll just say that. Uh, that is exactly <laughs> what someone told me, which was hilarious. I mean, um, I, yeah, I've, I've, I've been, been to his restaurant with him in, in Geneva, Switzerland, and after a couple of glasses of wine, uh, his English comes out. <laughs> so I, someone actually said those exa that exact same thing. Um, what was funny is there were a lot of collectors there, and people had flown in from Chicago, from Columbus, yes. New York, um, driven up from San Diego, and there was somebody there, and he was like, yeah, it's like meeting Picasso, you know? <laughs> and, that struck me because I have heard of people refer to the watch market as, you know, kind of early stages of the of, of the art market. This is art. This is how people are perceiving it. This is why this may be not a bubble, what we're seeing in terms of secondary prices. It's actually just, you know, a market that's maturing. And um, certainly with the independence, you know, the people like F.P. Jorn, we've seen prices on those models just go bonkers. Yep. And I, I, I wonder if you either of you could talk about that are our watches art and are we at the beginning of a market that has sort of not really a ceiling or not a ceiling in the way that we've always thought about good Bryn, go for it <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard one i know i know it just occurred uh, to me i need to throw something at you but it's all in your head Bryn. you can you can see. yeah yeah i i have faith in you Bryn. <laughs> i mean well when you say ceiling are you talking financially yeah, I'm talking about like, you know, we're seeing such crazy prices for, you know, and I'll give you an example. A lot of people will have seen this, some have not, but famously Patek Philippe released the final run of its Nautilus 5711 oh. in April. And it was a green dial version that the market went crazy for. And one piece, you know, it was introduced in April. One piece found its way to the secondary market at auction this past summer, and it went for something like 13 times its retail value, 490000 ish around, or maybe right around there, something crazy. And, you know, I think for a lot of people that is startling to, to sort of grasp those kinds of numbers. But a lot of people think, hey, this is, this is art. You know, art goes for sums yeah. well above that. Any thoughts there? I mean, I know this is emerging, so there's not really a yeah. wrong answer here. It's more of a gut. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, something, I, there are a bunch of different factors. Like, for example, the 5711 was already impossible to get. Like, I'm thinking of that video on YouTube of Kevin O'Leary literally mm -hmm. shedding tears when he got off the wait list to get that. And that was what, I don't know, five years ago at this point. <laughs> Um, and then you add the additional factor of Patek canceling the model or cancel is maybe not the best word of <laughs> discontinuing, yeah. discontinuing. And, you know, you see the sky high prices. So, you know, a brand's decision to do something to therefore kind of boost the value is, is one factor. But then I think what makes watches, you know, if we're kind of thinking about them in this kind of art adjacent category, provenance certainly matters. And if you're looking at, you know, the Paul Newman Daytona, which grabbed, you know, I don't know, how much was it? Like 1.7 million or something? Seven, at 17 million. 17 million. I'm dyslexic with numbers. <laughs> you had the numbers. You just had the period in the rug. Yeah. It's like, I mean, that, you know, when you think about 17 million, it's of course ridiculous, but you also think about the movement that kind of Paul Newman started with this watch. I mean, we can owe him in part to the skyrocketing, you know, popularity of the watch itself and just so associating it with like the kind of race car driving and Daytona and the celebrity and just everything that goes into making that watch what it is now, even if it's not the exact Paul Newman, Paul Newman, you know, right. it's still like 
And then you think about, you know, Jackie O's Cartier tank, which went for however much. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like you have these individuals who are shaping the narrative and shaping culture. And that certainly kind of boosts the value in terms of like, if we're thinking about art adjacent prices. Great comment. Any thoughts there, Tarath, about where this market might go? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the market is seen as more of an art and the movements are an artwork of itself, right? I wear this Pepsi Rolex watch, but trust me, I do not use it till tell time. <laughs> I, I think it's an extension of like, I just have a story behind it and it's an art that resonated with me. And the same thing with art pieces when you buy it. Most people buy art because it, something resonates with you. And this is, goes back to my earlier point that it is becoming an alternative investment asset class. Look at the rainbow Rolex, right? The rainbow dial Rolex, it's it's trading for three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars, right? If you yeah. had an opportunity even to get a piece of that early days and turn that into an investment and then flip it, that is what this generation is starting to look at, right? And uh, and and you just have to pick and choose the right art pieces, just like you do in the art world. And scarcity plays a major role here, just like in the art world. Um, and I think this is just the start of the trend. It's just I think over the next five to ten years, it's going to get very interesting, especially with folks who can now invest into these watches and don't have to buy the whole watch, but can buy a piece of it. And a lot of the new innovations coming out there are pretty cool. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of room to grow here. So it's, it's been pretty exciting to watch and, and certainly as a bystander or witness to all of it, a pretty interesting thing to document. Um, let's switch gears a little. We touched, Bryn, you touched on this earlier, this idea of unisex watches. And I know you kind of came to the fore right as this conversation was sort of hitting, you know, I don't know, hitting on all the channels. Cara Barrett famously wrote a piece for Hodinkee about whether all watches should be unisex. Watch Femme, a group that uh, was founded by a couple of women in the watch world, began having regular chats on Clubhouse. Um, there was a lot of attention focused on this. And I think I think Swiss watchmakers are actually getting the message. I wonder if both of you could talk about, you know, why now? Like, why is this conversation happening now? And are people, is it resonating? Are people, do you think we'll see kind of different marketing efforts by the Swiss to target women or at least not to, to talk to women in the same, I, I guess, I don't know if it's misogynistic exactly, but same really patriarchal way they'd always talk to women. I mean, do we see this changing as a result of the conversations we've had this year? Um, Bryn, why don't you kick things off? Because I think you, you were sort of part of that conversation and certainly you are now continuing it with the way you you talk to women in, through your through your channels yeah um well it's funny because i feel like as a woman you know as a consumer for the most part i feel completely integrated and completely spoken to in the way that i you know kind of want to be spoken to you know coming from a fashion slash media background it's like i never felt kind of you know, ignored or misunderstood, like, you know, <laughs> fashion is so I feel like it's kind of caught up and you look at any cover of Vogue magazine or, you know, it's so we've hit this point of inclu inclusivity beyond like way beyond gender, male and female. Right. Mm -hmm. And then coming into the watch world, I'm like, oh, <laughs> people are still having this conversation. Like it's kind of a radical idea to speak to women in a way that is you know, more contemporary or in line with the times, it's radical to consider genderless watches. And that just really, really surprised me off the bat. Um, but I also felt that the timing for me to get into watches was very serendipitous because it seemed as though, you know, the pot was just starting to boil. And you mentioned Cara's piece, like that came out really kind of early on in my watch journey. <laughs> um, and I felt really lucky because all of a sudden the dialogue was being had and people were, you know, eager to hear from women, which I understand was not always the case because, you know, I, I am, I'm friends with the watch femme women and other collectors who have been in the industry, you know, on a professional or just a collector level for, you know, a decade at this point. And they're like, it's never been like this. Like people are really starting to listen. They're really starting to be open and, so yeah, it's it's interesting to see that, you know, it's become such a topic that I think the Swiss watch brands have no choice but to 
kind of listen and maybe adapt and who knows when we'll see results, but at least it's being acknowledged. And that's the first part of, you know, initiating any sort of change. Mm -hmm. Great points. And Tara? That's interesting, right? Like what's been happening over the last decade, right? The watch world has always made bigger face dials, case sizes, 39 millimeter plus, and targeted it as, as a men's watch, right? But mm -hmm. plus, and, and the smaller um, case sizes have been targeted primarily for a female watch or the Chinese market. Uh, but primarily what's been happening in the last decade is women have been buying what they traditionally have uh, called men's watches. And the face size has been going bigger and bigger. And I'm a big believer that anyone can should own anything that fits their personality, right? And this is not a men's watch or a woman's watch. I know people, women and men that wear Pepsi watches, Rolex Mariners, 43 millimeter watches. Why? Because they just love it. They love the story. They love the look and feel. And I think that's the world we're starting to get into, that it is genderless and that, hey, go own what fits your personality and tell a great story about yourself. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, this is it puts me in mind of a conversation I had with one of the watch fund founders, Suzanne Wong, earlier this year. And I, I did a story for The New York Times about this, too, right around the time shortly after Cara's piece came out. Mm -hmm. um, and what she said has really stuck with me because I don't know if we're going to see this change. She said, you know, it's really cool for women to wear even that term boyfriend watch, which, you know, can be a little offensive, obviously. Yeah. I don't need a boyfriend to wear who want to wear this watch, or I don't need to borrow this watch. I can own this watch for my very own, but it's been, it's really cool for women to, to wear watches that are more masculine or have a, a more masculine edge to them. The point when this conversation will be done and we can retire and not talk about it anymore is when men are comfortable wearing a woman's watch or something that is traditionally very feminine. You know, it's, it's that, that conversation that I, I don't know. I don't know that it's happening, but I feel like, right. Brent? Well, I think it is happening. Like I, I have a Cartier love bracelet uh, yeah. and women's bracelets. There's some really cool ones out there and look at the new men's bracelet styles coming out. Those were traditionally designed for women. Right. And I think I wear it because I think it just looks cool. Right. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm watching this. And I think it's changing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, um, I mean, I mentioned Tyler, the creator, he's been wearing the little small Cartier and I'm like, you know what, what I really want to see is a man wearing a Cartier Benoit. Do you know this one? Like the little yeah. round one. And I actually went to dinner at my friend's restaurant. He's like a, he's a millennial chef kind of wonder kid. <laughs> and he has a restaurant here in New York. And I, I saw him and I said, hi. And I looked at his wrist and he was wearing the Benoit. Oh, and, goodness. you know, not only was he wearing this, you know, vintage piece that's designed for women, historically worn by women, but he was also wearing it on the job. <laughs> he was like, you know, stirring stew and pots and pans. And I'm like, this guy's wearing a leather strap watch in this hot kitchen. And, <laughs> but it looks good and somehow it works. And I think yeah. that, you know, we are seeing more of that. And you see, you know, the way that takes somebody like Harry Styles is is dressed for any event. He's just mm -hmm. decked in Gucci and he has pearls and earrings and rings and like Tarath, you said, like bracelets. And I think that, you know, watches just considering their like ongoing popularity and just mm -hmm. inserting themselves more into the scene. I I really want to see stylists, you know, my dream is to put, you know, Harry Styles in a vintage um Cartier Panther, kind of like how Keith yeah. Richards moved cool. back in the seventies, you know, it's, it's all coming back. Yeah. Should've I love time. it. Well, I guess when you see people like that Atlanta Braves baseball player, I don't know if you caught this wearing a white strand at the world series, a white strand of pearls. Oh. I mean, his name is jock J O jock Peterson. So you've got like the biggest jock name jock <laughs> wearing, wearing white pearls at the world series. I think all bets are off. Right. So yeah. It's cool. I love what it. What do you want? Like, I really love it. I think it's a great, a great sort of evolution of this whole conversation. Um, one thing, okay, so, and I wanted to talk to you both about that. And we've, again, we've sort of danced around it, Gen Z, the younger generation, what they want. Um, one thing I, I wasn't in Geneva for all the auctions that just took place, but I've heard comments about how much uh, the sort of, audience had changed that there were a lot of young people in that audience mm -hmm. buying and how much that differs from the way 
watch auctions and watch buying, you know, even 10 years ago was. So it does seem like that kind of old chestnut about, well, we've got our smartphones. So of course, nobody's going to buy a watch or need a watch or care about a watch. We can just toss that, right? I mean, what's your sense? And Bryn, I mean, I think you can kick off since you're part of this generation, part of the part of the momentum, I think, for for why young people are are embracing watches. So what's your sense of how young people feel and what's important? We've kind of touched on it, but I think not as directly. So yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I wish I could have been in Geneva to kind of feel the energy in the room. Um, because my only reference was when I worked at Sotheby's and I would kind of go down and sneak into the watch auctions. And it was a bunch of like, you know, old dudes at 2 p.m. <laughs> kind of like dispersed yes. throughout. Um, but I, I mean, I get that comment a lot. Why are you so into watches when you have your cell phone? You don't even need to tell time. And I mean, I think like Tarat said, you on your Pepsi, it's like, who knows what it's set to. Yeah. But I think it really is. I mean, I always like to have mine set because and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I think the younger generations are really so burnt out because we're all, you know, digital natives and even mm -hmm. younger kids, younger than I am, you know, growing up with an iPad in their hand. It's like, at some point, how much screen time can you really take before you're completely burnt out? And yeah. I think we see, you know, trends of uh, younger people really drawn to analog, um, you know, disposable cameras, film, you know, things that kind of have this kind of tangible quality. Even something that's really funny is wired headphones are coming back and there are Vogue <laughs> articles written in it, Wall Street Journal. There was an NBC segment last night. Um, like people are really into wired headphones because it feels kind of vintage. <laughs> Just like, I feel like the it younger is. generation really will grasp at anything that kind of has a more old school feel right now. And watches, you know, inevitably they really kind of represent this this old time. And and I personally, I love having a watch to tell the time because, you know, after a long day of work, talking on the phone, being in touch, kind of being available nonstop, twenty four seven. I love just taking a walk around my neighborhood with no phone and just my watch to tell the time. Like that is to me the most therapeutic thing, and I think a lot of people will agree with me. I will certainly. <laughs> Well, if I did that, Bryn, with my watch, it would not be the exact time in, in the place I am in. My watch is probably somewhere in like Europe time zone right now. So <laughs> you look at it and you can just pretend you just got beamed somewhere, right? <laughs> That's kind of fun. <laughs> what are you seeing, Tarath, in terms of, I, I don't know if your data tells you or what you're seeing about demographic shifts in this marketplace? So we are. I mean, like I think earlier said, like 23% of audiences under the age of 25 are buying pre-owned. Mm -hmm. We're finding in the U.S. 69% of people are buying pre-owned watches right now. So there's a huge shift driven by that younger generation. And it's pretty much wearing a feeling. I, Bryn, you, you hit the nail on vintage. I think the vintage overall look and feel is coming back across many categories, right? Across what you wear, what you do, and, and how you potentially live. But it's connecting with the modern era. And I think that's starting to be really fun. And, and I think people are wanting to wear feelings, right? Like I put this on and you feel differently versus the Omega Spectre I put on, I feel differently. And it's kind of cool, right? I mean, you, you get that feeling, you love that, it's still getting that old school look and feel on your wrist and it feels like you're wearing artwork. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely do not use it to tell time. I huh. use my cell phone to tell time and I just like wearing it for the feeling. Yeah, that's you know, funny. I think there are two kinds of people in this world. Those that like feel naked without a watch and those that could care less. I've always felt naked without one. I mean, I think since I was little, I've always worn a wristwatch. So it and when I leave the house without one, I feel like really kind of angsty about it, you know, and it's not really about time, but it is about it is about that feeling. Yeah, it's something oh. that anchors me. Yeah. Totally. I also think that um the Gen Z, like the data to wrap that you were kind of, you know, rattling off. It's like that almost we we can't even fully grasp, you know, how much Gen Z will be drawn to this because they simply don't have the money yet. Yeah. I mean, I literally I just got my first luxury watch this past May. And so I, I wasn't even thinking about it because I, I simply didn't have the disposable income to afford it. But I think mm -hmm. a huge portion of, you know, kind of understanding the watch world um, as a consumer is having the seeds planted kind of early in your head. Um, mm -hmm. And 
with increasing platforms and kind of, you know, more marketing that I've been seeing eBay doing, like when you guys did the, um, who was it, Iris Apfel and- Yes, and with, with Little Yachty, the old school meets new school, yeah. Yeah, like that, I mean, that really, I, I felt you guys did an incredible job kind of hitting, you know, the spectrum because you have, you know, a fashion icon like Iris and then you have, you know, Lil Yachty, who's like speaking the kid's language. And he's, it's just like for a kid to be scrolling through Instagram, seeing that and they're like, oh, like what's Lil Yachty talking about? And who's this like old lady? And I need to know more. And it's just like about planting those seeds so that when one day they turn 30, right. you know, they will buy the watch. Um, and I think that's what a huge part of, you know, the aspirational fashion scene, like why that is so successful is because it's been drilled into our heads to buy luxury and Gucci. Yes. And well, that's where pre-owned plays a role, right? It's certain pre-owned is going to be more accessible and you can get a great pre-owned watch for $1,500, right? You can mm -hmm. get your entry level tag, entry level Omega, and it's the start of something. And as you grow, trade in, trade up and keep, keep upgrading, right? That's the dream. Uh -huh. That's I mean, <laughs> um, Bryn, you talk, you know, you're so, I guess you have your finger so much on that pulse of pop culture. And, and I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about who you're following in terms of like which pop culture celebs you think are, you know, doing, I don't know, wearing watches, showing them off, saying something a little different. I mean, you've already mentioned a few, the ones that you've, you've pointed out, but anybody that you think is a must follow if you're interested in watches. Yeah. I mean, well, how many times can I bring up Tyler, the creator? I think he's major. I think his style is so impactful and so creative and the way he approaches it. I actually saw him walking down the street the other week. And I got so nervous and I was like, oh, I want to ask him, is he wearing his crash or is what is he wearing? And I got, I chickened out, um, but I think that he's a really good one. Um, yeah. I also think, oh, God, I wish I could pull up the dime piece Instagram right now. Cause I'm kind of, <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah. When I look, <laughs> when I tell you how many photos of celebrities I look at all day, it's just kind of overwhelming. Um, <laughs> but I will say just generally, like I have noticed more and more, just more, more people are wearing watches and they're being more integrated into everyday style. And that is really exciting. And you look at somebody like Bella Hadid, who never leaves the house with her Cartier Panther. She's, she's, you know, swimming in the ocean and, you know, I'm trying to think who wears a, like a Royal Oak, uh, even somebody like as massive, massive as um, Serena Williams, you know, she's wearing her Royal Oak to literally everything she goes to and not just one Royal Oak, but it's like the full gamut. It's like this one she wears with her ball gown, this one she wears while playing tennis. So it's cool to see even brand ambassadors. I think, you know, they should get more credit than than they do get right now. You too. I mean, you look at even the younger, like in sports, but like Patrick Mahomes, right? Uh, walking around with a rainbow Rolex. I think there was a great photo taken with him like two days ago with one on, right? And yeah, you, you, you're you're seeing more and more of that happening. I mean, it's also I think the one other thing is the iWatch did something interesting out there for people. It got something on someone's wrist that they probably never had in the first place. Got it, then you're very used to it, and you're like, oh, I'm trying to grow older. I have money. And I don't want to be like, look like everyone else now. So can I just throw something else on the wrist? And there you go. Swiss watch industry plays a role. You know, when the Apple watch came out, I think in 2015, you heard people saying that, oh, well, we think, you know, but it all, it felt a little bit like a pipe dream at that point. It felt like maybe this was just yeah. something people were saying, but it does seem like it is, it has actually come to fruition that people who maybe entered the world of watches through a smartwatch, namely the Apple watch, have actually seen wait it's kind of cool to have something on your wrist it's almost like a little like i said a little um well kind of like your it's my security blanket i don't know oh, are you wearing <laughs> one right now what's that are you wearing one right now i am i actually am wearing i don't know if you can see it's uh, one of the, uh, oh hold on a gamelski uh, ah, wait, yeah. on. There is, why can i get this ah oh. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry about the, there but we yeah, go so that's the watch i was doing after you it is. And I've got my other one here that's kind of like that Piaget with the Malachite. Oh, cool. Yeah. What kind is that? It's the Gamelski, which oh. is the story. It, it, it was a Shinola sub-brand that um, they produced in 2016. 
sort of a long story. I wrote about it for the Times of how it came to be named after me. But the uh, the, the Gamelski sub brand, sadly, when I ran into Tom Kartsotis, the founder of Shinola, right before the pandemic, he was like, she's she's in rehab right now, so she, oh. she's not she's not alive and well, but who knows? Maybe she'll make a comeback. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, she has actually a very cool, affordable line of watches. So if you can find them on like secondhand channels, perhaps eBay. Um, so we're getting close to our time, and I wanted to leave a little time for questions. But before we we sort of open it up, I wanted to just see what tips you might offer people who are new to this world. I mean, obviously if you're a woman and you're interested in watches, go to dimepiece.co um, and eBay once you have a sense of what you might be looking for. But any any tips that you think are kind of critical for people to understand about how to navigate this vast marketplace? Good, Bryn. Well, I would say the, mo the thing ha that has been the most crucial to me is making watch buddies. <laughs> These are friends who I have met who are new or friends that I've already known who I kind of discovered through talking about watches that they're interested in watches too. Um, I think the world of watches is so vast and it can be so overwhelming, especially if you're, you know, considering pre-owned, you're like, oh God, what do I do? Even, even the subject of narrowing down what you're even looking for can be really yeah. daunting. Um, it took me like a full year to realize this is what I wanted as my first watch, but what got me there was just talking and having conversations and, you know, kind of building up a network where people send you links and they're like, Oh, what do you think about this? And even just the tactile luxury of being able to try other people's watches on. Um, yeah. The reason why I got this is because my mom's friend was wearing it and I was like, Hey, I really like that watch. And she's like, try it on, like give it a yeah. spin. Let me know what you think. And so many people have been so generous with me and letting me try on their watch and, take pictures of it. And there's nothing like that. I think the heart of why watches are so special is of course the watchmaking and, you know, just like the intention that goes into the designs, but also what makes watches exciting for me is the community and how, you know, there's like really just so many stories to be told and, and just trying things on and getting to know a feel for it. Watch buddies are my number one, <laughs> just ask around. And, and you'll learn whether you like to or not, because watch people love to talk. <laughs> That's so yeah. true. So true. And Tarad, what about you? Yeah, I think, look, you got a lot of great blogs out there, a lot of great forums to kind of just learn about the industry, see the cool pieces. But I think it goes back to really understanding which watch connects with you. I don't think about it as an investment. And because if you do, it, you're just going to drive yourself crazy over time and seeing if the value is going up or down. But Pick a watch that really connects with you. I mean, in eBay, also, like, we have 1.2 million watch listings. Oh like, that's a lot to get through. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the content, the storytelling, the search, the filters, looking for authenticity guarantee is so critical because you know you're going to get that real thing and you're going to get taken care of. And so um, I think it's really bad. Hey, what's going to fit your story, your budget, and um, get you into this industry? There's a lot to discover here. There are really the stories. I've written about watches, and this will definitely date me for 20 years. And had you told me 20 years ago that I'd still be writing about watches in 2021, yeah. I would have thought you were smoking something. Because how on earth could there be that much to say about watches? And yet, mm -hmm. here we are. And there's mm -hmm. a lot to say. It's a really interesting market and a really interesting lens onto the world at large. Because these watchmakers are so global and so involved in lots of different things. I mean, Cartier, for one, I mean, has a number of amazing initiatives with women, with education, with the arts. So, you know, I think it, it is just a watch to some people. But for people who are aware and in the know, it's a little uh, sort of black hole into a parallel universe that you had no idea existed. And there's a lot, a lot going on there. So thank you both for talking about it with me and delving into it a bit and hopefully giving anybody who's listening a little bit of inspiration to go searching for their next watch. Um, I don't know if we have questions or if there is anything um, in the audience that anybody wants to ask, but we're certainly open to that. And I think I speak for Tarath and Bryn when you can probably find us all on social if you want to follow up. Um, let's see, Alex, are you there? Yeah, there you yeah go. we have one question from the audience right now. Uh, but before we head to that, I just want to say, like, what an amazing overview 
uh, introing Jewelry Week to watches for the first time. Um, I think we should change the title of this panel to It's Not About Time. I can't remember actually who said that, but that's just like, uh, I love it. It's such a fantastic takeaway. Okay, uh, moving to some questions from the audience. We have a question from Ellen for you, Bryn, which is, what's going to be your first purchase after your Cartier? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I actually did get another watch almost only a month after I got my Cartier, which is kind of a long story, but I did a, I did an influencer video for a, <laughs> for a secondhand luxury consigner and they gave me store credit as payment. And I had just Ooh. enough of the store credit to buy a gorgeous 26 millimeter pre-owned Rolex date just, you know, just two tone champagne dial, totally mm -hmm. like, you know, every, Buddy has that watch. But I thought, you know, my first Rolex, I, I couldn't afford a steel sports watch. And to me, the date just is like, yes, it's so popular. But in, when it came to investing in a Rolex for me, I was like, what is tried and true? What will go with so many different outfits? And also, why don't I look at a smaller watch? You know, they're, they're cheaper. <laughs> and they're also more unique at this point because I think Rolex itself kind of even discontinued manufacturing the 26 millimeters. I could be wrong on that. Um, but yeah, I've been so happy with it. And, you know, I didn't have the authenticity guarantee uh, that eBay has, but I took it into uh, watches of Switzerland and Soho. And I was like, can you just tell me if this looks good if it's legit so i think another tip when buying pre-owned is you can buy something but also maybe look and see can i return this do i have a window and use that time to you know ask an expert or go into a store to just get that get that um validation but of course with ebay you don't have to do that because it's already guaranteed if it's 2000 and up i'm well versed from the instagram live <laughs> that's um, funny <laughs> but yeah um that's awesome uh, the person who asked that question also commented that they own both of those watches. So you're oh. in sync, which is great. Great um, taste. This is a great lead on question from that. And uh, Tirath, possibly you can answer this in more detail or maybe just uh, give some more insight. Is there a specific place to go on eBay? This is a question from Audrey. But maybe if you can just tell people a little bit more, Bryn, you already mentioned, um, you know, this guarantee that exists at a certain price point. Um, what can people kind of learn about this space uh, from you guys? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, like, I think the easiest place to go is just go to ebay.com, hover over the fashion category and click on luxury watches. You'll be right there in the luxury watch destination then, or you can just start searching, like use our search functionality. It's great. Uh, uh, and I mean, if you want to search like a Rolex Samariner, you'll see all the listings and you'll, you'll be able to filter based on authenticity guarantee and just look for that blue badge that says authenticity guarantee. And because you know you're going to be fully protected and in, we have some great videos, great content around how we do make that happen. Cool thing here is you also get um, with every watch, you get this digital uh, NFC tag. It's like an actual authenticity guarantee card that if you hover your NFC phone device, you can see the digital version of that certificate. Um, and so that's something special that's only against you and that watch. And that's something unique we've been offering as well. I love that. I hope everyone was writing down all of these fantastic names in their little notebook and that they followed the uh, top top five picks uh, Instagram. That was a great, uh, useful thing if you're looking to start or complete your, well, not complete, sounds like from this that it's never going to be complete. It's, a, it's an ongoing legacy of uh, collecting and research. Um, I think that's it for audience questions. So Victoria, do you want to wrap it up if anyone has anything lost to say before we go? Gosh, I feel like we've sort of said it all. Um, <laughs> you know, like I said, there it, it is a market that has just kind of, even after 20 years of witnessing it, watching it, studying it, it continues to surprise me. There's a lot going on. The pre owned category is booming. I'm, I'm in the midst of writing a story about the Chinese market and the watch industry's future in China. And it's deeply interesting how the Chinese look at watches and what what they're forcing the watch brands to do, which is, and Bryn, I keep actually meaning to bring this up because I interviewed you for a story about Instagram and the, the world of Instagram, you know, in the watch world on Instagram. You had a comment at the end that 
ties into what I'm seeing in China, which is this rise of user generated content and the way that um, the way that users spotlight watches is so different than the way brands spotlight watches. And there's this craving, you know, we've talked about authenticity, but it's really about an authentic depiction of the way somebody who's wearing a watch might see it in it, you know, in their own home, on their own wrist, on the wrists of their friends or the people they admire. And it's really fascinating to see how that's forcing brands to kind of reevaluate the way they own their own narratives. Um, because users like everybody's listening, like Bryn, like yourself, are are really more and more in control in a way they never have. So, you know, as a consumer, you've got a lot of power these days and ever more so. So I think um I don't I don't know what the takeaway is from that, other than it's interesting to see that these monolithic brands have had to really cede a little bit of their power and surrender a bit to the to the wave of interest and trends and things they're seeing from consumers, especially in China, but more and more here. Mm -hmm. So that that's my interest. Maybe because I'm immersed in it right now as I'm thinking about the Chinese and their insanely voracious appetite for luxury and for watches. Right. So um, any final thoughts for either of you, Tarath or Brent? Well, I think look, it's going to be interesting to see and in heading into 2022 how the brands and the major Amazons and groups actually respond to this growing market, right? The growing market that many of them have lost control of. How do they play a major role into? We've seen certain brands go in and say, we're going to launch pre owned. Mm -hmm. But I think digital and pre owned and the way it's coming together, it's going to be very interesting, especially over the next couple of years, how the, how the brands actually evolve and play a major role in it. And I think that's something to, to follow and watch out after. Yeah. Uh, they're leaving a lot of money on the table. I hope eBay's clean it up. Or <laughs> customer experience, at least, right? So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Victoria, Tara, and Bryn. Uh, what a fantastic conversation. And thank you, eBay, for bringing this to Jewelry Week, the first watches conversation, the first of many, we hope. Um, we're so excited to have had you all here today. And thank you for educating us on the watch game. We're so uh, grateful to you all. Uh, fantastic speakers, virtual round of applause, and we are going to head right into our next program. Thank you all so awesome. much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, folks, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. We are heading straight into the next one. I was not kidding around when I said we have an action packed day today, so I'm going to intro this for you right away. Uh, our next program is In Their Element uh, with Melanie Grant and Sada Maturi. In Their Element is a series that we launched last year uh, during Jewelry Week, and it features designers and artists speaking about an element of their work that permeates throughout everything they do uh, and their approach. This series is one that's designed to resonate beyond the physical objects and get to the heart of how we all connect to jewelry. This very special edition of this series welcomes two of the most esteemed names in the industry, speaking on the element of inspiration, Melanie Grant and Sada Maturi of Maturi Fine Jewelry. Um, this conversation is pre-recorded, so there will not be Q&A. And after it is live now, you'll also be able to catch it on our website for the rest of Jewelry Week, sorry, on our YouTube channel for the rest of Jewelry Week, accessible via our website also. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play this for you right now, and I hope everybody enjoys. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at New York City Jewelry Week 2021. My name is JB Jones, and I'm one of the co-founders of NYC Jewelry Week. I am thrilled to welcome a talk uh, from our series In Their Element that features designers and artists speaking about an element of their work that permeates throughout what they do and how they approach everything that they make. This series is one designed to resonate beyond the physical objects and to get to the heart of how we all connect to jewelry. Today's very special edition of this series welcomes two of the most esteemed names in the industry who we're very excited to have with us this year. Melanie Grant and Sata Maturi of Maturi Fine Jewelry. Melanie Grant is a journalist who has been working for over 20 years at the Times, the Financial Times, the Guardian, and many more currently at The Economist. 
She is an authority on jewelry as art and commodity, writing articles and giving talks at the Science Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Association of Art and Antiques Dealers, and many more. She is a humanities scholar at Harvard and is a guest lecturer at Central St. Martin's. In her spare time, which I question that she actually had, <laughs> <laughs> she writes for Vogue, Vanity Fair, Tatler, CNN Style, and the National Diamond Council. In 2020, she released her first book, Coveted, which we were super proud to have a part of Jewelry Week last year. Thank you for being here, Melanie. And our guest today, uh, the focus of this In Their Element series is Sata Maturi. She is the founder and creative lead of the award-winning Maturi Fine Jewelry which she founded after a 17 year diamond career working in sales and rough diamond valuation at one of the world's largest diamond mining groups. Her skills, experience and network within the midstream of the diamond pipeline, coupled with her passion for diamonds and fine jewelry led to her niche namesake brand, Maturi Fine Jewelry. Being British with West African heritage, Sata combines deep felt traditions from the African continent mixed with a global view of trends, attitudes, and inspiration to create distinct contemporary designs that resonate with all women across the globe. And thank you for being here, Sata. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Today we're going to discuss the topic of inspiration in Sata's work. And with that, I will pass it to you, Melanie. Wonderful. Thank you, JB. Thanks for having us, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Um, you know, we love doing these talks. Um, and so really we're going to kind of get into it because Sata and I um, have known each other for a while and we were talking earlier about how we met um, and I wonder, um, Sata, can you remember how we actually met? I think we met about three or four years ago. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Over lunch at yeah. the Ivy, as I recall. Over lunch at the Ivy in Conwood Garden, if I remember correctly, um, that was in 2018, I think. Um, and um, I was actually, you know, obviously because I, I, I split my time between um, London and Botswana and, and at the time my team actually said um, we need to make contact with, with Melanie Grant um, and so they did and I am so, so happy that you, you decided to sort of, yeah, see me, take a wild card and, and it started off from there and I think um, we were featured in one of your 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 um, articles. Yes, we did a we did an article on I think Africa uh, in the Economist. Um, the Africa editor of the Economist wrote it about um, Africa being a source of materials. Um, but yes. you know why did so many designers leave the continent to come to Europe and, and and America in terms of infrastructure? So that was quite interesting, and you were part of that, and we shot that, and it was great. And we borrowed some of your uh, your earrings, which I think we're all going to see later. Um, yes, and so, absolutely. So that that was the beginning of of our friendship, and I suppose we're going to now talk about the beginning of your journey as a, as a jewelry artist. So um, yes. I think let's start with one of the deepest, the most current collections you have, um, and if you'd like to sort of talk about where it all began in, geographically. Yes, so um, if we, um, we've put some, put some slides together. So if we kind of um, move on to um, slide three, um, which um, talks about sort of the, the, uh, um, the collection that we did. So um, I don't know, um, slide, slide three, I, I'm just sorry. Um, there we go. Right. I don't know Melanie who's doing the slides. Sorry about that. I think it's JB oh, well. somewhere. Right. Uh, right. Is, has she come back? Is it it's not? all right for the listeners. There we go. There we go. We're coming back on. These things happen. So it's fine. But the presentation we put it in a, a deck of slides so it's quite nice um, for the listeners to actually visually connect as we talk um, so let's just allow JB to probably come back uh, JB I think we there you, we go okay excellent 
Here Excellent. So we'll take it, take it from there. Right. So slide, yeah. slide four. There we go. So um, yes. Yeah, so um, our current collection, Whispers of Moreau, um, is sort of um, based out from you know inspired by the ancient kingdom of of Kush, um, and um, the kingdom of Kush was also known as Nubia and ruled by Kushite queens and, and kings. So, you know, first slide is, is, you know, the location of Nubia, because I think firstly, people, Melanie, are not necessarily familiar with Nubia mm -hmm. relative to other surrounding areas and empires such as Egypt and the Mediterranean. So a lot of people you find cannot put Nubia or Kushite Nubia on the map. So we have it on there now. And as you can see, and you can see that we've sort of highlighted it in a red sort of um, um, square, um, Nubia was located along the south of ancient Egypt. So your upper Nile Valley regions of, so we're looking from Aswan or the Aswan Dam. Uh, a lot of people would, would have heard that name in the north until further below um, Khartoum to the south. So essentially, the most southern regions of, of, of Egypt to the northern tip of Sudan. So, um, and after saying that, we then need to understand the relationship between Nubia and Egypt. So um, when we look at the two countries or empires, so to speak, they were intrinsically linked by way of region, by way of culture, by religious uh, beliefs, and also the, the very great Nile River and also um, um, general way of life. But I think the one thing that actually linked them together was trade. And a lot of people sort of um, miss that out and they don't realize that trade was one of the biggest things that actually connected the two together. So Nubia was known to be an important and integral trading bridge to Egypt, given its link to the sub-Saharan countries where you had sort of things like exotic goods such as ivory and ebony and taxidermy, you know, skins coming from, you know, sort of um, 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 the other um, um, lower um, sub-Saharan countries traveling through Nubia and Kush to reach Egypt. And so, you know, um, that's where we see the trade, but most so um, Egypt valued Nubia for its rich mineral resources. So we, we see copper, iron ore, which was also used extensively for weapon making. Um, but more so the valuable commodity called gold. And we all know that. Um, and at the time, you know, gold was seen to have mystical powers by the ancient Egyptians. So it's very important to them. So the two countries traded quite peacefully for hundreds of years. And, you know, evidence of this trade was actually found by archeologists. It's all, it's all out there, the research was done. However, as we move, you know, through the, the centuries, you know, large gold deposits, Nubia grew to become a strong, you know, economic power in the region and started to transform into sort of a powerful force. Um, and with this independence, we started to see the emergence of powerful clans and, and kingdoms rising, you know, leading to, um, Melanie, you probably would have a better term for this. What, what do they call it? Geopolitical challenges. Mm -hmm towards Egypt and for the control of the southern lands. And so you start seeing very um, the rise of powerful stronghold cities of Kerma, you would have heard the name, Napata, um, and of course Miro, um, which were ru all ruled by Kushite clans. So this led to wars, and I, I know I'm going on, but I think it's very important for people to connect to it and see sort of how we got to um, the, the collection of what we do. So this led to wars um, with Egypt, who took over um, control of Nubia for about five, 600 years. And during this time, that's when you started to see an explosion of culture. So many Nubians were starting to um, adopt aspects of the Egyptian culture uh, through the worship of Egyptian gods. So your, your Iris, your Horus, your um, Hathor, your um, Osiris, and they were practicing ritual ceremonies, training as scribes, and generally integrating by intermarriage, you know, um, and also practicing things like the sacred um, mummification, so tomb burials. And it's, you know, it's fascinating to know that there's more pyramids in, in, in uh, Miro or in the Kushite sort of region than they are in, in Egypt itself. And similarly, or the reverse, 
We see Nubian artifacts and styles were also adopted across Egypt. I mean, in the, you found those in Egyptian tombs. So pottery, furniture, jewelry, the braided hairstyles and the clothing too. So basically, um, quickly sort of, yeah, um, um, moving on. After centuries of ancient rule, the Kushites, you know, then under a powerful leader known as Pai, or P some people call it, refer to him as Pianki, um, led a conquest of Egypt to start the reign of what's known as the 25th dynasty of pharaohs, which interestingly included a lot of powerful women um, or women pharaohs or Kandakis as, as we know them. Um, and, you know, you've heard names um, such as Amenarenas, um, who was a powerful woman um, that led wars, including, you know, one with the Romans, um, and also um, Amani Shaketo, who was known for her impressive jewellery collection, um, which was taken from her tomb or her pyramid in the 1800s. And I think it's now housed in the Egyptian Museums of Berlin or, or Munich, I'm not so sure. So I think you can see why, you know, I was really fascinated um, by the stories of what happened in the lower parts of the region and wanting to move away from the usual traditional Egyptian adaptation that people normally use. I knew I wanted to do something Art Deco. I knew I wanted it to be distinct and curiously different, um, to, you know, to be bursting out with historical references um, that wasn't really spoken or spoken about or celebrated in particular to to sell, you know to sort of show these strong rulers that they were out there. So just a bit of a preamble and a, and a, the reasons why um, we we I used sort of Nubia um, as a driver for, for for this new collection. Great. Um, okay, so we've got the background um, of. Uh, Whispers of Moreau. Um, and I think it would be great to see some pieces which we have in the slideshow of the actual yes. jewellery. So great. So these are pieces inspired by everything you've just spoken about. Yes. Um, and when did this collection come out? So this um, came out um, the start of this year. Mm -hmm. So we started working on it. I started off in 2018. And obviously, because of COVID and closing down and, and travel restrictions, um, we could only sort of, uh, uh, you know, announce it at the start of, of, of this year. Um, yeah. But it was it was well worth the wait because we, we had that sort of added time to sort of change things and, and you know, do a bit more research, mm -hmm. um, shoot a, a really sort of powerful, strong campaign that, you know, mm -hmm. sort of accompanies the whole co uh, collection. So. Um, January this year is when, right. when, when, when it all came out, yeah. Fantastic. So we're going to move back a slide to the pink earrings. Um, and we're going to talk about your original debut collection, which was the first thing that you made. Uh, and I wonder if you can tell me, how did you explore the African themes in the beginning of your career? So, um, with my debut collection, which I usually refer to it as my, my hero collection. So that I did in um, 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and it was stuff that was very close to home and close to my heart. Um, and I think when you talk to any designer, I think their first collection is always something that's, you know, very, very close. And, you know, these, it was things that I knew from, my West African connection, mm -hmm. but it didn't really have an overarching theme. And I'm being completely honest here. Um, there was no kind of uh, key connector story. And I felt I, I kind of felt I created jewelry for myself, mm -hmm. um, which I, I would have liked to have worn because there was, there was nothing else out there, Melanie. And, and you know the story of myself, how I started, Mm. Um, and how I left my, my job to actually start a brand that actually um, spoke to, to um, you know, a continent that, you know, produce a large majority of the raw materials. There was nothing there. And I, that's, that was one of the reasons why I started the brand. 
but you know, then still, I, I wanted my vision to always go back and take inspiration from Africa and its mm-hmm. wider reach. So it could be symbolic objects, it could be flora and fauna, you know, history and heritage and way of life. Um, but all these things I try to explore and bring into what I do. Mm. Um, and I must say, it's it's easy when you reference something that you you kind of you know very well and you understand. Mm. And I think it's it's right for me to say I've been lucky to have been born in Sierra Leone. I've been raised and educated and lived most of my life in the UK since I was 15. Uh, lived and worked in South Africa um, for the mining company that I worked for for over 17 years. Um, you know, followed by Botswana for, for, for seven years. And, and I've had the opportunity to travel through the continent quite extensively. And, you know, each region, as you know, has its own identity and its rich mm-hmm. culture. So, um, yeah, so that's, I, I always go back to those African themes and I can see them um, putting up the slides of um, the cola knot earrings. So the pink earrings, if we can go back to that slide, those ones, um, the, the, that, that particular design is inspired and partly modeled on the cola knot fruit mm. that is native to the rainforests of, of West Africa. And that plays an, a really important part in the traditional and cultural practices throughout the region, making it a significant object in marriage ceremonies, birth mm. of a child, and, you know, sort of a symbol of respect, prosperity, and friendship. Um, and I think the other one um, that we've got, the other uh, uh, um, earring that you see, if you go further down, um, those ones, those are the crowning um, glory earrings. Again, it's inspired by African prints. Um, not sure if you recall, um, Melanie, but um, if you go to the next slide, the sketch, um, which we kind of slightly modified with rubies, was one that we discussed for one of our projects. Yes. But it didn't quite make, didn't quite make the final <laughs> cut. I, I'm not, I'm yeah, not sure whether. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I do like, I so, do like these. And so the crowning glory, what, what at sort of inspiration, is there anything in particular about these that, or connected to any kind of motif so it these these were purely um african uh, um print fabrics right. so um when these were done so these were done you know sort of a couple of years back and i, I think when you look at most african designers mm. um or designers with you know sort of connection to africa you you cannot do a, a collection without referencing the prints yeah. because it's so intrinsically linked into into the culture um, and these these were one of our interpretation of it, um, mm-hmm. and um, we we initially did it uh, with an, uh, an ameth- amethyst uh, a solitaire, but mm-hmm. you and I were going to sort of yeah um, disrupt it a bit and and use yeah. rubies. But anyway, uh, we'll make that some other time. We will. We've got lots of other <laughs> things in the, in the pipeline. Yes. Um, yeah. And so I think that that's great. So that's going to lead us on to the next uh, section, which is. Mm-hmm. Um, artful indulgence i think it's the slide after this one yes um so there we go so we're talking about obviously african influences and you know going mm-hmm. by this kind of mood board um we can see some african influences in art deco which uh, is part mm-hmm. of um one of your motivations and inspirations yes. yes what would you say the influences are that are african in art deco so um Whispers of Miro was heavily um, influenced by Art Deco. Um, mm-hmm. and, and by the way, this is one of my favorite jewelry styles. Um, and we, we all know that Art Deco uh, was an entire movement in design during the 1920s, 1930s. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only for jewelry, because we, we, we tend to, obviously being in the industry, we tend to sort of focus on the jewelry, but it was also fashion, it was music, it was travel. It was literature, it was architecture and, and art and, you know, so many other things. Um, but when I, when I set up on this journey, there were elements that I picked out from it because you can't really, you can't do everything. And for me, just to, to touch on, on the main points that I looked at when I said, right, I want to do Art Deco, but the elements that I'm looking at is, um, you know, Egyptomania. 
craze that happened in the 1920s. We all knew, you know, that was sort of fueled by Howard Carter's discovery of Tutankhamun and, you know, people were sort of, you know, went all crazy about sort of Egypt. Um, the um, Harlem Renaissance, actually, you know, from a, 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 a literature um, sort of movement point of view. Um, Josephine Baker, you can see from the mood board there. Um, mm. And also sort of um, Picasso, Cubism. Mm. Um, you know, and, and we can link that and I probably touch on that when we talk about sort of the, the totems and the masks, the African masks that we do. Mm. But when you looked at all, when I looked at all of those things, it wasn't enough for me. That, that wasn't enough. I, I, I wanted to use, um, or not even use, fuse these parallel lines and mm. make it different. I wanted to have an, an I wanted it to have an African twist. Mm. an African art deco and so when we started working on the collection I initially called it the African art deco before I even named it Whispers of Miro. so you know it took me a long time to figure out what I wanted um, how I wanted it to be how my own interp Satter's interpretation of art deco was going to look like mm. um, However, with everything that I do, it had, it had to have a story behind it. So my husband and I watch a lot of Nat Geo and Discovery and documentaries and things like that. And he mm. knew that I was working on something. And, you know, and he said, you know, kind of crazy satire, thinking outside the box. And he came across this docu-film um, about the 25th Dynasty Pharaohs. And then he said to me, Sata, you need to check this out. And, and, and that's how it started. And I, I started my research, you know, I researched like crazy, met a um, museum in New York. I went to in yeah, 2018, summer of 2018, uh, lots of visits to um, the British Museum, talking to archaeologists. Luckily, I had a friend who was studying archaeology at the time, and she used to work um, with me in sales in the, in the mining company, but she left to study archaeology. So that was a good resource, mm. a Shmolian uh, museum. And... Um, there was a really good exhibition at the Saatchi Gallery mm. in, um, in um, Sloan Square. I, I don't know whether you, you, you managed to go to the, it was one on Tutankhamun, mm. which was um, traveling. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how it started. And we, we, we kicked off the design thinking phase. And I knew I wanted your usual, you know, sort of bold geometric lines, your angular curved symmetry and colors and um, and all of that but i was passionate about bringing that story alive that 25th dynasty um mm. you know sort of the, the not just the egypt but what happened you know in that part in that region mm. um and so it was about focusing on very strong themes and elements that i had researched so for example i mean we'll see the tassetti earrings was a direct interpretation of kushite archery hence the spiky elements and mim that mimics an arrow. Mm. Um, so for me, I think, you know, just to sum it up, it's a, it was about creating unity for me and not uniformity, which people tend to look at with the design mm. language, which I think is a better approach because it, it allows you to unlock creative ideas and pushes you to innovate. And yeah. yes, I wanted to do an African Art Deco collection. Well, it's a magnificent collection. I think we're still going through some of the, the images here. Um, mm. And very diverse. You know, you've got a lot of different shapes, a lot of different silhouettes. Um, you know, some of your earrings are very deep and long and some aren't. So it's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a choice there for pretty much everyone. And I think mm -hmm. talking about your silhouettes, which is, which is quite interesting from a, just a mm -hmm. sort of an artistic point of view. Obviously we've mm -hmm. discussed Art Deco um, let's talk about some other art movements that affected you. And um, we were talking about the spiky kind of long, lean, linear forms. Um, and you mentioned cubism earlier. Um, what kind of, um, is cubism one of the main alternative art movements that have affected, has affected your work? Or are there any others that you also kind of draw from? So, um, yeah, so basically, I, I, I kind of stuck to the story um, and the history um, because I, I, I thought it was powerful in itself and I, I just wanted to sort of make sure that we brought that through. So we, we had to think on a, of, of an approach on how we could bring something 
disruptive to the game. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's what what I wanted. So it was about throwing that rule book. Not that I had a rule book because I I didn't start off um, jewelry going through the traditional design school. But it was about you know thinking of a, decon- a deconstructed Egyptian approach. Mm. Um, now. Whilst we knew we had to retain the linear and curved forms of Art Deco, we also wanted to introduce certain elements. And I think you've picked on it. I think cubism, yes, um, uh, really, you know, very strong. Um, we, we did keep coming back to that and, you know, sort of referencing um, Picasso's work, which we know was heavily influenced by, by sort of African art and in particular masquerades. So our normally totem, for example, was reimagined in the form of Pharaoh with, with the, the hood and, you know, sort of created in textured gold. I just mm-hmm. saw them um, put up the slide um, of um, our Nile earrings, as we call it, um, and that has round elements. And that little sort of um, uh, um, round uh, um, donut shape um, 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 uh, objects that you see in the mm-hmm. slide is actually um, an archer's ring, um, mm. which was used on the thumb of, of, of uh, um, archers doing, you know, sort of doing archery. Um, and it's made out, I think that one was actually made out of um, uh, faience, which is a, a, a stone mm. um, that they used to make jewellery with back in those days. Um, but we introduced those in the form of carved black onyx rings. So you can see if you obviously we can't zoom in, but obviously if you go to our website, you can Mm. see we actually brought that to life by making specially cut um, round black onyx um, donuts. So when you look at it, everything references back to the history um, Mm. and, you know, sort of how how they they did things. Spiky elements like the Tassetti earrings, Nubia again, known for, you know, having impressive archers in their armies. So we had to we had to pay reference and, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, celebrate that, you know, doing our own spiky bits, taking on, you know, sort of the bow, bow and arrow. Um, and also one thing, I mean, it's, it's probably not a, 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 an influence, but we wanted to bring in gender, gender fluidity into it. So um, just to introduce a modernity to the whole thing. So in the form of sort of modular detachable pieces, so that mm. a wearer could actually split an earring in two and share, share the love, basically. So when you look at some of our designs, you will see from the images that it can be worn as two pendants um, from one earring or split it into a stud and the other person wearing a pendant. So we also wanted to bring that as well, because um, during ancient times, I don't think, um, you know, sort of gender and, and colour and that didn't really matter. People just, you know, mm. moved on and, and they intermarried and, and lived their lives. Great. I mean, you mentioned colour and I'm really in love with your onyx donuts, I have to say. Um, and I think they're phen- phenomenal. I love the fact that they're kind of swinging at the end of sort of a very long earring. I mean, it's, it's, it's an impressive combination of, of shapes and lines. Um, but if we talk about colour, um, you know, you're, you use quite a lot of black, as you say, which sort of references Art Deco, um, but also mm-hmm. you've got some fantastic um, other types of colour in your work. So let's talk about that. So how would you say colour, your colour palette is affected by your choice of stones? So, um, so there, there's the mood board, right? Okay, so you can see there, um, we started off with a, a mood board sort of uh, color palette. Um, it did include the usual greens for, for Malachite, um, mm-hmm. the blue hues, you know, sort of, although most people who do kind of Egyptian um, art deco stuff go for lap, lap, lapis. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think here I, I, I wanted to use sort of something different. And I always try, and you know me, Melanie, I always try to, mm-hmm. you know, um, use different things. So I was thinking, probably you know um topaz blue topaz or or aquamarine aquamarine or something like that so but art deco is is known for sort of decadent color Mm. um so i i then took a trip to my um one of my lapidaries in jaipur Mm. um at the end of 2018 2019 i think it was jan yeah january 2019 
to sort of explore what other elements we could bring in. And if we go to the, the next slide, it actually shows a snapshot of um, when I'd, I'd made my choices of, of sort of colors and, and sort of um, shapes and elements that I, I was thinking that I could use. Um, and we wanted, we decided that we wanted to use stones that spoke uh, to the theme and the story. So in fact, the theme, the theme and the story came first. Mm. Um, and that dictated the stones that we use. So we see a, a strong um, use of black onyx, which represents the extensive use of ebony at the time. So we had to bring we had to bring elements of, of, of the use of ebony. Um, although it's not shown in this slide, but we introduced gold and South Sea pearls to denote ivory, because the, there was a lot of trade in, in sort of elephant and hippo tusks and, and ivory at the time as well. Uh, Morganites, um, again, not, not shown there, but I was very keen to make sure that the um, uh, we had we wanted to bring out the, the 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 desert sort of you know sort of landscapes of of Miro, um, and 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 sort of the region. So you know that nice sort of peachy uh, color of, of of morganites you find in some of our our, our pieces, and then you know an, an injection of red um, mm. in the form of rhodolite garnets. Um, to represent that sort of regal pa power as well. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we needed that. Um, yellow uh, um, came in the form of gold, because obviously, as I said before, gold, you know, was, was really, really you know, important during that time. So um, elements of yellow gold. But then again, I had to bring in sort of white gold, but that's from a commercial, it's, it's a commercial aspect of it, because some people, some clients, you know, like, like wearing white gold as opposed to yellow gold. And of course, um, beloved diamonds. Mm. I, can't do, I can't do something without diamonds for obvious reasons. Is that because of your kind of extensive background um, in, in diamonds? Or, I mean, diamonds are pretty much, you know, there's a, there's a generous sprinkling about mo in most of your pieces. Um, is there anything surprising that you've learned about diamonds because you've, you know, you were, as you say, in the industry for a very long time. So, um, right. So, I, I guess um, I know everyone kind of assumes that diamonds come in a in just a white crystal symmetric form, mm. um, but it's it's far from the reality. I think um, you know, without going into the four C's, we're not going to do that here. I think it's fair to say that each diamond is unique in its color, in its shape, in its form, in its purity. Um, and, and, and that's the beauty of looking or working um, with a natural diamond, um, as there are so many different options that, you know, that are available to you. So when you look at my jewelry, and I'm, I'm glad you sort of referenced that, I've used a whole spectrum of diamonds um, that range from trillions to rose cuts, um, to round brilliance, to marquises, to pear shapes. And, you know, you hear of people today using heavily included diamonds called salt and pepper diamonds. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, salt and pepper diamonds, they call them, but we call them differently in, in the rough diamond world. Um, and if you know and understand diamonds, I think there's such a, a good creative choice for matching the right stone to the right piece of jewelry. Um, if it's an expensive piece, you can put a, a slap on a five carat white diamond or a fancy pink in it. Or if it's a mid range piece, you can use melee type stones. So it's, it's use is endless. Um, and as you know, we create both diamond intensive pieces when it calls for it. Um, and not so heavily studied when, you know, sort of, we want to be very flexible with the design and be much more, uh, you know, accessible. So, um, I guess, yes, to, to answer your question. Great. So I think we're going to move on to an unexpected inclusion in some ways, Elizabeth <laughs> Taylor. So we were talking about Elizabeth <laughs> Taylor because I was surprised when this popped up on the slides. Um, so <laughs> you were telling me that you've had a pretty much a lifelong obsession with Elizabeth Taylor. And so tell me what she means to you. I have. So, so basically, um, I mean, you, you probably, you probably, I, well, I, I speak, let me speak for myself here. I grew up during a time of the, the video cassette 
um, you know, your your VHS, um, um, you know, these these sort of ancient looking things now, as my son would say. And my father would would play films um, growing up as a little girl, you know, Gone with the Wind, Ten Commandments, The King and I and El Cid and Ben-Hur. Um, but the one film that always stuck with me was Anthony and Cleopatra. Mm. And, you know, we all just sort of going to primary school. Um, I first learned about ancient Egypt, um, you know, through history, learning history in primary school. But the Antony and Cleopatra film was the only um, adaptation, um, you know, that brought it to life for me. There was nothing else. There, there was absolutely nothing else. And I was completely blown away. And I, I, I wanted to sort of be in the movie. I wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor. And she played Cleopatra so well. And, you know, the confidence that she had she was very brave and, you know, engaging and forging alliances with, you know, powerful male dominated empires at a very high level. Mm. And I think to this day, when we, we as women, when we talk about feminism um, and being in control, uh, and being at the top of your game as a woman, I think she, or the film maybe, was a fine example of it. So yes, she does feature a lot in my mood board. She did. Um, and the team did ask that, um, and I'm happy that she did. Um, and also, I didn't mention this to you, um, Melanie, but uh, well, when I was working for De Beers, um, probably about 10 years ago, um, when she passed away, probably about eight, 10 years ago, I can't remember it, when it was, mm. but I, I had the opportunity to go see her, um, her auction yeah. when she sadly passed away. So my manager at the time had two tickets to Christie's, in London mm. and said, right, I'm not going to be in town. You know, you've been a good girl. Here you go. Take a friend with you. Um, and I remember going into uh, Christie's um, and, you know, got to see that impressive jewellery collection. And not only that, and I think people focus on the jewellery, but her art collection was just beyond, you know, um, yeah, even better than, than the jewellery collection. Um, mm. I mean, we're talking Monet's and, 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 and all of that, but as they say, she was a very clever lass and and managed herself and composed herself really well. So yeah, so she was she was a an inspiration, no doubt. I know that was a shock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting as well because I think she was at the time. I think Cleopatra, I think she was the highest paid woman uh, ever to yes. you know get. I think she paid, was paid like a million dollars for that film, which at the time was a fortune, but it's still a fortune. Um, and we were speaking earlier, I said that uh, just before she died, I interviewed her for something. And um, I always remember when she came on the phone um, uh, and I called her Liz and she said to me, no, Melanie, my name is Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, and I always wow. remember that. And I thought I stand corrected. She was very regal, I have to say, very, quite, very funny as well. So it's, you know, we don't get many icons. Um, no. And I'm pleased that she loved jewellery as much as she did. So um, it's nice to see her pop up in, yes. Your, yes. in your inspirational slides. Yes. Um, and I think the next uh, thing we're going to talk about is one of my favourite things that you do, which is the, the anomaly totems, um, mm -hmm. which are my favourite motifs of yours, um, because mm -hmm. quite a few people reference the African mask um, in design. It's a well-trodden path, I think, for jewellery design, which um, sort of centres around African uh, aesthetics. But um, I think you do something different here, which I find uh, very beautiful. So, you know, tell me, why did you choose um, the mask and kind of what kind of reception has it had, would you say? So um, our anomaly totems have become, kind of become our signature design you know it's it, it, people I think have come to know us of you know the people you know the brand that actually does bejeweled masks and masquerade mm -hmm. um when I first introduced it in 2015 2014 2015 um it, it took it took a long time many people didn't understand it let me just be go to the point um, and it was really about, it was really an acquired taste, as they say. Mm. Um, you know, the features are pronounced. 
um, not a lot of people understand sort of the the uh, the history and the symbolism and the spiritualism that actually you know um, goes into into the mask and the masquerades. Um, and it, it, you know, it was very, very obviously distinct. Um, but when you throw it in with other jewelry or other mask form designs, they always stood out. So, um, and obviously, have, meeting you um, during that lunch at, at, uh, in London, you know, you always said to me, "This, this is your, this is your signature. Keep, keep at it." Mm. And another jewelry um, critique actually mentioned that to me, um, and I've always loved them. And um, just for, for, for the benefit of our viewers, um, the word normally, um, you know, they're, they're centuries old carved figurines that are native and synonymous to Sierra Leone, where I'm originally from, and um, the neighboring country called Liberia in, in West Africa. And they're made out of um, carved um, limestone or soapstone um, and found mostly deeply buried in the earth. But they're very spiritual again and, you know, sort of linked to ancestral spirits. They're believed to, to heal and protect and bring good tidings. And, and sometimes, you know, they're consulted as oracles, you know, and used in various sort of rituals like, you know, ceremonies and funerals and, and, and all of that. Um, so we use that and we fuse that together with the, the carved wooden masks and masquerades. Um, also known for their spiritual ancestral importance to, to create our own signature mask design and our own mask face. Mm -hmm. So the face always stays the same, but we try to sort of bring elements around it. So um, we specially carved the torso. Um, we we um, sort of uh, um, also do facial features using precious and semi-precious stones. And then we stud them with diamonds or any other any other stones that, that we decide to. And I, I thought for, you asked why, I mm. thought for something that has been so deeply um, regarded for centuries in both sort of Central and, and Western Africa, and still to this day, actually, when you get a chance, we should go to West Africa when they do all these masquerade dances and stuff. It's just so fascinating. You're going to have to ask yeah. me time. <laughs> yes. I, I thought to myself, why don't we celebrate them in a form that elevates their importance um, and rather than just having them sold as antiques and icons displayed in you know a museum or someone's you know sort of big massive mansion somewhere um, and why not present them as wearable art that you can take with you and you know sort of showcase and take the story so yeah it's um that's how it started yeah and, and i think we were saying, you know, that that idea of carrying your art with you, you know, it kind of went back yes. to the Renaissance where you would have um, a painting on the wall and the same uh, painter would then create a miniature for you. And that painter probably would be also um, had studied goldsmithing, goldsmithing and gem setting, and they would actually um, make a miniature and you carry it around. So this is actually going back right. historically to something which happened, you know, for, for, yeah. for centuries. We've just sort of Absolutely. lost that miniature um, element, you know. So yes. that, that's very interesting. I think the normally obelisks, which these are, these are, these are the ones that appeared that you made for us for the Sotheby's uh, Brilliant and Black uh, show, Correct. which is still going on now online. I think it finishes at mid-December, if anyone's uh, yes. wants to look that up. Um, and these are quite big earrings, you know, I, I remember look, sort of looking at these, these are sort of sizable. Um, how many variations of the anomaly do you do? So we've, um, to date, we, um, in terms of a, a design skew, um, we've, we've got nine of them. So wow. nine different versions. I didn't know you had that many. Yes, we do. And we, we have a whole sort of uh, um, archive of, I mean, we don't, we, we never get tired of, of sketching new, new anomalies. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been so well accepted, obviously more so by people who are in the art world and who collect yeah. art because they, they understand it. So, but it, it's just become our iconic piece um, for the brand. 
And, and I found that, you know, we get better every time we do one, we get better at it. Every time we do one, we get better with it. We, um, we understand which stones to work with because you can't work with, I mean, someone said to me, oh, I'd like one done, but I'd like it done in, in emeralds. Well, we can't do it in emeralds because it's very, it's a soft stone. And when you drop it, that's it. It's just going to, you know, shatter. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've gotten better at it every time we make one and um and so we try to incorporate it into every collection um as you can see here the nominee totem arc um, um in on, on this slide which was part of whispers of moreau as well mm. um and um you know if we do exhibitions or you know collaborations whatever it may be i always try to bring it in because it's it's part of what we do and i think yeah that they're, they're here to stay absolutely well, they're fantastic. I'm obsessed with them. Um, Thank which, you. Uh, yeah, is, is we're, we're we're working we're working on a on a on a project. Um, um, yeah, I, I can't say anything now because um, obviously we're not ready yet. But probably in spring next year we'll be ready to sort of launch it. But it's all to do with 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 the totems and yes, it's going to be insane. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to that. And um, yeah. so this is you know we're sort of talking about forward things. So. At the moment, we're together working on um, an exhibition which opens next week in London called Force of Nature at the Elizabeth yeah. Cipriani Gallery. And we open that with a serpentine on the 18th of November. Um, right. And that should be uh, at some point we're going to do another. I think we're going to do some kind of live with Jewelry Week from that. So that's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And Excellent. Yeah, it's good to see that you're that you're continuing to work with the older totems to surprise and engage us all. I'm, I'm very much looking forward yes. to seeing that new incantation. Um, yes. So are there any parting words you have for us, Sata, about your journey? No, I, I mean, if, if, if for, for sort of the, the uh, aspiring jewellery um, um, designers who will be watching this, and I'm sure because obviously New York Jewelry Week is is such a great platform. I was supposed to, I think I was supposed to do something or talk last year, but we 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 couldn't or the last time it was held. So I'm really happy doing this. But you know, to to all to all the listeners and in particular the um the aspiring um jewelry um designers, keep at it. Um, you know, if you've got something that you believe in, just stick to your guns and 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 follow it with tons of passion um and that's it yes that's exactly what i did fantastic well thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you sata for sharing uh, all those insights and thanks for, to jewelry week for having us and we'll see you absolutely. soon absolutely thank you jewelry week all right folks what a fantastic presentation uh very sorry to not have these guests here uh for you to jump in with all of your questions but don't worry there will always be more from uh these two fabulous contributions to jewelry week melanie and sata a virtual thank you to you even though you can't hear me right now uh thanks all for tuning in for that amazing uh program if you'd like to check it out again it will be available uh, on our YouTube channel through the end of Jewelry Week. Additionally, this uh, stream will be up for 24 hours until we start the new one tomorrow. Um, we're about to head into a break now uh, before the final program that starts at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, so we're gonna take a break and then we'll see you back here then. So stretch your legs, uh, maybe you're at an IRL event uh, and then join us back here uh, on the stream at 5 p.m. We'll see you soon.
All right, folks, uh, welcome back to our final program of this day three virtual programming here at Jewelry Week 2021. I am very excited to uh, introduce our next panel. Um, for those of us who are just joining, welcome. For those who've been here all day, uh, thanks for staying. For those who are joining us tomorrow, hello. Um, so I'm going to hand things off to our moderator in just a minute, uh, but first I'm going to introduce her and this fantastic conversation and all the fantastic people who will be speaking. Um, so today we are about to get ready for Celestial Bodies Immersed in the Material uh, with Angela Hennessy and Lauren Fensterstock. Uh, this conversation is going to be moderated by Rebecca Frank, who received her MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2012 and a BFA from Texas State University in 2010. In her work, she explores themes of protection, vulnerability, and boundaries. As a queer artist, Rebecca enjoys writing about other queer artists with a strong material focus. Her studio practice is based in the Mission District of San Francisco, and she exhibits, lectures, and teaches workshops all over the world. Uh, welcome to our moderator, Rebecca Frank, who is gonna introduce our fantastic panelists today. Hi. Hi, Hi. thank you for welcome. that. Welcome. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, hello everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today with two amazing artists, Angela Hennessy and Lauren Finsterstock, as part of the incredible programming, hi y'all, uh, put together by Bella, JB, and the New York City Jewelry Week team. I'm forever impressed by their fortitude as at putting together these events. They're so uh, huge, frankly, huge, in person and virtually all over the, the world and in New York City itself. So first off, while New York City is the undisputed center of everything, none of the panelists today are in New York. So um, thanks to the miracle of digital connection, you also may not be either. So welcome to everybody coming in from all different parts of the world. While we're grateful for the technology to connect across time and space in the digital sphere, it's important to acknowledge the physical spaces we also inhabit so both Angela and I are in the California Bay Area, the ancestral and current home of the Milwaukee Ohlone people. And Lauren is in Southern Maine, the overlapping tribal land of the Abenaki and Wabanaki people. The names of these tribes, names you might not have heard before, represent an immense history, culture, and of course people that continues today. Recognizing their names and their current presence as our neighbors is one step toward, turning the page, a greater understanding and rectifying our shared history and futures. I suppose uh, I should add a little bit to Alex's introduction of myself. I am in the Mission District of San Francisco in a converted live work warehouse that is a consensus based artist community. And that's important because there might be some noise that filters in as it's a working uh, live work space. Um, I went to Cranbrook and then later I worked for Art Jewelry Forum uh, from 2012 to 2018. So next up is clarifying why these two particular artists are participating in a panel during Jewelry Week. While we aren't talking about wearable jewelry during this panel, both Angela and Lauren have roots in jewelry making. Their current practice is informed from their past shared interest in jewelry, which you'll see as the conversation progresses. Over the next 45 minutes or so, the artists will share information about their work and practice. Be prepared to be amazed by their immersive installations, meticulous attention to detail, and labor-intensive processes. After these short presentations, we'll discuss their material and color choices, their shared interests in celestial bodies from black holes to rainbows, and how transforming gallery spaces informs their practice. Please feel free to share your questions via the chat, and I'll do my best to incorporate them into the discussion when we get to that point of the conversation. So let's begin with Angela Hennessy. Uh, I'd like my screen to be shared. I'm not sure that's happening. Thank you. So Angela Hennessy is an Oakland-based artist and professor at the California College of the Arts. This year, she was one of 15 recipients of a Joan Mitchell Foundation Fellowship, a multi-year unrestricted grant, and a well-deserved recognition of her work. Angela's gonna talk for about 10 minutes while we look at some of her work via the slides, and then we'll hand it off to Lauren. Go ahead, Angela, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you, New York City Jewelry Week for hosting us today. 
Um, you can go ahead to uh, my first slide, Rebecca. Great, thank you. So, um, I love you to all the black holes is a way of saying I love you to death. I love you to the unknown, to the beyond, um, into spaces unimaginable. Um, I have a BFA in jewelry and metals and an MFA in textiles, but one of the biggest influences on my aesthetic comes from sleeping outside a lot as a kid in the summers in Northern California um, with basically a bunch of hippies doing the back to the land thing in the 70s. Um, and so, but I would wake up at night and look at the stars and like contemplate the universe as a child, um, but really like wondering, you know, what um, stars are made of and thinking about how they needed the darkness and the blackness of the sky to even be visible. Um, this is a sign, it's uh, from 2014, it's copper sheet that is pierced with little, you know, sewing needles, um, it's painted black, it's about 16 by 20 inches and then backlit by an LED panel. So what you see is the light coming through the, the needle piercings in, um, in the background. It was actually something that my son and I would say, you know, when he was really little, we would say, I love you to the moon and back. And then when he got to the age where he realized the moon like isn't really that far away, um, we started saying, I love you to all the black holes. Um, next slide. So, um, sorry, one second. So this is um, my black hole sculpture from 2017. Sorry, is that actually? Okay, great. Um, and so this was a piece um, really thinking about, you know, black holes as a physical space, but also as an emotional or a psychological space. Um, I have been using the color black as an indication of mourning and a way of making visible and marking racialized bodies and also as a signal of erotic potential. And I think about my practice as kind of a constellation of these themes, a sort of flirtation with blackness. Um, this is a piece that's about eight feet in diameter and three feet high. It's um, a big giant, it's, it's a big giant donut <laughs> that is wrapped with hair. So the hair comes from the outside down into the center, into the hole and is wrapped around um, like a spiral um, all around the piece. Um, and so I'm really interested in black holes because of the way that they speak to constructions of identity, right? In a rather, um, forgive the pun, in a rather illuminating way. And we really only know the black hole by the behavior of things surrounding it, right? Like light, dust, particles, other planetary bodies. And in a racialized context, of course, I would add white people to that, right? Observing how white people respond to blackness can be also very informative. And then over, you know, above Above the black hole is a big skylight that um, we made a big uh, paper cutout with a circle in it. So it casts this really beautiful beam of light down towards, um, towards the black hole. Next slide. Uh, so there's an aspect, of course, of resistance and refusal that um, is really important in my work. And, you know, when I think about black holes and how, you know, as I was saying, like we only know them really by observing objects and things around them. Um, but what I wanted to do with this piece, piece was to realize, you know, the black hole as a body in and of itself, right? A psychological space, a physical space. Um, and in the same way that, black holes represent a kind of unknowable. Um, it's really similar in my mind to how we understand death, right? As this kind of thing that happens that we don't really know, you know, what it is or what the experience might be like, but it ties into ideas of mortality, right? And how the knowledge of one's mortality informs the choices and decisions that we make every day. Right. So I'm thinking about, you know, how we reckon with our humanity, our vulnerability in the face of death. Next slide. Uh, 
Um, this is a detail of a morning wreath, also from 2017, braided and woven hair flowers. It's what you're seeing is like a small um, segment of a large sculpture that is about nine feet tall and has a big giant morning wreath on it that is six feet in diameter. It's synthetic and human uh, hair. And I always put a little bit of my own hair in the work. Um, and hair next to skin is one of the most visible markers of identity, right? It's a material that mediates the relationship between the living and the dead. So whether collected as a souvenir or some kind of tactile reminder or as offerings and gestures of mourning where a griever might shave their hair um, or cut their hair as a sign of respect. Mourning wreaths were also placed on doors as a way of identifying a house of mourning in the South, specifically in the 18 and 1900s. Um, and for me, you know, really all of my work is about communication with the dead. And I'm trying to make myself recognizable to my ancestors. And that you know, includes my African lineage as well as my Irish and English ancestors as well. Um, next slide. Um, and then this is my big gay black rainbow. It's 15 feet wide and about 10 feet high. It's a single crochet stitch. This is all synthetic hair, um, again, with a little bit of my own hair. And this piece was really about stepping out of the black binary and defining blackness as a spectrum, thinking about rainbows as sy symbols of inclusivity and representation. Um, it's set against a black wall. This was uh, one of the first shows where I had the whole gallery painted black. This was at Southern Exposure in San Francisco. Um, and again, with an LED light strip around the outer edge that kind of created this glow. Um, next slide. Sorry, folks, we're just having a so problem with all this. of the work what? is really done by um, everyday gestures, uh, washing, brushing, braiding, stitching, you know, what we call domestic labor or labor that happens, you know, by hand, by our hands, um, but always in the context of a body. So often, you know, I'm working in the scale of my lap. I do a lot of work, you know, in the studio, but also sitting at home in my bed, watching movies and crocheting like crazy. Um, this was a piece from uh, a show at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco in 2019. It's called Black Oracles. And over here on the right is Imani, who was an intern, worked with me on the table installation. And Black Oracles is a set of sculptures, really, you know, kind of contemplating pre-colonial African sculpture. Um, there's also uh, wooden spools from textile mills in this piece and a lot of different kind of hair accessories. And then what you're seeing in the background is, uh, as that, um, is a light projection on the wall behind the piece, which is kind of a flashing sort of circular that moves through different um, shades and different exposures of light. And next slide. Um, black Sunset from 2019. This is just um, gold leaf and black paint. This is a detail about an eight foot section of a 30 foot uh, long wall that was um, all painted black. And then there are these two kind of spherical sun pieces and one sort of looks like it's going up and one is coming down, but basically these giant circles that are moving through horizontal lines and gradations. Um, and horizontality is something I think a lot of um, in relationship to life and death and how um, life and death are often mapped on horizontal and vertical lines. And so the sun and the setting of the sun or the rising of the sun as metaphors for these cycles of life and death is something that, you know, I think about really in the context of um, memento mori and you know in this day and age when we are reminded of death and we're reminded of our mortality literally on a daily basis you know if you're not watching the news then maybe it still seems kind of obscure um, but i'm really interested in how landscape and how celestial bodies are are um, kind of witnesses to the cycles that we go through and that we're performing early on a day-to-day -day basis um, next slide Uh, 
Um, this is an installation called Bling from a show at Selmart's Gallery in San Francisco called A History of Violence. Um, the whole installation really is like those black velvet trays in jewelry stores where, you know, chains or rings are laid out on black velvet. So I'm thinking a lot about presentation here and really recognizing like my jewelry aesthetic that comes through in the work. Um, and chains, of course, have many layers of meaning, you know, beginning as devices of restraint and captivity, symbols of suffering in, in African-American context. Um, but that material lineage, of course, coexists with ideas of status, performances of wealth and adornment. Um, gold and black are uh, specifically relate to material extractions of colonial empires. So I'm thinking really specifically about resources, whether gold as a mineral or um, black bodies that were, you know, people that were extracted and kidnapped and trafficked across to, um, you know, what we now call North America or South America. Um, these pieces are all crocheted uh, twist tie wire. So the kind of wire that you get um, those, those little ties on the end of a loaf of bread. Um, I buy them in long spools and I sit and crochet with them. So that's the, the main chain part. And then the black chain that you see, um, those are made from uh, pipe insulation that I get at the hardware store. And I make these big giant links and then they're wrapped with, uh, wrapped and stitched with hair. Um, next image, please. Uh, and this installation is um, titled Of Chains and Corpses, and the title is from an open letter that James Baldwin wrote to Angela Davis when she was um, pictured on the cover of Time magazine in the 70s in handcuffs. And he was writing to her about how America measures its safety in chains and corpses. And so that kind of fed into things I was thinking about um, with chains. Um, this is a gold chain curtain on the left. Um, partly influenced by funeral displays, um, you know, with lots of arching textiles that might like frame a body on display in a mortuary. Um, but of course there were also lots of beaded curtains and, it, you know, for those of you old enough to remember that kind of electrical lighting um, that was little chains inside of a clear tubing, right, in the 70s. Um, so some of those kind of aesthetics show up in my work as well. Um, and then in detail over here on the right, you can see the chains made from those little twist tie wires that literally my son and I sat at the kitchen table um, twisting those and making links for um, many, many long hours. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then the last couple of pieces, the one on the left here is called 13 Moons and work on the right that is uh, from just a couple months ago, 2021 in the summer from a show at Part 2 Gallery in Oakland. Um, and the one on the right is called A Chosen Universe. And really actually it reminds me of like the cloisonne and enamel work that I used to do in undergrad where, you know, your focus is like 10 to 12 inches in front of you. But it's something that I think about often of like the zooming into incredible detail and the repetition of making little tiny things that then add up um, you know, into some kind of larger whole, uh, but zooming out and then thinking about like, what is the big picture in this, in this, you know, whole conversation. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Sorry about the technical snafu there, but we've got it back on track and we'll be able to go back and see some of those images when we are in conversation. So next, let's welcome Lauren Fensterstock. She's a Portland, Maine-based studio artist. Her site-specific installation, The Totality of Time Lusters the Dark, originally commissioned for the Winrick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, it's quite a mouthful there, is being reimagined and re-engineered for the Chrysler Museum, opening on January 15th in 2022. Welcome, Lauren. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much, Rebecca, and your jewelry week. And Angela, it was just like so magnificent to sit and look at your work. Um, I can't wait to talk. So, <laughs> like, I just want to get into it. 
Um, so for a little bit of context um, about my work, I also trained as a jeweler, but for the last two decades, I've been making installations and sculptures that explore how we project human narratives into the landscape. I build my work using techniques associated with the history of women's crafts, including paper quilling and cutting, shell working, and most recently mosaic. Despite their rich historical framework, these are methods that rarely make it to the canon of art history or even to studio craft programs, methods that are generally considered amateur pastimes or frivolities. But despite this dismissal of women's labor, these materials have a lot to say. Next slide. Um, most of these landscapes are rendered entirely in black, a palette inspired by the reflections of two historical black mirrors, the clawed glass, which was a scientific device used to observe the physical landscape, and the scrying mirror, which was an esoteric tool used to penetrate a spiritual landscape. And I would say that I hover somewhere between the two. Black has a power that draws you in. It has physical agency. It forces your eyes to adjust to its limited light. And once your eyes have adapted to its terms, you become aware of things that were previously hidden. Next slide. Um, so this is the installation that Rebecca just mentioned with the um, sort of grandiose title, The Totality of Time Lusters the Dusk. I'm like infamous for really long titles. Um, and so with this and other recent work, my focus um, has shifted to causality. So rather than look at individual objects, I'm focused on how objects impact each other. And I see the landscape not as a static site, but as an event, an event that is constantly unfolding over a vast amount of time and space and through the exchange of human and non-human participants. And I think it's really important to see a landscape with all of that complexity. Growing up as an American, I've been surrounded by the false myth of individualism. And I think it's a particularly dangerous one we must understand the entanglement of people and things for a healthy, equitable future of our world and its inhabitants. Next slide. So with so much kind of turmoil on the ground, I've moved my gaze to the skies. And for me, it's a move from the kind of malleable landscape of the Earth's surface to the non-malleable skyscapes above. And sort of like beyond our reach and control, these celestial landscapes are no less real and have no smaller impact on our lives and bodies, but their distance demands we access them not with our hands, but with an extended sense of self. I fell in love with a comet as both an object and a metaphor. Familiar comets like Halley's revolve around the earth within a human life cycle while others take thousands of years to make their orbit and serve as an example of the universe's immense scale. Ultimately, a comet is just a dirty snowball leaving a trail of gas. The simplicity and immensity of this object amazes me. Next slide. It takes time to work your way around most of these installations. Like time, it's impossible to take it all in at once. It unfolds in a sequence of linked vignettes. You eventually arrive at a rainstorm at the back of this installation, nestled between the gallery's columns. Compared to the comet, this part of the installation is more intimate. It's closer to the ground and your body. Storms move in and out. They're experienced in the real and the local. We track a storm hourly on our phones. We feel it shift and transform on the surface of our skin, and the follicles of our hair. While a storm might only last a few minutes, it stands in contrast to the larger arc of time suggested by the comet, which is impossible to capture by a lone individual. The comet marks a span of activity that requires the collaboration of generations to bear collective witness. Next slide. Below, the rain pours down into a kind of dizzying space that defies definition. 
we are immersed in our own tiny human-centered narratives, but the present moment is the result of forces set in motion eons past, while our current actions are creating the archeology span of the future. This entwined arc of time is awesome in form. It's a message that can be seen as inspiring in its vastness or as horrific in our own insignificance. We may find great beauty in the world, but the world itself may be indifferent to us. And for me, you know, this all suggests a desire for transcendence beyond the human, a desire to see beyond our own individual bodies, time, location, and lived experience. So I installed this piece in late 2020, and then I began looking forward, and I decided to begin again at the end. Next slide. Um, so I started looking at eschatology. Eschatology is the theory of the end of the world. And both my interest in causality and my Ashtanga yoga practice, which includes daily meditation and sutra study, uh, brought me to the Sermon of the Seven Sons, which is a discourse from the Angudara Nikaya, which is a collection of texts ascribed to the Buddha. And in this sermon, the Buddha describes the end of the world as being caused by the progressive appearance of seven sons. And as each son appears, it unleashes a new ecological disaster. And there are these beautiful descriptions that actually really relate to things I see happening all around me. The cumulative power of all seven suns hanging in the sky at once burns the world without even a trace of soot or ash remaining. The lesson of the story is that all material is impermanent and that freedom only comes when we're able to accept the reality of this cycle. Next slide, please. The narrative of the seven sons led me to look at what happens when a sun dies. It implodes on itself, creating a black hole. Black holes are surrounded by an event horizon, and this is a quote, which is a boundary through which matter and light can pass only inward, nothing, not even light can escape from inside the event horizon. I love that, end quote. Um, I wanted the outer portion of these pieces to have a strong sense of the physical world, one wrought with human patterns and recognizable ornamentation, but for that sense of order to become loosened as it comes into tension with the event horizon. Inside the event horizon is a more elusive space that is less physical and more mysteriously reflective. Making a mosaic is the act of taking broken and disparate things and uniting them into a new whole. When you pack an object with materials, with forms, and with the repeated gestures of labor, it becomes like a fully charged battery retaining all of these energies. Next slide. Unlike the stylized star form of the last piece, suns are actually nearly perfect spheres of gas sometimes interrupted by solar flares and sunspots. Now, I mentioned earlier that I was interested in transcendence, which is something I've been chasing for the last 20 years. Making this body of work moved me to think more about imminence. If transcendence is a kind of rising above, imminence is a residing within. For the first time, my work began to get lighter, whereas my typical darkened palette creates an absorptive effect that suggests a sinking portal to another plane or an unknowingness. These lighter works are here in the room with you. They don't lead you anywhere, but hopefully demand that you be present with them here and now. I'm still holding some room for darkness. There's certainly more out there than I can see but I'm falling in love with the majestic complexity of what is right here all around us. Mosaics are primarily understood as a surface. They are appearance made physical. In much of the Western world, we're caught up in a battle between appearance and reality. We separate surface from essence, soul from body. Western notions of the withdrawn or an essential self suggests there's something unknowable at the center of every living thing. But perhaps there's just appearance, just the reality of things and their interaction with other things. And I find a wonder in this. Next. 
Um, so this is the fourth sun from that series. And its glittering surface reminded me of the metaphor of Indra's net, which I think is kind of a perfect metaphor for Jewelry Week. Um, Indra is a Vedic deity associated with storms and he possesses a net that connects all of existence. And at the intersection of every point of his net is a diamond. The facets of each diamond reflect the light of all the facets of every other diamond. In this way, when you look into one stone, you witness the interconnectedness of all beings. But if you become too focused on the singularity of one diamond, you will miss its connection to the rest. The meditative space of true inner reflection reveals the entanglement of all living beings. Any endeavor we set upon or any art we propose must begin here. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you both for your presentations. And I'm going to stop screen sharing momentarily, get it so that I can uh, move between the slides easily so we can go back and see some of the ones we missed from Angela's presentation. Um, we have the first question set to talk about the shared um, interest you have in, in colors, material, and process. So if you want to start with that while I take care of that. And it sounds like you have probably some other questions you want to ask each other. So jump in. <laughs> I mean, and if we're, or do I, I mean, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, it was just like so wonderful, Angela, to see your work. And of course, I've mm -hmm. already here with it. Um, and, you know, part of what I'm so drawn to with your work, I, I like, think sometimes artists get put into these categories where either you're like a formalist or you're a conceptualist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, like, it's so, like, both of those things are so rich and like intertwined in your work. Um, so I don't know if that's a question, but just like, yeah. Well, I'm also, sorry. Go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, of, like, I was reading something yesterday. Like, Keats had this idea of negative capability, which is also like mm -hmm. this idea of um, truth that's not necessarily like logical or mm -hmm. like rational or linear. And just listening to you talk about like, all of these metaphors of like the body and space overlapping mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. there's just such a truth of that layering to me that you know it's not a question yeah no but um i mean I, there's obviously like so many things that resonate between our work that you know are a combination of formal aesthetics like shapes and circles and sparkly things right like very formal and very um, material based kinds of engagements. And, you know, yet also, I mean, you said something about um, the, like the object and the metaphor, right? So if we're thinking about formal concerns or maybe more practical concerns, but then that's always layered with the immaterial, with the spiritual, with the metaphor. And to me, that is the, you know, one of the things that I really love about being an artist and being a maker is that, the objects and the materials become ways to, you know, they become provocateurs, right? To have these conversations about, you know, contemplating the universe and, and thinking about what comets are made of and, you know, what we're actually looking at. Like when, you know, scientists say that they, you know, have taken a picture of a black hole, right? You know, like there's so much audacity in that. And um, I think there's a way that, like the desire to lay claim to things that are mysterious and that have these elements of refusal to be known or to be seen that you know there's some kind of human drive or i don't know if it's human i don't know exactly what it is but there's some kind of drive to um to to like to know and to understand and to unpack all of those things and something that i feel like really connects between our work is that there's a way of like embracing the mystery, you know, and when I look at your pieces and I'm, I like, I see jewelry, I see the moon, I see the comets, you know, like I see all of those things layered in, you know, one particular thing that you have made. And, um, you know, those, I mean, one thing I think that we're both really interested in is thinking about interaction with light and it's something that informs my work really specifically, whether a material that I choose, if it's black velvet, whether it's absorbing light, mm -hmm. if it's, um, 
you know, an actual like LED kind of light thing, whether it's generating light or reflecting light. And that's, you know, one of the ways that I choose the materials that I work with is like, what, what are they doing with light? How are they interacting with light? Um, and it certainly relates to color palette as well. You know, I choose colors, you know, based on their, um, based on their material lineage, but also their spiritual lineage, their lineage in relationship to coloniality, in relationship to ideas of resource. Um, but the, the, you know, capturing, absorbing, reflecting light is something that I think carries across, you know, both, um, both things that we're doing. And, and right there you have the physical, like what's happening physically, but then also what's happening spiritually or in relationship to philosophy or ideas of enlightenment and knowledge. And, you know, all of that can be wrapped up in, you know, in a single object. Uh, Nicholas. Papas says that is, mentions the detail of both of your work. Um, can you talk mm. a little bit about how the material and the detail and even the kind of the meditative process of the making? It's very mm. slow and time consuming. Um, so that might be interesting to people. And I'm happy to uh, switch between slides if you want to call out one and while you're talking. I can jump. So, Lauren, when ahead, you talk Lauren. about. Um, the mosaic concept. Yeah. So, I mean, detail, I mean, definitely um, comes from my training as a jeweler. I mean, I think I still mm. work, you know, on the scale of a bench pin. It's just that it accumulates, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. I get overwhelmed when I think about, like, I can't paint a pedestal, but I could like paint something this big, you know. Um, so, like, I love to be um, sort of like immersed and like so like proximal to the material. So I love I love working in that detail. Um, and what was the other part of the question besides the detail, just the meditative part? I mean, for me, it is really important, and and I think also relates to what Angela was saying about the um, sort of layered meaning of materials. And I think. Um, you know, it, when you're working with found materials, with really loaded materials, um, it is this collaboration that for me also is very spiritual. I mean, I think there are, every artist has these moments where, you know, you learn, you give up some of your agency to, I think, enact the desire of the material itself. Um, and, and for me, you know, it is one of the ways that I, connect with something outside of myself. Um, and it's, you know, that that kind of place of discovery. Yeah. Angela, can you talk about some of your material choices and, and how it affects people in the gallery? I'm going to pull up the, the light um, cast uh, one when I can find it. The one with the black, the black poof. Yeah. Um... You know, I mean, I choose some materials, you know, as I was saying, like based on their interactions with light, um, I, I choose materials for specific um, lineages. Um, I choose materials for how they make um, absented bodies present and visible. Um, I'm also really interested in upsetting or like undoing hierarchies of value. So I think a lot, you know, in working with hair and, and also in working with gold that there's always a question of, is that real hair or is that gold or is that pure gold? And I tend to use a mix and, you know, in in my materials lives on the gallery wall like I list mm -hmm. all of the materials in, in pretty in very specific detail and very intentionally so I'll list you know imitation um, gold leaf 24 karat gold um, synthetic hair human hair artist hair right like part of what I'm interested in doing with materials is challenging these notions of, of value um, and because specifically for people of color and for the queer community, um, having access to materials is something that, you know, um, is loaded with ideas about class and wealth and privilege and, and performing certain hierarchies of value. And so if we think about like gold leaf or, you know, I've used glitter in my work and all of these materials that are kind of 
cheap renditions of pure gold or renditions of quote unquote real hair, like hair that grows out of your head kind of thing, right? Like that's based on a hierarchy that sets something that is natural at the top of it. But yet, if you think about, you know, for in in African-American context and, and the way that, you know, we're constructing our identities, when like what is natural and occurring, you know, in and from our own bodies is, um, not only you know managed um set as you know not being aesthetically beautiful or formally beautiful that the ways that we use particular materials or resources uh, you know is like is a way to challenge that so that's something that i'm i'm really interested in and very conscious of when i'm choosing uh the materials that i'm working with mm -hmm. you got both spent a lot of time talking about the sky and the celestial bodies and how they represent such different things for you, for you. Can you talk a little bit, um, I know Lauren mentioned text specifically, and then Angela, you mentioned, you know, uh, with your with your son looking at the sky and, and that was one of the origins of the black hole. Uh, but can you, can you each kind of take a few minutes to talk a little bit more about the celestial bodies and what they mean to you, um, starting with, with Angela and I can pull up um, again, any slide that you'd like. Hmm. Yeah. We go back to the first one as the starting point. Yeah. Well, I mean, the celestial bodies, you know, when I think about black holes specifically, you know, I'm thinking about black holes out in the universe. I'm also thinking about black holes within my own body. Um, and, you know, they become kind of part of a cosmology. So, you know, and, and, in a cosmology, of course, there's like a, a system, there's a kind of ordering of the universe, a way of making sense of things and our relationship to other objects, right? Whether they're planets and, you know, the moon um, or, you know, whether they're other bodies. So it's really about orientation for me and how, you know, how I make sense of the universe and how I understand what my place is in it. And I think especially as we are, you know, kind of in a paradigm shift of, of thinking about, you know, the individual or the icon or, um, you know, kind of shifting more into ideas of community and collectivity that, um, you know, being able to understand the relationships between things becomes increasingly important and how, you know, that we all bring our own resources and, you know, areas of wisdom to a whole system, right? But that there isn't a system that is revolving around me as Angela, you know, like I'm part of a whole system. So, or, mm -hmm. you know, networks, many networks. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, really, I think about it in relationship to cosmology and, you know, human beings have always looked up at the sky to sort of understand what our place or our positionality is here on Earth. Beautiful. And Lauren, you specifically mentioned, you know, the American kind of myth of the individual. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a mm -hmm. good point for you to talk more about that in relation to the work. Yeah, I, I mean, just also building off of what Angela just said, this notion of coordinates. I mean, I think for me, um, you know, I'm always looking at the landscape that I'm in to understand um, sort of how I'm projecting meaning into it and how it's projecting meaning onto me. Um, and so, you know, the stars are these coordinates we locate ourselves with. Um, and so many, as I mentioned before, of this sort of, other landscapes that I've looked at are immediate. It's grass. We all know what it is to like run our hand through a field of grass. Um, you know, we can define our neighborhood, our sort of continent, um, these landscapes that have an immediate connection to locating our, our bodies and our identities. And so like, you know, as I'm thinking more expansively about myself, you know, I've sort of moved from you know, like gardens to like seascapes mm -hmm. and now to the sky. Um, and, you know, for me, it is this gesture of trying to think about myself in, in a more expansive context um, mm -hmm. to escape things like the myth of the individual um, and to see how, um, 
you know, we are impacted, we impact things, you know, and are impacted by things. And I think with the stars, it's so interesting because we can reorder our, you know, our earthly landscape, but to see these contexts that render us um, a little more powerless, um, mm -hmm. I think is humbling. Um, and, and helps for me personally to put things in context, in the greater context. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful and like really significant point to think about then, like what power looks like and where does power reside? And, you know, if we're standing under the sky or, you know, gazing up at a comet or stars or whatever it might be that that feeling of powerlessness um, to me, then it's, it's also very much about vulnerability. And that's something that, you know, when we're having conversations about cosmology or about, you know, the relationship between life and death, then the question is really like, how do we show up in that vulnerability? And, you know, with the knowledge specifically around mortality and thinking about death and grief that, you know, how are we going to be human beings in these moments? And, and is it possible to find a kind of empowerment that um, embraces vulnerability, right? Or em embraces the ability to flex or to bend or to contract or expand, right? Like there's, I think there's, um, you know, ways that like the idea of strength needs to be redefined. And certainly, you know, with some of the materials that we're both working with and coming out of a jewelry aesthetic where ideas of strength and materiality are so embedded in the history of jewelry making, right? And metal as a material that is, you know, long lasting or lasts forever or, you know, has like staying power kind of thing. And so, you know, I'm always looking for ways that I can push up against like what those assumptions are about, you know, what power looks like, what strength looks like, and how can I, how can I do that through the materials? So the landscapes that you were talking about and the immersive kind of installations and this um, image, Angela, is this from the Museum of African Diaspora from the Scattering Garden? Is that right? This is from, yeah, Museum of the African Diaspora. This is from a show that was called um, Everybody Loves the Sunshine, which is from that Roy Ayers song um, about like living life in the sunshine. And really this work came after I had done a lot of grief work and, you know, was like making a conscious decision to like step into the st sunlight and to stand in the sunshine. And, you know, but also, you know, recognizing the complexities of my own relationship to light and thinking about, you know, even like in this case, the color gold and the complexities around, you know, gold as a mineral, um, as a material extraction of the earth, right? And, um, but also then taking up ideas of what gold symbolizes in terms of, um, you know, sort of spiritual or emotional kind of, you know, purity or beauty. Um, so, you know, all of those histories are like really complicated and, and you know, interwoven with each other. Um, but yeah, this was the piece that the title of this particular installation is from uh, James Baldwin from the open letter to Angela Davis. Um, it was called Of Chains and Corpses. So, um, you know, and also, I mean, I recognize too, like that I grew up with a lot of beaded curtains and little chain kind of curtains. And so those, that kind of domestic work that is very much located in the seventies and has a particular aesthetic to it. Um, but I'm always looking at how I might, you know, take things from my own biography or take things from a historical context and see what happens when I bring them into you know, 2021, like, what does this mean now? And how does this, how does this work? Or how do these ideas, you know, show up in this particular moment? And you mentioned the James Baldwin reference, uh, which reminds me that I wanted to ask about the, the, um, the book that you wrote that was part of, of your practice. Um, mm -hmm. Lauren mentioned that she was referencing these, these other texts and that, and that you wrote one that was part of some of your 
um, work. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so <clears throat> that book is called The School of the Dead, and it's a manifesto that I wrote on uh, death and grief, um, specifically that came out of my experience as a survivor of gun violence and being confronted with my own mortality. Um, and so it's kind of a, it's a rant, it's a prayer, it's a chant, um, it's a call to action, it's kind of a poem, um, but it goes through, you know, like experiences specific in my own biography, but also just looking at how um, how death and grief are experienced mm -hmm. across racialized identities and thinking about lineage, thinking about ancestors. Um, it kind of, it closes with a, you know, a, like a call for grieving for like what grief work looks like and how grief shows up in the work. And, you know, that really comes back to my own practice of turning to art making and sometimes unmaking of art to process grief, um, you know, in the face of like not having really specific traditions to rely on, um, but feeling like I became an artist and turned to materials and color palette and specific gestures and practices in my work as a way of processing grief and trauma. Yeah. So one of the reasons, you know, there, there's so much there, but one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up is that the stepping into the light of the mm -hmm. exhibition that we were talking about before. And then Lauren mentioned that as well as looking back into the, you know, the climate crisis and then making decision to kind of look up and to look into different kinds of futures. And I just thought that was an interesting kind of bridge between the two of your work, as well as the research and the text and the writing and how important it is to both of your practices in, in different ways. Um, Lauren, the text that you have referenced, you know, I have never heard of them before um, and they're fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about that? text and the research that you do um, that kind of underlay the creation of these these objects. Yeah, and and um, the the piece at the Renwick Gallery was also inspired by a historical text, um, which is called Das Wunderseichen Book, the Book of Miracles, mm -hmm. um, which was this amazing illustrated manuscript made in the 1540s in Augsburg, Germany. And they um, were sort of part of a, a tradition at the time. They went through all of the weather events in the Bible and then through recorded history. So looking at like Greek and Roman writings um, up until the 1540s. So it went from the Bible through sort of ancient time up until the contemporary moment. Um, and it chronicled every weather event that they could find recorded with these incredible um, illustrations, they look sort of like German expressionists. They look very like 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are these like wonderful descriptions of like what happened. So, you know, like this, this time has passed and then, you know, like the, the sky went, you know, like there was blood in the sky and then, you know, all the cattle died or, but they um, ascribed affect to, uh, these events. And, and for me, again, it's this desire of the human to find rational logic um, in the events occurring around him. Also to, I think, center the human by believing that like the passing of a comet, that, uh, you know, like a major geological event is about sort of human prediction, I find quite interesting. Um, so that, that was uh, one of the texts that inspired this piece and, and uh, the comet, there are many comets in, in uh, the Book of Miracles. Um, but you know, I always, I'm like, I'm bookish. <laughs> and for me, you know, and I've always been, um, sort of had my nose in a book. Um, I grew up in Jewish tradition. So um, like the reading of books was a, a part of, um, you know, my, sort of original religious training. Um, and I feel like for me, the act of making has always been this way to take the abstractions that I've encountered in the books, the things that are just too complex to understand and to like manifest them and, and you know, hold them in my hands as a space of 
creation and contemplation. And I think, you know, going back to this notion of jewelry, um, you know, that the scale of the hand, the sort of materials of touch, um, the kind of found materials that we are so familiar with to build the abstract in the material of the everyday for me um, is such an important connection um, and, and a waypoint for me. Yeah, that phrase, the materials of the everyday is nice to, to think about that, that we're building, that y'all are building these large scale uh, installations from you know, materials that are around us and part of us and, and easily accessible. So we just have a few minutes left. So I want to give um, you both the opportunity to ask any final questions of each other before we talk <laughs> off. Is there any burning thing that's lingering in your minds that you wanted to point out or ask about each other's work? It's also an opportunity to talk about maybe um, uh, an artist that inspires you or something in the world that is relevant to this moment, if you'd like. No pressure, y'all. I took so many notes. <laughs> uh, no, Angela. Hmm. Well, I, you know, I was thinking about um, both of us how we how we work in relationship to time, mm -hmm. and this question, you know, that often comes up where people ask, like, how long did it take you to make mm -hmm. that? You know, and I was curious, like, how you answer that question, Lauren, and. Um, you know, because there's always this way that, that artistic practice is like measured up against time as if, um, I don't know, I mean, it's like such a capitalist kind of perspective, I think, you know, and I, I get that the question is really sincere of like, oh my God, how did you make that thing? And, you know, how long did that take you, right? There's a real sincerity to the question, but it's also like a default, I think, that comes out of capitalism and so I'm just I'm curious how you answer that question yeah. I mean for me the labor is the point and again you know like I'm interested in the experience of thinking of making more so than the object and and um, so like I'm you know I also like I live in Maine in the winter I need things to do <laughs> so, um, you know like I'm always trying to make the longest project I can um, because the making is all I have. And I think about a piece like, you know, at the Renwick Gallery, like it's always funny for me to look at those slides and see like that completed piece because what I remember is like making this little part in March and that part in May and um, all like the, the various moments of making and that kind of completed moment. <laughs> is just like one in a sequence. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I guess it's like, I'm always, it's always like, I'm always in the making, you know? Yeah. I would never be done with a piece of it if I could. <laughs> yeah. That's what yeah, I that's yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both for the conversation. It's been really enlightening and fascinating to hear more about your work and to share images with the audience. To the people who are watching, thank you for your time. Apologize for the slide uh, snafu. I hope you got to see the images that you missed, um, that we missed at the beginning. And with that, I will pass it back to Alex. Um, on the screen right now is the, the slides with the Instagram handles of the artists. Um, so if you'd like to see more of their work, find them on the internets where they are uh, posting and making art and sharing their upcoming talks. And I know Angela's doing a podcast coming up that looks really fascinating. Um, and Lauren has a show opening soon. So really wonderful to hear from you both. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Good to be in conversation with you. Thank you all. Uh, what a fantastic way to close out the day. I feel like I need to go back and rewatch that because there was just so much to <laughs> dig your teeth into both with each of your practice and then with all of the amazing themes that were discussed. I feel like a lot of this is particularly re resonant uh, with me on a personal level and I'm sure many, many of us uh, right now more generally. And I'm just so grateful for all of your time and insight and just the 
rigor with which you all approach your work. So thank you so much for bringing this to us and bringing this conversation to Jewelry Week. We, um, we're very excited to have had you here and I thank you all uh, for being here. And thank you, Rebecca, always a fantastic moderator um, for bringing this together and uh, for being here. And that is that is it for day three. We made it. <laughs> Thank you so much, folks. All right, folks, Thank that you. is everything for today. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. If you missed anything or if, like me, you want to get the instant replay of that conversation, uh, the stream will be up on YouTube until tomorrow morning uh, before we start our day four. Um, and I hope you'll all join me back again there. Uh, there's a couple of other things happening around the city this evening, so be sure to keep an eye on our website for all of the stuff that's going on. Um, and I will see you right back here virtually tomorrow. Thanks, everyone, and good night. <laughs>